Hi friends, my name is Maruti and I am the co-founder of Kraku. In this video, we are giving you 100 very important questions for the coming CAT. Initially, the question will be displayed. Please pause the video at that time and try to solve the question on your own. And after that, watch the video. If you are looking for other important uh, free materials for CAT on YouTube, we have a list of uh, very nice videos. There is revision for the entire syllabus for CAT. There are four such videos. There are two videos for Quant and there is one video for LRDI and one video for Verbal. In each of these videos, the entire syllabus for CAT is covered. The links for those four videos is given in the description of this video. In addition to it, we have done a 100 quant uh, question series in the last few years. And you can watch all of those videos. I think there are another three or four 100 quant question videos, which we have uploaded in the last few years. Again, the links for them is given in the description of this video. In addition to it, many people ask me what is the best way to use the remaining uh, days for CAT. I would recommend them to take as many mocks as possible in the run-up to CAT. Kraku dash CATs are uh, very well prepared and they are expected to be very close to actual examination. Each of the questions has been meticulously prepared by me and my team and all the questions have detailed video solutions. Kraku dash CATs are taken by thousands of students and I believe that it will benefit you quite a lot. If you don't have time to take all the dash CATs, at least take the first five dash CATs. I am sure if you are taking a lot of mocks, it will help you on the day of the examinations. In addition to it, we are providing free material. We are providing all the previous papers for CAT, ZAT, SNAP, CMAT, all of them with detailed uh, solutions, both video as well as text solutions. You can download the PDFs in our website. I hope that this video will be useful for you. If you are having any doubts with respect to any of the questions in this 100 uh, questions, please do comment uh, below the video. I look at all of those questions and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. I hope that you are preparing well and all the best for CAT. In this question, we are given an isosceles trapezium. It is circumscribed over a circle. And we are also given uh, the ratio of its non-parallel sides. It is given that it is 3 is to 1. And we, it is, we are also given the perimeter of the trapezium as 16 centimeters. And we have to find the area of the trapezium in square centimeters. For this, it looks like, uh, first let us draw the diagram of how the trapezium is looking and the circle. And looks like from the face of it, if we can find the lengths of all the sides of the trapezium, we should be able to find the area of the trapezium. So first let us draw a circle. Then there is a trapezium. Assume that this is the isosceles trapezium. Now, suppose this is x and this is x and this is x and this is x. They are all x because uh, they are all tangents starting from the same point and it is an isosceles trapezium. So, all these are x. So, the length of this side is 2x. It has been given that uh, the other parallel side is 3 times this one. So, the length of this is 6x. So, this is equal to 3x and this will be equal to 3x. As all these are from the same point, these are two tangents, this will also be 3x and this will also be 3x. So, the length of this side is 4x, the length of this side is also 4x. This is what has been given to us. You can draw the diagram on your own and you can come to these conclusions. Now, the trapezium, uh, the perimeter of the trapezium is 4x plus x that is 10x plus 4x that is 14x plus 2x that is 16x. We are given that 16x is equal to 16 centimeters or x is equal to 1 centimeter. So now we know the uh, all the sides of the trapezium. If we just draw the trapezium once again to find its area, it will look something like this. So this is 4 this is 4, this is 2 and this is 6. Now to find the area we need to find the height of the trapezium that is this height. Because these are parallel lines this once this is 2 this will also be 2 and as this is 6 these two will be equal these two sides and they will be equal to 6 minus 2 by 2 that is this is 2 and this is 2. This we know. Now we need to find the value of h this is a right angle triangle so because this is a right angle triangle h square plus 
2 square is equal to 4 square which is equal to 16 or h is equal to root of 12 which is equal to 2 root 3. Now to find the area of the trapezium, we area of trapezium We have to find the average of the parallel sides. Here the parallel sides are 2 and 6. So their average will be half of 2 plus 6 into the height of the trapezium. This is 2 root 3. This will be equal to half of 2 plus 6 is 4 into 2 root 3. This will equal 8 root 3. So the answer is 8 root 3. In this question we have just used uh, a couple of things. First is the length of the tangents from the same point to a circle are the same. We have used it multiple times. So for example from this point, this side is 3x, this side is 3x. Similarly from this point, this side is x and this side is x. Once we know that all of them are the same, you can calculate the perimeter and find the values of each of the sides of the trapezium. Once you do that, we have just used another simple formula of area of trapezium which is equal to the average of the parallel sides. Here the parallel side is 2 and the parallel side here is 6. So their average is 4 into the height of the trapezium which is 2 root 3. In this question it is given that there is a water tank. It has two types of inlet pipes type A and type B. When all the inlet pipes of type A are open, they bring water at the same rate. Same is the case for all the inlet pipes of type B. Now an empty tank can be filled in 30 minutes if 10 inlets of type A and 45 inlets of type B are open. So it takes 30 minutes if there are 10 inlet pipes of type A and 45 inlet pipes of type B are there. Similarly it takes 1 hour that is 60 minutes when there are 8 inlets of type A and 18 inlets of type B are open. We are required to find out in how many minutes the empty tank will get completely filled if 7 inlets of type A and 27 inlets of type B are open. So this is a very standard question uh, which is often asked in uh, time, speed and distance. These kind of questions are often asked. So what we will do is we will assume that the tank has uh, a volume of say 60 liters. Now why are we implying this to be 60 liters because we want it to be a multiple of 30 and 60. So the LCM of 30 and 60 is 60 liters. So if 10 uh, inlets of type A and 45 inlets of type B are used, the 60 liter tank is filled in 30 minutes. So in 1 minute, 2 liters of water is filled. Similarly, if there are 8 inlets of type A and 18 inlets of type B, the 60 liter tank is filled in 60 minutes. So in 1 minute, 1 liter is filled. What we are assuming over here is that inlets of type A fill A liters per minute and inlets of type B fill B liters per minute. So if there are 10 inlets of type A and 45 inlets of type B, they fill 2 liters in 1 minute. Similarly, 8 inlets of type A and 18 inlets of type B fill 1 liter per minute. Using these two equations, solving them, we will find out the value of A and B. Then we will uh, calculate the value of 7a plus 27b and then we will use it to solve the answer. So if you are looking at the first equation and the second equation, there are many ways in which you can solve it. We will multiply the first equation by 2 and the second equation by 5. Then we can eliminate b. So when you multiply the first equation by 2, you are going to get 20a plus 90b is equal to 4 and when you multiply the second equation by 5, you get 40a plus 90b is equal to 5. If you subtract uh, the first one from the second one, you are going to get 20a is equal to 1 or a is equal to 1 by 20. So inlets of type A fill 1 by 20 liters per minute. Using any one of the uh, two equations, you can solve for b also. So if you are using the first equation, 10a is 10 into 1 by 20 plus 45b is equal to 2 or 45b is equal to 2 minus half that is 3 by 2 or b is equal to 1 by 30. So inlets of type b fill 1 by 30 liters per minute. We have 7 inlets of type a and 27 inlets of type b. 
So how many liters will they fill in one minute? It will be 7 into 1 by 20 plus 27 into 1 by 30. This will be 7 by 20 plus 9 by 10 which is equal to by 20, 7 plus 18 is 25. This is equal to 5 by 4 liters per minute. So 27 inlets of type A and uh, 7 inlets of type A and 27 inlets of type B fill 5 by 4 liters every minute. Now the volume of the tank we have assumed to be 60 liters. So the total amount of time it will take is 60 divided by 5 by 4. This is equal to 60 into 4 by 5. This is 12 into 4, this is equal to 48 minutes. So the answer in this case is 48 minutes. In this question, we are required to find out the number of pairs of positive integers which satisfy the equation m square plus 105 is equal to n square. So m square plus 105 is equal to n square. This would imply that n square minus m square is equal to 105 or n minus m into n plus m is equal to 105. Now here you should understand that because n and m are positive integers, n minus m is also a positive integer and n plus m is also a positive integer. Now in that case, we will just do the uh, factorization of 105 and then try to see which of the following pairs match up. So for example, the all the factors of 105 are 1, 3, 5, 7, 15, 21, 35 and 105. These are the factors of 105. Now we want n minus m and n plus m to be complementary. Complementary as in the product should match up to 105. That is 1 and 105 when they when you multiply them you are going to get 105. 3 and 35 will also get you 105. 5 and 21 will also get you 105 and 7 and 15 will get you 105. And n plus m will be greater than n minus m because n and m are positive integers. So what we can do from this is that the all the only cases which are possible are n plus m is equal to 105 and n minus m is equal to 1. The second case that is possible is n plus m is equal to 35 and n minus m is equal to 3. Notice that when you multiply them you are going to get 105. The third case is that n plus m is equal to 21 and n minus m is equal to 5. And finally, n plus m is equal to 15 and n minus m is equal to 7. Now, if you uh, calculate the actual values of n and m using these four equations, you will get that n is equal to 53 and m is equal to 52 in the first case. Similarly, in the second case, n is equal to 19 and m is equal to 16. In the third case, n is equal to 13 and m is equal to 8. In the final case, n is equal to 11 and m is equal to 4. So these are the four uh, solutions for the equation n square m square plus 105 is equal to n square. So the required answer is 4. All we have done is find the factors of 105 and then find the complementary factors of 105. Complementary pairs of factors. By complementary pairs, we are finding out the pairs of factors which when multiplied give you 105. Once you get them, you found out that there are four such pairs. The pairs are 105 and 1, 35 and 3, 21 and 5 and 15 and 7. For each one of them, you will be able to find a value of n and a value of m such that n square is equal to m square plus 105. So in this case, the correct answer is 4. In this question, it is given that there is a brick and the rectangular faces of the brick have diagonals. So the diagonals are in the ratio 3 is to 2, to 2 into root 3 to the ratio root 15. We are required to find out the ratio of the length of the shortest edge of the brick to that of the longest edge. So suppose that there is a brick like this. <coughs> this is a cuboid as given in the question. Now the cuboid will have three diagonals on the face. So if the length of the sides are A, B and C. The length of one of the diagonals of each of the faces will be square root of a square plus b square. The second diagonal will be square root of b square plus c square. And the third diagonal will be square root of c square plus a square. These are the three sides. Now we are given the ratio of each one of them. So let us assume that this is equal to 3, 
this is equal to 2 root 3 and this is equal to root 15. Using these three equations, we can find out the value of a, b and c. We can find out which of the following is the longest and which of the following is the shortest and then find the required ratio. Because this is the ratio, let us assume that this is 3k, 2 root 3k and root 15k where k is a constant. Now we can square each one of them to get three different equations which is a square plus b square is equal to 3k whole square which is 9k square. Using the second equation b square plus c square is equal to 2 root 3 into k whole square which is equal to 12k square. And the third one is c square plus a square is equal to 15k square. The easiest way to calculate the value of each one of them a, b, c is uh, sum all the three equations because of symmetry and if you simply calculate you are going to get 2 into a square plus b square plus c square is equal to the sum of these three 9 plus 12 is 21, 21 plus 15 is 36 k square. Therefore the sum of the three squares that is a square plus b square plus c square will be 18 k square. Now you can subtract each of the equations individually to find out the value of a, b and c. For example from the first equation we will get that the value of c square is equal to 9k square because the sum of a, b and c is 18 and a plus b is 9 so c square is 9k square. Similarly from the second equation you will get that a square is equal to 18k square minus 12k square which is 6k square. Similarly, from the third equation, you will get that b square is equal to 3k square. Clearly, b is the smallest and c is the longest. So, c is equal to square root of 9k square which is 3k which is the longest side and the shortest side is b which is equal to root 3 into k. You will get this from the third equation. This is the shortest. Now, what you are required to find out is the ratio of the length of the shortest edge to the of the longest edge. So, the required ratio is root 3 k is to 3 k which is equal to 1 is to root 3. This is the answer. In this question it is given that one can use three different transports which move at 10, 20 and 30 kilometers per hour to travel. So, the three different transports are 10 kilometers per hour. 20 kilometers per hour and 30 kilometers per hour. To reach from A to B, Amal took each mode of transport for one third of the journey time. So, this is Amal. For him, the time that he used for e by each of the transport um, modes is the same. While Bimal took each mode of transport for one third of the total distance. For Bimal, the distance traveled by each mode of transport is the same. The percentage by which Bimal's travel time exceeds Amal's travel time is nearest to and we are given options. So, as for Amal, the time uh, traveled by each mode of transport is the same. Let us assume that he traveled for T hours using each mode of transport. So, he traveled T hours at 10 kilometers per hour, T hours at 20 kilometers per hour and T hours at 30 kilometers per hour. So, the distance that he travelled at 10 km per hour is 10 t, the distance that he travelled at 20 km per hour is 20 t and the distance that he travelled at 30 km per hour is 30 t. Therefore, the total distance from A to B is 10 t plus 20 t plus 30 t which is equal to 60 t. Now, for Bimal, the distance that he travelled using each mode of transport is the same and the total distance is 60 t. So, he travelled 20 t kilometres at 10 kilometers per hour, 20 t kilometers at 20 kilometers per hour and 20 t kilometers at 30 kilometers per hour. So, for Bimal the time that he has taken while traveling at 10 kilometers per hour is the distance traveled by the speed that is 20 by 10 that will be 2 t. Similarly, the time at which he traveled at 20 kilometers per hour will be 20 t by 20 which will be t and the time at which he traveled uh, during which he traveled at 30 kilometers per hour will be 20 t by th 30 which is equal to 2 t by 3. Now, for Amal the total time travelled will be t plus t plus t this is equal to 3 t. For Bimal the total time that he travelled will be 2 t plus t this is equal to 3 t plus 2 t by 3. 3 t plus 2 t by 3 will be 11 t by 3. Now, in the question we are supposed to find out the percentage by which Bimal's travel time 
that is 11 t by 3 exceeds Amel's travel time that is 3 t. So, the required percentage will be 11 t by 3 minus 3 t by 3 t. If you simplify this will come to 2 by 9. 2 by 9 is equal to 22.22 percentage. Now, amongst the options you can see that the option which is closest is option A which is 22. So, the answer that we are looking for is 22. In this question it is given that there are two bicycles A and B, their radii are 30 centimeters and 40 centimeters. So, say this is bicycle A and this is bicycle B. Bicycle A's radius is 30 centimeters and bicycle B's radius is 40 centimeters. While traveling a certain distance, each wheel of A required 5000 more revolutions than each wheel of B. So, suppose the number of revolutions required by A is Ra and the number of revolutions required by B is Rb. It is given that Ra is equal to Rb plus 5000. If bicycle B travel this distance in 45 minutes, then it is speed in kilometers per hour is what? So, let us first find out the value of Ra and Rb. Then we will get the number of revolutions that Rb has done. From that we can calculate the total distance that uh, B has travelled and we are given that it has taken 45 minutes to travel this distance. So, we can find out its speed. So, the crucial information here is the relationship between Ra and Rb. Now, as the radii of the wheels are in the ratio 3 is to 4, the radii of A is to the radii of B is in the ratio 3 is to 4, their circumference that is circumference of A by circumference of B will also be in the ratio of 3 is to 4. So, whenever uh, A travel makes one revolution, it uh, travels say 3 k meters, B after one revolution travels 4 k meters. Therefore, the number of revolutions that uh, are needed by A that is Ra and the number of revolutions that are needed by B will be in the inverse ratio. This will be 4 is to 3 because for every one revolution the distance travelled by A is say 3 k and the distance travelled by B is 4 k. The number of revolutions that will be needed will be in the inverse ratio of their radii. So, once we have this simple equation Ra by Rb is equal to 4 by 3 we know that Ra is equal to Rb plus 5000. This would imply that Rb that is the number of revolutions of B plus 5000 by Rb is equal to 4 is to 3. This would mean that if you simplify 3 Rb plus 15000 is equal to 4 Rb or Rb is equal to 15000. Therefore, to cover this certain distance, the number of revolutions required for uh, wheels of uh, cycle B is 15,000. You can also infer that the number of revolutions that are needed for cycle A will be Rb plus 5,000. This is 20,000. So, the distance travelled by B will equal 15,000 revolutions into the circumference of B, which is 2 into pi into its radius. Its radius is 40 centimeters, so that is 0 0.4 meters. And the time that it has taken is 45 minutes. 45 minutes is equal to 3 by 4 hours. We are doing this because they wanted the speed in kilometers per hour. So, this is by 3 by 4. This is meters per hour. When you want to convert it into kilometers per hour, we will just divide it by 1000. So, we will just uh, convert 15,000 to 15. If you simplify this, you are going to get 15 into 2 is 30. 30 into 0.4 is 12. So, this is equal to 12 pi by 3 by 4. You can again simplify it and you are going to get the answer as 16 pi. So, the answer we are looking at is 16 pi. The most crucial thing that to do over here is getting the relationship between the number of revolutions that are required for cycle A to the number of revolutions that are required for cycle B. The number of revolutions that are required for uh, the ratio of the number of revolutions required will be the inverse ratio of their radii. Once you know this simple uh, fact, you are going to get the answer quite easily. In this question, we are told that there is a trapezium ABCD such that AD is parallel to BC. So, this is ABCD.
and this is how the trapezium is this is a this is uh, b this is c and this is d ad is parallel to bc and we are told that angle bad is 90 degrees so this is 90 degrees we are told that bc is 3 centimeters so this is 3 centimeters and ad is 8 centimeters this is 8 centimeters now we are given the perimeter of this trapezium that is 36 centimeters of which we know the lengths of two sides one is 3 and the other is 8 so the sum of the lengths of the remaining two will be 36 minus 11 which is equal to 25 centimeters so the sum of this plus sum of this is 25 centimeters now because this is 90 degrees let us draw a perpendicular from c which will intersect ad at a point say e this is a perpendicular that is drawn like that now because this is a trapezium bc is parallel to ad this also will be 90 degrees and therefore this is a rectangle such that ae will be 3 centimeters which is the same as the length of bc and ed will be 5 centimeters if you assume that the length of ab is x ce will also be equal to x and the length of cd will be square root of x square plus 5 square which is 25 so the value of x plus square root of x square plus 25 is equal to 25. Now, square root of x square plus 25 is equal to 25 minus x. If you square on both sides, you are going to get x square plus 25 is equal to 625 minus 50x plus x square. You cancel x square on both sides. We are going to get 50x is equal to 600. Or the value of x is equal to 12 centimeters. So this will be 12 centimeters. Now if you are trying to calculate the area of this trapezium, the area of the rectangle BCAE will be 12 into 3 which is equal to 36 centimeters and the area of the triangle CED will be half into base which is 5 centimeters into height which is x which is equal to 12 centimeters. This is equal to 30 centimeters square. That will be the respective areas. So the sum of the areas of these two which is the area of the trapezium will be 36 plus 30 which is 66 centimeter square. In this question it is given that there is a train T which leaves station X for station Y at 3 pm. So this is station X and this is station Y. Train T leaves it at 3 pm. Train S traveling at 3 quarters of the speed of T leaves Y for X at 4 pm. So from Y train S leaves at 4 pm. The speed of uh, train S is 3 fourths the uh, speed of uh, train T. The two of them pass each other at a station Z such that the distance between X and Z is 3 fifths that of X, uh, between X and Y. So if the distance is uh, uh, the 1 then they meet at Z such that xz is 3 fifths and yz will be 2 fifths. How many hours does the train take for its journey from x to y? So to make the calculation simple, we will assume that the distance between x and y is 50 meters. Why are we assuming it to be 50 kilometers? Because uh, there is 3 fifths and 2 fifths in the fraction. So we will assume that it is a multiple of 5 so that the calculations become easy. So let us assume that uh, the initial distance between x and y is 50 kilometers. So they meet at z such that xz is 30 kilometers and yz is 20 kilometers. Now as we have assumed the distance to be a number 50 kilometers, let us assume that the speed of train t is equal to t kilometers per hour. We can't assume this to be a number because we have already assumed the distance to be a particular number. So in the first one hour that is from 3 pm to 4 pm in one hour train T will cover T kilometers and it will come to a point let us assume the point to be A. So the distance between X and A is T kilometers. Now from uh, at 4 pm train T is at A and it is going towards Z. Similarly, train S is at Y and it is coming towards uh, Z. Now, in the time during which S travels 20 kilometers, train T would have traveled 20 into 4 by 3 kilometers. Why is this the case? Because from A, both the uh, train T is going towards Z 
and from y train s is going towards z so in uh, the time during which s will go from y to z it would cover 20 kilometers but its speed is 3 fourth the speed of train t so in the same time when train s covers 20 kilometers train t would have covered 20 into 4 by 3 kilometers therefore from a to z the distance will be 20 into 4 by 3 which is equal to 80 by 3 kilometers now we know that from x to a that is in 1 hour train t has covered t kilometers therefore 80 by 3 plus t is equal to 30 kilometers because 30 kilometers is the total distance xz which is equal to xa which is equal to t and az is equal to 20 into 4 by 3. Therefore, we can easily calculate the value of t to be equal to 30 minus 80 by 3 which is equal to by 3 90 minus 80 which is equal to 10 by 3 kilometers per hour. So, the speed of train t is 10 by 3 kilometers per hour. In one hour it covered 10 by 3 kilometers. So, it will cover in one hour it covered 10 by 3 kilometers. So, in how many hours will it cover 50 kilometers which is the total distance between x and y. This is quite simple this will be 50 by 10 by 3 or this will be 5 you can bring 3 to the numerator. So, 5 into 3 which is equal to 15 hours. So, the answer in this case is 15. In this question we have just assumed the distance between x and y to be 50 kilometers. Then we know that train t has covered a total of 30 kilometers and train s has covered a uh, total of 20 kilometers. Now, if you are assuming that in the first one hour train t has covered t kilometers, then in the remaining time it has covered 30 minus t kilometers. So, 30 minus t is the distance that uh, train t has covered by 20 which is the distance that train s has covered will equal 4 by 3. You can solve this and you will get that t is equal to 10 by 3. Once you get uh, the equation that t is equal to 10 by 3, it is the distance that train t covers in 1 hour. You can calculate in how many hours it will cover 50 kilometers by simple division and you are going to get the answer as 15 hours. In this question we are given that there are two positive integers a and b such that 1 by a plus 1 by b is equal to 2 by 9 and a is less than b <coughs> and we are required to find out the product of all the possible values of a. So in these kind of questions we will try to find out the value of one in terms of the other and then try to find out if we can find some sort of a pattern because both of them have to be positive integers. So 1 by a plus 1 by b is equal to 2 by 9 or 1 by b is equal to 2 by 9 minus 1 by a this will equal 2a minus 9 by 9a this is the value of 1 by b or b is equal to 9a by 2a minus 9. Now this has been given to us we know that both a and b are positive integers and both of them uh, a is less than b. So if you look at the denominator the denominator is 2a minus 9. So, a has to be greater than 9 by 2 that is 4.5. So, the smallest value of a is when a is equal to 5. And in this case the value of b will be 9a by 2a minus 9. When a is equal to 5 the denominator will be 2 into 5 that is 10 minus 9 that is 1 and the numerator will be 45 9 into 5. Both of them are positive integers and a is less than b. So, this is a valid solution. Now, let us see when a is equal to 6 which is the next highest positive number. Then 2a minus 9 when a is equal to 6 will become equal to 3 and the numerator will be 9 into 6 by 3. So, this is equal to 18. You would already find some sort of a pattern. The pattern is as a is increasing the value of b is decreasing. So, at some point a will become greater than b and from then on we can ignore all the values. So, in this case for example when a is 6, b is 18 and a is less than b, both are positive integers. So, this is also a valid solution. When a is equal to 7, the value of b will become 9 into 7 by 2 into 7 minus 9. We are just substituting the value of 7 
in the given equation. So this will be 63 by 2 into 7 is 14, 14 minus 9 is 5. So the value of b will become 63 by 5. This is not an integer, so this is not a valid solution. The next uh, number will be when a is equal to 8 and the value of b will be 9 into 8 by 2 into 8 minus 9. So the numerator is 72 and the denominator is 2 into 8 that is 16 minus 9 that is 7. 72 by 7 again is not a positive integer so this is also not valid. Now when you make a equal to 9, b will become 9 into 9 by 2 into 9 minus 9. So this will become 81 by 2 into 9 is 18 minus 9 is 9. So this will equal 9. Both of them are positive integers but in this case a is equal to b. A is not less than b. So this is also not a valid solution and as you can guess as you keep increasing a the value of b will become less than 9. That is for example if you look at a is equal to 10 the value of b will become 9 into 10 by 2 into 10 that is 20 minus 9 that is 11. So this is 90 by 11. This is actually something like around 8.118. So when a becomes 10 the value of b will become 8.18 and this will continue to go down as a keeps on going up. So all the other possible values are not valid. So the only two possible values of a for which the given equation holds true such that both a and b are positive integers and a is less than b is a is equal to 5 and a is equal to 6 and their product is equal to 30. This is the answer. In this question, we are told that one third of the buses from A to B stop at C. So if uh, there is A here and suppose a bus is going towards B and there is a point C over here in the middle. This is C and this is B. And let us assume that the total number of buses is 3x. So 2x will go directly from A to B and only x will go from A to C. One third of the passengers in the buses stopping at C continue to city B. So at city C, some of them get down and the remaining go to B. All the buses have equal capacity and all of them start full at A. What is the proportion of passengers going to city B from city A that travel by a bus stopping at city C? Let us assume that the number of people who travel in each of these buses is 3y. So the total number of passengers who go from A to B directly will be 2x into 3y. So A to B direct, the number of buses is 2x and each bus has 3y people. So the total number of passengers who go is 6xy. The number of passengers who go from A to C will be x into 3y which is equal to 3xy. But from here only one third of them actually go to B. So A, C, B, the number of people who go is only xy. The remaining 2xy get down at C. So the total number of passengers who go to B from A is 7xy. Out of them the proportion which stop at uh, C and then continue to B will be xy. So the required proportion is 1 by 7. So the answer is option A. Google search Crapo free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 CAT aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, it is given that there is a cyclist and a bus. They start from two cities P and Q at the same time and they keep going towards each other. Every day they travel at the same speed and they meet at a dhaba. They cross each other at a dhaba. Let us assume that this is P and this is Q. The cyclist is going from this side and the bus is coming from this side. Every day they cross each other at a dhaba which is, in the, which is at some point in the middle, not exactly midpoint. But one day the cyclist starts 42 minutes later because of which instead of meeting at the dhaba, they meet uh, 5 kilometers away. So again this is P and this is Q. The cyclist again starts but this time he starts 42 minutes later. So instead of meeting here at the dhaba, they meet 5 kilometers ahead, say E. And this distance is 5 kilometers. The bus starts at its usual time. 
and now we are asked to find out we are given that the speed of the cyclist is 10 kilometers per hour now what is the speed of the bus this is what we are required to find out there are many ways to do it but if you understand symmetry and if you understand it intuitively the answer can be gotten quite easily so the only difference between the first scenario and the second scenario is that the cyclist has started 42 minutes later the bus has started at the same time and for the bus there is no real difference so by the time the bus comes to the dhaba on the second day the bus driver would have been expecting to see the cycle driver but the cycle driver is not there now how far away is the cycle driver the cycle started 42 minutes later so the distance that the cyclist had to cover which he didn't is 42 by 60 hours into the speed of the cyclist that is 10 if you simplify this this is 7 kilometers so on the second day when the bus is at the dhaba the cyclist is at a point f which is 7 kilometers away from the dhaba now the bus driver doesn't know it and he will continue to come towards the point p and the cyclist will continue to go from f towards the point q and finally they meet at a point e so if you are considered if you are ignoring everything and if you are only considering the movement of the bus from the dhaba and the movement of the cyclist from f both of them have started at the same point at the same time and by the time the cyclist was able to cover the distance f to e the bus was able to cover the distance d to e now the cyclist has covered two kilometers because d to f is 7 kilometers and d to is 5 kilometers f is 2 kilometers while d is 5 kilometers so in the same time that the cyclist covered 2 kilometers the bus driver or the bus covered 5 kilometers therefore the ratio of their speeds is 2 is to 5 we already know that the speed of the cyclist is 10 kilometers per hour therefore the speed of the bus is 10 into 5 by 2 this is equal to 25 kilometers per hour so the answer is 25 in this question it is given that a and b are integers of opposite signs such that a plus 3 whole square by b square is equal to 9 is to 1 and a minus 1 whole square by b minus 1 whole square is 4 is to 1 we are required to find out the ratio of a square by b square so let us try to solve both the equations and see what we will get if you are looking only at the first equation it implies that a plus 3 whole square by b square is equal to 9 we can take square roots on both sides so a plus 3 by b is equal to plus or minus 3 or a plus 3 is equal to 3b or a plus 3 is equal to minus 3b now let us look at the second equation it says that a minus 1 whole square by b minus 1 whole square is equal to 4 by 1 or a minus 1 is equal to plus or minus 2 into b minus 1 again we are going to get two equations that is a minus 1 is equal to 2b minus 2 or a minus 1 is equal to 2 minus 2b we can simplify this so a is equal to 2b minus 1 or a is equal to 3 minus 2b so now we have basically four equations there are four possibilities and we will solve for uh, all the four possibilities try to find out the values of a and b and we should have both of them as integers with opposite signs then we will uh, pick those uh, numbers and try to calculate the value of a square by b square so the first case is a plus 3 is equal to 3b and a is equal to 2b minus 1 this is the first case that is when these two are correct the second one is a plus 3 is equal to 3b and a is equal to 3 minus 2b this is the second case that is when these two hold true the next one will be a plus 3 is equal to minus 3b and a is equal to 2b minus 1 that is when these two are correct and the last case is a plus 3 is equal to minus 3b and a is equal to 3 minus 2b so here we have four possibilities we will solve for a and b in each one of them and then try to move forward so if you are solving for these two we can substitute the value of a in the first equation so we are going to get 2b minus 1 plus 3 is equal to 3b or the value of b is equal to 2 so the value of a which is equal to 2 in 2b minus 1 will equal 3 so this is one solution that is b is equal to 2 and a is equal to 3 although both of them are integers they are of the same sign both of them are positive so this is not the correct answer 
If you are looking at the second one, again we will substitute the value of a in the first equation. So, we are going to get 3 minus 2 b plus 3 is equal to 3 b or 5 b is equal to 6 or b is equal to 6 by 5. This is also not correct because in this case b is not an integer. We can calculate the value of a, but that is not needed. If we are looking at the third one, again we will substitute the value of a in the first equation. So, we are going to get 2 b minus 1 plus 3 is equal to minus 3 b or 5 b is equal to minus 2 or b is equal to minus 2 by 5. Again, this is not the correct answer because b is not an integer. Now, let us look at the last option. We will again substitute the value of a in the first equation. So, it is 3 minus 2 b plus 3 is equal to minus 3 b or minus b is equal to 6 or b is equal to minus 6. If b is equal to minus 6, a which equals 3 minus 2 b will be 3 minus of minus 12. So, that is equal to 15. So, in this case a is 15 and b is minus 6. Both of them are integers and both of them are of the opposite sign. So, this is a valid solution. So, now let us try to calculate the value of a square by b square. a square will be 15 square by b square will be 6 square. Both of them are multiples of 3 that is 15 and 6. So, we can simplify this as 5 square by 2 square. This is equal to 25 by 4. So, the answer in this case is 25 by 4. In this question, it is given that Ravi appeared in five exams, English, Math, Science, Social Science and Computer Science. So, there are five exams. They are English, Math, Science, Social Science and Computer Science. Now, the total marks allotted for each of the subjects is a multiple of 50. So, let us assume that the marks that he got are 50A, 50B, 50C, 50D and 50E where a, b, c, d and e are natural numbers. We are also told that the numbers are unique. They are, each one of them is different. Now, the pass mark in each one of them is 40% of the total marks. And we are also told that the total marks allotted for each of these 5 subjects is 750. That is the sum of all these 5 numbers is 750. This will give us an idea about what is the value of a plus b plus c plus d plus e. Because 50a plus 50b plus 50c plus 50d plus 50 is equal to 750. So, 50 into a plus b plus c plus d plus e is equal to 750 or a plus b plus c plus d plus e is equal to 15. Now, you should immediately notice that all a to e are independent or unique numbers. They are all different numbers and the smallest possible value of the sum of 5 unique natural numbers is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5. But this sum itself 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 is equal to 15. So, what this means is that A, B, C, D and E are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But we don't know which is what. We just know that all 5 of them are the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But A can be any of 1, 2, 5. We can't say that A is exactly equal to 1. But we know that all 5 of them are between 1 and 5. And all of them are unique. Now, if we go to the next one, some more information is given. It is given that the difference between the marks is scored in English and the pass mark in English is 10% of the pass marks. We know that the pass marks is 40% of the total. Now, if you have scored 10% more than the pass marks, that is 10% of the pass marks is 4%. Therefore, his score in English is 44% of the total marks. So, in English, he has scored 44%. Similarly, for maths, this difference is 20% of the pass marks. The pass marks is again 40%, 20% of the pass marks is 8%. So, in maths he scored 48%. Similarly, in science he scored 52%. In social science he scored 56%. And in computer science he scored 60%. We are also given the total marks that he scored. The total marks he scored are 410. This can be easily calculated for the individual subjects. For example, in English he has scored 50A is the total marks into 44%. So, 50A into 44 by 100 is equal to 22A. So, in English, he scored 22A. Similarly, in Maths, he scored 24B. In Science, he scored 26C. In Social Science, he scored 28D. And in Computer Science, he scored 30A. Now, the sum of all of the marks that he scored is 410. So, we know that 22A plus 24B plus 26C plus 28D plus 30E is equal to 410. 
or we can take uh, 22 into a plus b plus c plus d plus e common because we know the value of a plus b plus c plus d plus e that is equal to 15 and we will basically express 24b as 22b plus 2b. So 22b will go into the brackets and 2b will be left. Similarly 26c can be expressed as 22c plus 4c. 22c will go into the bracket and 4c will be left. Similarly for 28d it will be 6d and for 30e it will be 80. This is equal to 410. But again we know that a plus b plus c plus d is equal to 15. So 22 into 15 is 330. So 2b plus 4c plus 6d plus 80 is equal to 410 minus 330 or 2b plus 4c plus 6d plus 80 is equal to 410 minus 22 into 15, 22 into 50 is 330 so this will equal 80. We can divide the entire equation by 2 because all of them are, all the coefficients are multiples of 2. So b plus c plus b plus 2c plus 3d plus 4e is equal to 40. Now is there a way in which we can solve it? Is there a way in which we can find out the values of a, b, c, d and e? Because there is only one equation. But surprisingly we can actually find out the values of a, b, c, d and e because we know that all of them are unique between 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Now so if you are looking at the equation b plus 2c plus 3d plus 4e and if you want to maximize it, the way you maximize it that is to get the maximum possible value is multiplying the highest coefficient that is 4 with the highest possible value that is if you assume that e is equal to 5 and d is equal to 4 and c is equal to 2 and b is equal to b, c is equal to 3 and b is equal to 2 only then will the expression b plus 2c plus 3d plus 4e be maximized and if you calculate the maximum value it will actually equal 40 we can do that now that is 4 into 5 is 20 plus 3 into 4 is 12 plus 2 into 3 is 6 plus b is 2 so if you calculate this, this is 32 plus 8, this is 40. So b plus 2c plus 3d plus 4e, the maximum possible value is 40. And this happens when b is equal to 2, c is equal to 3, d is equal to 4 and d is equal to 5. But as we are given that the value of b plus 2c plus 3d plus 4 is equal to 40, it would imply that b is equal to 2, c is equal to 3, d is equal to 4 and e is equal to 5. This would imply that a is equal to 1. For any other permutation of a, b, c, d and d, the value of b plus 2, c plus 3, d plus 4, e will be less than 40. So now we know that a is 1, b is 2, c is 3, d is 4 and d is 5. We can calculate what exactly has been asked. It has been asked that we have to calculate the difference between the marks that is scored in maths and social science. In maths as b is 2, the total is out of 100. This is 50 b. In social science as d is 4, the total is for 200. And in maths he scored 48%. That is in maths he scored 48. And in social science he scored 56% of 200. That is he scored 112. So the difference between these two is 112 minus 48 which will equal 64. question we are told that a brother and sister both of them appear for an interview. The probability of selection of the brother is 1 by 8. So for brother the probability of selection is equal to 1 by 8. So what is the probability of his getting rejected? It is 1 minus 1 by 8 which is equal to 7 by 8. While the probability of rejection for the sister is 4 by 5. So what is the probability of her getting selected? It is 1 minus 4 by 5 which is equal to 1 by 5. We are required to calculate the probability that exactly one of them is selected. So what is the probability that the brother is selected and the sister is rejected that will be equal to 1 by 8 into 4 by 5. And what is the probability that the brother is rejected and the sister is selected it will be plus 7 by 8 into 1 by 5. So the first number is 4 by 40 and the second number is 7 by 40. So the overall probability is 4 plus 7 that is equal to 11 by 40. This is the answer. In this question it is given that a shopkeeper used uh, a 1 or 2 centimeter scale whenever he is buying and when he was selling he was using a 98 centimeter scale. Now he marks up the price of the cloth by 10% and then he gives a discount. So what is the maximum discount that he can give so that he can sell without incurring a loss. So let us assume initially that the cost price of the cloth is rupees 100 
per meter that is rupees 100 for 100 centimeters now if he goes to a shop with rupees 100 he is going to normally purchase 100 centimeters of cloth but because he is using a fraudulent scale of 1 or 2 centimeters he is going to get 102 centimeters of cloth for rupees 100 now then he marks up the price of the cloth by 10 percent therefore the marked price of the cloth is rupees 110 per meter that is rupees 110 for 100 centimeters and he has 102 centimeters so how much money that he does he make the amount of money that he makes is 102 by 98 because he is using a 98 centimeter scale so whenever he is telling his customers when he is selling he has 102 centimeters and because he is using a fraudulent scale of 98 centimeters the apparent uh, length that he has will be 102 by 98 centimeters this is the amount of cloth that he is selling and now let us assume that he is selling the selling price is say SP now whenever he is selling 102 by 98 at SP he has to make no loss or no profit so he has to get back his 100 rupees therefore the selling price of the cloth will be 98 into 100 divided by 102 you can simplify this as 4900 divided by 51 per this is the amount of money that he has to get back for 100 centimeters that is per meter now the mark price is 110 per meter the selling price is 4900 by 51 Therefore, the maximum percentage of discount that he can give is 110 minus 4900 by 51 divided by the mark price that is 110 into 100. You can simplify this. This will become 110 into 51 will be 5610 minus 4900 divided by 51 into 110 into 100. 56, uh, 5610 minus 4900 will be 7610 by 561 into 5610 minus 4900. So this will be 5610 minus 4900 will be 01710. So this is 710 by 5610 into 100. You can simplify this as uh, 7100 divided by 561 you can use your calculator to calculate it it will be approximately 12.65 percent so the maximum discount that he can give on the market price will be 12.65 percent in this question we are given a quadratic equation in u and v and we are required to find out the value of u plus 3v so we will first simplify the given quadratic equation we will see how it looks and then we will try to find out the required answer. So in this case the quadratic equation can be simplified as u square plus u minus 2v plus 1 whole square will be u square plus 4v square plus 1 minus 4uv plus 4v minus 2u this is the left hand side this is equal to minus of 4uv minus 4 v square on the right hand side we can cancel 4 uv on both the sides and if we bring minus 4 v square to the left hand side it will be 2 u square minus 2 u plus 8 v square plus 4 v plus 1 is equal to 0 now this is the new quadratic equation that we have when we simplify the given quadratic equation but from this there is no obvious way in which we can find out the value of u plus 3v the only thing that we can look at it if you look at the quadratic e equation is that the u terms are separate from the v terms there is no common term for example there is no uv term then you should uh, try to see if you can complete a square that is let us see if we can complete uh, a square using 2u square minus 2v and try to complete a square using 8v square plus 4v and then try to proceed forward now when you are trying to simplify 2u square minus 2u that is 2 into u square minus u always try to remember that the coefficient of u square <coughs> and in this case the coefficient of v square should be a perfect square over here the coefficient of u square because you have taken 2 common is 1 so it will be something like u minus a constant whole square if you look at the coefficient of v it is 1 so you should look at it that the common term has to be half because 
when you uh, expand u minus uh, half whole square this will be u square where the coefficient of u is matching minus 2 into half into 1 this will be the coefficient of u u plus 1 fourth this is basically equal to u square minus u plus 1 by 4 u minus half whole square therefore the given expression that is 2 u square minus 2 u will equal 2 into u minus half whole square minus 1 by 2. Similarly, we can complete the square for 8v square plus 4v. Again, let us try to make uh, the coefficient of v square a perfect square. So, let us represent this as 2 into 4v square plus 2v. When you see 4v square as the coefficient of v of v square, you should look at it as this will be something like 2v plus something whole square. So, the coefficient of v will be 4 and the term which is the coefficient of 2 will have uh, already 2 into 2v that is already there is 4v. So, it will be half the constant term will be half because when you expand this you are going to get this as 4v square plus 2v plus 1 by 4. Therefore, the given term that is 8v square plus 4v is equal to 2 into 2v plus half whole square minus 1 by 2. This is basically we are uh, multiplying the plus 1 by 4 with 2. Now, you can look at it that the given quadratic equation that is 2u square minus 2u is nothing but 2 into u minus half whole square minus 1 by 2 and 8v square plus 4v is again nothing but plus 2 into 2v plus half whole square minus 1 by 2 and remember that we have a plus 1 also on the left hand side. This is equal to 0. Now, this minus half and minus half and plus 1 will become 0 and what we are left with is u minus half whole square plus 2v plus half whole square is equal to 0. Now, this is of the form a square plus b square is equal to 0. This will happen only if a is equal to 0 and b is equal to 0 because you know that a square can never be negative. So, if the sum of two squares is 0, it is possible only if both the squares are 0. Therefore, u minus half is 0 that is u is equal to half and 2v plus half is also equal to 0. This would imply that v is equal to minus 1 by 4. Now, what are we required to find out? We are required to find out the value of u plus 3v. So, that will be half minus 3 into 1 by 4. This is equal to minus 1 by 4. So, the required answer is option c which is equal to minus 1 by 4. Now, once you look at uh, the quadratic equation that you get and you notice that we are required to find out u plus 3v. Then you can even look at the options, all the options are constants. Once you see that there is a constant over here, you should think that because there is no common term between u and v, there is no uv term, one of the ways in which we can proceed further is by completing squares. So then you can complete squares for u and v and then calculate the exact value of u and the exact value of v and find out the answer which is minus 1 by 4. In this question, it is given that there are uh, terms in an arithmetic progression a1, a2, dot, dot, dot and we are required to find out the value of the sum of 1 by square root of a1 plus a2 plus 1 by square root of a2 plus a3 dot, dot, dot for n term. The final term will be 1 by square root of a n plus square root of a n plus 1. In the examination, this kind of a question uh, can be easily answered by substituting the value of n to be equal to 1 and then 2 and then so on. For example, if you substitute the value of n to be 1, the sum will be the sum of the first one term that is 1 by square root of a1 plus a2. If you see and substitute the value of n to be 1, option c will become 0, option b will become 0 and option a will become 1 by square root of a1 minus square root of a2 which is not correct and the only option, the correct option will be option a where when you substitute the value of n to be 1 this will become 1 by square root of a1 plus square root of a2. So, immediately you can tick a and go to the next question. So, this is a shortcut to do these kind of questions. 
but if you want to solve it and find the value we can do it now so let us assume that the sum is s which is equal to 1 by square root of a1 plus square root of a2 plus dot 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 plus 1 by square root of a n plus square root of a n plus 1. Now for the first term multiply the numerator and denominator by square root of a2 minus square root of a1 because then the denominator will become a2 minus a1 and because uh, a2 minus a1, a2 all these terms are in arithmetic progression a2 minus a1 will become equal to d which is the common difference. So if you just substitute that here this will become s is equal to square root of a2 minus square root of a1 by a2 minus a1 plus square root of a3 minus square root of a2 by a3 minus a2 and then so on and the last term will become square root of a n plus 1 minus square root of a n by a of n plus 1 minus a of n. Now if you observe closely all the denominators will equal the common difference d because they are all in arithmetic progression and then if you take the common denominator as d the terms other than uh, the first and the last will get cancelled that is here uh, it is square root of a2 and in the second one it is minus of square root of a2. Similarly the third term for example would have been square root of a4 minus square root of a3 by d. Again a3 over here will get cancelled with a3 over here and the only terms that will remain are the last term which has a positive value which is square root of a n plus 1 minus and the first term which has a negative value which is square root of a1. The key to simplifying this is that the denominators for each of these terms are the same because they are in arithmetic progression. So once you have this as square root of a n plus 1 minus square root of n by d you can again simplify this by multiplying the numerator and the denominator by square root of a n plus 1 plus square root of a 1. Then the numerator will become this will equal a n plus 1 minus a 1 by d into square root of a n plus 1 plus square root of a 1. Now again as these are in arithmetic progression a n plus 1 minus a 1 will equal n into d. This is equal n into d by d into square root of a n plus 1 plus square root of a 1. You can cancel d which is the common difference and the final answer will be n by square root of a n plus 1 plus square root of a 1. So again as you can see the correct answer is option a. This is the answer. In this question we are given an inequality. We are told that x and y are whole numbers. A number is a whole number if it is an integer which is greater than or equal to 0. So it can be 0 or 1 or 2 or dot 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 till infinity. So we are told that x and y are in a whole numbers and we are told that 8 is less than or equal to modulus of 2x minus 4 into modulus of y minus 5 and this expression is also less than or equal to 16. So if you look at the inequality that is given we are told that 8 is less than or equal to modulus of 2x minus 4 into modulus of y minus 5 which is less than or equal to 16. So let us divide the entire equation by 2 because 2x minus 4 is a multiple of 2, 8 and 16 are also multiples of 2. So if you divide the entire inequality by 2 you are going to get that 4 is less than or equal to modulus of x minus 2 into modulus of y minus 5. This is less than or equal to 8. Now we have to figure out how many such x and y exist such that both of them are whole numbers and modulus of x minus 2 into modulus of y minus 5 lies between 4 and 8. So to simplify this let us assume that x minus 2 is equal to a. So a will be an integer and y minus 5 is equal to b. So b is also an integer and because x is greater than or equal to 0 a will be greater than or equal to minus 2 and because y is also greater than or equal to 0 b will be greater than or equal to minus 5. So the inequality that we have right now is that 4 is less than or equal to modulus of a into modulus of b which is less than or equal to 8. 
Now we know that A can be negative. If A is negative, A will be minus 2 or minus 1. Or A will be positive, where A is 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 till infinity. Similarly, B can be negative. When B is negative, B can be either minus 5 or minus 4 or minus 3 or minus 2 or minus 1. Or B can be positive, any positive natural number. We have to figure out how many such A and B exist. Because for every value of A and for every value of B, we will get a unique solution for X and Y. So let us try to identify how many such A and B exist such that A is greater than or equal to minus 2 and B is greater than or equal to minus 5 and modulus of A into modulus of B lies between 4 and 8. Now we will consider 4 cases. This is in my opinion the easiest way to enumerate. The 4 cases are that in the first case you have A to be less than 0 and B to be less than 0. In the second case you will have A to be less than 0 and B to be greater than 0. The third case you will have a to be greater than 0 and b to be less than 0 and in the last case you will have both of them to be greater than 0 that is a is greater than 0 and b is greater than 0. We will calculate how many solutions exist in each of the cases and then we will sum them up. If a is less than 0 a can be either minus 2 or minus 1. So if a is minus 2 and b is also negative so b ranges from minus 5 to minus 1. So what is the value of a and b such that the absolute value of a into b modulus of that lies between 4 and 8, then B can be either minus 2, then the product will be 4, the more absolute value, it can be minus 3 or it can be minus 4. Similarly, if A is minus 1, the value of B can be minus 4 or minus 5. The absolute value of B cannot be greater than 5 or B cannot be less than minus 5 and you also want A into B, the absolute value of it to be greater than 4. So the total number of cases in this particular scenario is 5. If you are looking at the scenario where a is less than 0 and b is greater than 0, a can be again minus 2. In this case what is the what are the values that b can take? Now b is positive so there is no restriction on the value of b. The only thing is you want the product of a and b, the absolute value of it to lie between 4 and 8. So now b can be either 2 or 3 or 4 like earlier and if a is minus 1. Now B can be uh, 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8. Note that now there is no restriction that B, the absolute value of B cannot be greater than 5. Because in positive terms B can be any number. Only in negative terms is there the restriction that B cannot be less than minus 5. In the second case the number of solutions are 3 plus 5 which is equal to 8. Let us look at the next uh, Case. The next case is A is greater than 0 and B is less than 0. Now as B is less than 0, the number of values that B can take is limited. So B can be either minus 5. Therefore the values that A can take will be only 1 which is 1 because you want the product to lie between 4 and 8. If B is minus 4, A can be either 1 or 2. If B is minus 3, A can be only 2 because if A is 1, the product will be equal to and if uh, a is equal to 3 the product will be 9 both of them are out of bounds so a can only be 2 if b is minus 2 a can be either 2 or 3 or 4 and if b is equal to minus 1 a can be either 4 or 5 or 6 or 7 or 8 the total number of cases is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 and 12 Finally, let us look at the solution where both a is greater than 0 and b is greater than 0. So there is no restriction on the number in either one of them. They can be any number whichever is greater than 0. So let us assume that a is 1, then b can be 4, 5, 6, 7 or 8. If a is 2, b can be 2, 3 and 4 because the product has to lie between 4 and 8. If a is 3, b can be only equal to 2. If a is 4, b can be equal to 2 or 4, no 2 or uh, if a is 4 b can be either uh, 1 or 2 because you want a into b to be between 4 and 8. If a is 5 b can be 1, if a is 6 b can be 1, if a is 7 b can be 1 and if a is 8 b can be 1. So again we will have to sum them up this will be 5 plus 3 8 plus 2 that is 10 plus 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So there are 15 in this particular case. So the total number of solutions are 5 plus 8 that is 13 plus 12 is 25 plus 15 is 40. 
this seems to be a question which takes a lot of time so if it comes in the actual examination and if you don't have a lot of time these are questions which are not uh, advised that you spend a lot of time in enumerating all these cases but if you do have a lot of time in the examination by any chance you should uh, definitely go ahead and answer it the answer in this case anyways is 40. In this question we are given two quadratic equations in x we are told that a and b are integers such that 2x square minus ax plus 2 is always greater than 0 and x square minus bx plus 8 is also always greater than or equal to 0 for all real numbers x. Then we are required to find out the largest possible value of 2a minus 6b. Just to recollect if any quadratic equation ax square plus bx plus c is always greater than 0 for all values of x this is possible only if the discriminant is less than 0. Now the discriminant for any quadratic equation is uh, b square minus 4ac. Now if this equation ax square plus bx plus c is always greater than 0 for all values of x it would imply that b square minus 4ac is less than 0. Similarly if uh, ax square plus bx plus c is always greater than or equal to 0 it would imply that the discriminant is also always less than or equal to 0 or b square minus 4ac is less than or equal to 0. So we will use this simple concept to find out the range for a and we will find out the range for b and once we find both of them out we will find out the maximum possible value of 2a minus 6b. <coughs> so because 2x square minus ax plus 2 is always greater than 0 this would imply that the discriminant is exactly is always less than 0 this is a strict inequality now discriminant is b square minus 4ac that is the coefficient of x whole square which is a square minus 4 times the coefficient of x square that is 2 into the constant term that is 2 is strictly less than 0 or a square is strictly less than 16 or a lies between minus 4 and plus 4. Notice that because there is a strict greater than here a will strictly lie between minus 4 and 4. a cannot be minus 4 or 4 and because we know that a is an integer this would imply that a belongs to the set minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2 and 3. We will do the same thing even for b. Here we are told that x square minus bx plus 8 is greater than or equal to 0. So the discriminant is less than or equal to 0. Now again the discriminant is b square minus 4ac. So b is basically the coefficient of x. So this will be b square minus 4 into a is the coefficient of x square. In this case it is 1 into c is the constant term. In this case the constant term is 8 this is less than or equal to 0 or b square is less than or equal to 32. This would imply that b lies between square root minus square root of 32 to positive square root of 32. Again as b is an integer this would imply that b belongs to the set minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. So a can take these 7 values and b can take these 11 values. Now we are required to find out the maximum value of 2a minus 6b. Therefore to maximize 2a minus 6b, a has to be maximum and b has to be minimum because the coefficient of b over here is negative. The maximum value of a is 3 and the minimum value of b is minus 5. So the maximum value of 2a minus 6b will be 2 into 3 minus 6 into minus 5. 2 into 3 is 6 minus of 6 into minus 5 is minus 30. So this will be 6 plus 30 which is equal to 36. So the answer in this case is 36. In this question we are told that pk is to kq is 3 is to 5. So this is 3 is to 5 and PL is to LR is 5 is to 7. So this is 5 is to 7. Then the ratio of the area of triangle KSQ that is this one and triangle LSR that is this one is what? That is what we are supposed to find out. So what we will do is we will try to understand what is the ratio of the different areas of the smaller triangles that are present. 
So before we get started, let us assume that if you have a triangle like this and if there is a line drawn from one of the vertices to another vertex which divides the third side in the ratio P is to Q, then the area of the two triangles which are so formed are also in the ratio of P is to Q. Why is that the case? Because if you are assuming that the sides are A, B, C and D, the height of ABD, the triangle ABD and the height of triangle ACD, the height of both of these triangles is the same because the base is the same and the third vertex is also the same. So whatever is the perpendicular height from the base to the third vertex will always be the same. The only thing that will vary when you are trying to calculate the areas of the two triangles is the length of the base. In ABD, the length of the base is P times some uh, constant and in AC, the length of the base is Q times another constant. So if you are trying to calculate the area which is half into base into height, because height is the same for both the triangles, the area will be in the ratio of their respective bases. That is the same concept we will be using over here. So if you are looking at the triangles PSK and triangle uh, KSQ, the areas of these three triangles will be in the ratio 3 is to 5 because that is the length of their bases. So let us assume that the length, uh, the area of PSK is 3x and the area of KSQ is will then be equal to 5x. Similarly, if you are looking at triangles LSQ, sorry, LSP and triangle LSR, the ratio of the areas of these three, uh, two triangles will be in the ratio 5 is to 7. So let us assume that this is 5y, so this will be equal to 7y. Now the bottom triangle which is SQR, let us assume that the area of this triangle is equal to A, which is a third number. What we are now trying to do is, again we will use the same concept and try to calculate the ratio of x is to y. Once we calculate the ratio of x is to y, we can easily calculate the area of ksq to lsr. What is area of ksq? This will be equal to 5x divided by area of lsr is 7y. We are supposed to output or give the answer as equal to 5x by 7y. So we just need to know what is the ratio of x is to y. Now if you are looking at the areas of the larger triangles, that is area of R, Q, K and area of R, K, P, again this will be in the ratio 5 is to 3 because this is the larger triangle, the larger triangle is P, Q, R and the line R, Q divides the base in the ratio 3 is to 5, so again their areas will be in the ratio 3 is to 5. But what is the area of R, Q, R, if you R, Q, K? This is equal to 5x plus a divided by 3x plus 12y. This is equal to 5 by 3. Or if you simplify this, you are going to get, uh, you can cancel 3. So 5x plus a is equal to 5x plus 4 plus 20y. You can cancel x. So the value of a is equal to 20y. We will again use a similar concept. In this case, we will consider the triangles Q, P, Q, L and triangle R, Q, L. That is again in the larger triangle P, Q, R. Now we are considering the line Q, L which is dividing the third uh, side in the ratio 5 is to 7. So again the ratio of these two uh, triangles should be in the ratio 5 is to 7. But what is the area of PQL that is equal to 8x that is 5x plus 3x plus 5y. So 8x plus 5y divided by this is a, a plus 7y is in the ratio 5 is to 7. So now if you cross multiply you are going to get 56x plus 35y is equal to 5a plus 35y. You can cancel it or a is equal to 56 by 5 x. Now you know the value of a in terms of x, you know the value of a in terms of y, so you can easily calculate the ratio of x by y. So 56 x by 5 is equal to 20 y or x by y is equal to 
100 by 25 into 5 100 by divided by 56 or this is equal to 25 no by 25 by 14 because y comes to the denominator on the other side so this is 100 by 56 which is 25 by 14 so x by y is equal to 25 by 14 what we are supposed to output is 5x by 7y so 5x by 7y will equal 125 which is 5 into 25 by 7 into 14 which is 98 so the required ratio of areas is 125 is to 98 we at Kraku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question we are told that the sum of two numbers is 135 and their HCF is 9. How many such numbers can be formed? So let us assume that both the numbers are 9x and 9y because as the highest common factor of both the numbers is 9, it would imply that both the numbers are divisible by 9 and the sum of these two numbers is equal to 135. So 9x plus 9y is equal to 135 or the value of x plus y is equal to 15. What do we know about x and y? We know that x and y are natural numbers, they can't be fractions. We also know that x and y should have no common factor. Why should x and y have no common factor? Because we are told that the HCF of the two numbers is 9. This would imply that 9x and 9y, the only number which is common between both of them is 9. If say x and y have another common factor, say, say both of them are divisible by 2. Then the, L, then the HCF of 9x and 9y will be equal to 9 into 2 which is equal to 18. So you want x and y to have no other common factors and you want their sum to equal 15. How many different possible pairs are possible? So let us assume that x is equal to 1 then y is equal to 14. This is a valid pair. If x is equal to 2, y is equal to 13. This is also a valid pair. If x is equal to 3, the value of y is 12, but 3 and 12 have a number which is common, which is 3, so this is not possible. x can be 4, then y will be 11, this is also possible. x can be 5, then y is 10, this is again not possible because both of them have a common factor which is 5. 6 and 9 is also not possible because the common factors for 6 and 9 is 3. 7 and 8 is again possible because both of them are relatively prime to each other, they have no common factors. So if you look at the total number of pairs that are possible, it is 1, 2, 3 and 4. So the total number of pairs that are possible is 4. In this question we are told that there is a juice seller and he has a mango and uh, mango juice which contains both mango juice as well as water. The initial ratio is given as pH to Q. So there is mango and there is water. The initial ratio is P is to Q. Now he wants to increase his profit. So he adds some water to this solution and the ratio gets inverted. So the ratio becomes Q is to P. So immediately you should realize that the initial ratio was P is to Q. By adding water, the ratio has gotten reversed and the ratio is now P is to Q. This would imply that initially there was more mango juice than water. That is P is greater than Q. Then you are adding some more uh, water and the ratio has become Q is to P. Now after some time again he adds some mango juice and the ratio is reverted back to the original state which is again P is to Q. Now what we are required to find out is which of the following uh, ratios that are given can be the ratio of the initial water that is present to the final water that is present in the solution. So what we will assume is uh, one thing, we will assume that the initial volume, the total volume is A. After mixing some water in which the ratio became Q is to P, let this be equal to B. And finally, the final volume of the total solution, let us assume that this is C. Now, in the initial uh, mixture that he has, what is the amount of uh, water he has? The amount of water he has is A, which is the total volume of the solution, into Q divided by P plus Q. This is the amount of water he has. The amount of mango juice he has will be A into P divided by P plus Q. Similarly, if you are looking at the final solution, he has a total volume of C of which P is to Q is the ratio of mango is to water. Therefore, the amount of water that he has finally will be C into Q 
divided by p plus q. Now we are required to find out the ratio of these two that is how much water did you have initially to the uh, water that he has finally which if you notice we can cancel q we can cancel p plus q so what we are required to find out is basically what is the ratio of the initial volume of the mixture that he has to the volume of the mixture that he has at the end that is what is the ratio of a to c now if you notice initially he had a mixture of mango and water and then he added some water in which the ratio became q is to p but the mango that is there initially in volume a and the mango that is there in volume b both of them are the same because he didn't add any mango juice or he didn't remove any mango juice he only added some water in which the ratio got reversed so what we know is that we'll equate the amount of mango juice he had initially that will equal a p divided by p plus q this is the initial mango he has this is equal to the mango he has in the middle stage this is equal to b into this is the total volume and because the ratio is q is to p for mango is to water this will become b into q by p plus q you can cancel p plus q in the denominator therefore b is equal to a into p divided by q this is again this will reinforce what we already know that p is greater than q because the initial volume of the solution is a and after adding some water it has become b so we know that b is definitely greater than a because after adding some water the volume of the mixture will increase so again this would imply that p by q has to be greater than 1 or p is greater than q so we have one ratio one relationship between b and a we'll do the same thing for b and c and then we'll try to calculate what is the ratio of a and c now between b and c he added some mango juice therefore the ratio became inverted from q is to p to p is to q but the amount of water that is present is the same he didn't add any water or he didn't remove any water so again we'll calculate how much water he had in the intermediate stage the total volume is b and the fraction of water in it is p divided by p plus q this is again equal to in the final stage the volume is c and the fraction of water is c into q by p plus q because again between these two stages there was no change in the water content we can again cancel p plus q therefore c will equal b into p by q now if you replace the value of b by a into p by q in terms of a c will equal c is equal to b into p plus q but b is equal to a into p plus q so this is equal to a into p plus q this is the value of b into p by q or a by c is equal to q by p whole square so any of the required ratios that we have has to be of the form of a particular square of natural numbers and q has to be less than p so if you look at it 4 is to 9 is possible because they are 2 by 3 whole square 9 by 4 is not possible because in this case q will be greater than p but we know for sure that p is greater than q so the ratio has to be inverted it can't be 3 by 8 because we want a perfect square it can't be 1 by 3 again because we want both the numbers to be perfect squares so the only possible value of the ratios is 4 is to 9 and this would happen if p by q is equal to 3 by 2 in that case the ratio will be 4 by 9In this question it is given that Ashok was multiplying three numbers and instead of uh, 37 he took 73 as one of the numbers. So suppose the three numbers were A, B, C and C is 37. Instead of 37 he took 73 because of which the product went up by 720. So the product went up by 720. We are required to find out the minimum possible value of the sum of the squares of the other two numbers. So basically what is given is that 73 into AB which is the new product is greater than 37 into AB which is the original product by 720. This is what has been given. Now if you simplify this 73 AB minus 37 AB will be 36 AB is equal to 720 or the product of A and B is equal to 20. We have been given this. Now we are required to find out the minimum possible value of the sum of the squares of the other two numbers. So we are required to find out the minimum value of 
a square plus b square. Now what we do know is that a square plus b square is greater than or equal to 2ab. This is simple application of arithmetic mean greater than geometric mean and the equality will occur when a is equal to b. If a is equal to b only then a square plus b square will equal 2ab which actually equals 2a square. So in this case we know that the minimum value of a square plus b square which is the sum of the squares is equal to 2 into ab the value of ab is 20 which is equal to 40. So if the other two numbers were equal and they were actually equal to square root of 20 each that is when the minimum value of a square plus b square occurs and it will equal 40. So the answer in this case is 40. In this question we are told that a shopkeeper marks his uh, books by 25% above the cost price and due to slump in the market his cost reduces by 5% and then to boost his sales he offers a discount of 8% because of which his sales go up by 25% and we are required to calculate the change in the shopkeeper's profit. So let us assume that initially the cost price is say rupees 100 per book. Let the selling price because he has marked it up by 25% then will become equal to rupees 125. So the profit per book for every book that he sold is equal to rupees 25. And let us assume that initially he sold 100 books. So his total profit initially without any change is equal to 25 into 100 which is equal to 2500. Now after this he changes certain parameters. First his cost reduces by 5%. So the cost per book instead of being rupees 100 becomes equal to rupees 95. He even changes his selling price by giving a discount of 8%. This 8% discount is given on 125. So what is the actual discount? It will be 8% into 125 which is equal to 8 by 100 into 125 which is equal to 10 rupees. So he's giving a discount of 10 rupees. So the selling price will become equal to 125 minus 10 which is equal to rupees 115. So now what is the profit per book? The profit per book now is equal to 115 minus 95 which is equal to rupees 20. And what is the number of books he is selling? His sales also go up by 25%. Initially he was selling 100 books. Now he will be selling 125 books. So what is his new profit? That is the new total profit. That is equal to 20 into 125 which is again equal to rupees 2500. So in both the scenarios there is no change in the total profit. In this question we are told that a shopkeeper decreases the price of an article by 20% on day 1 and on day 2 he increases the price of the article by 20%. He follows this cycle on days 3, 4, 5 and 6 and so on. We are required to find out the day on, uh, on which the price of the article goes below 60% of its initial price for the first time. So let us assume that the initial price of the article is i. So on day 1 the price of the article is decreased by 20% so it becomes 0.8 i. On day 2 the price of the article is increased by 20% so it becomes 0.8 i into 1.2. So this becomes 0.96 i. On day 3 it becomes 0.96i again it is decreased by 20% into 0.8 and on day 4 it is again increased by 20% so it becomes 0.96i into 0.8 into 1.2 this becomes 0.96i into 0.96 or this becomes 0.96 whole square into i. So as you can see every second day the price of the article is decreasing by 0.96. So after 2 n days the price of the article becomes 0.96 n into i. Now we know we want to find out when the price of the article becomes less than 0.6 i. So we have to figure out at what time on what day does the article's price that is 0.96 to the power n into i become less than 0.6. So you can use your scientific calculator that will be given in the examination to find out that when n is equal to 8 the price of the article becomes 
9 6 whole to the power 8 into i this will roughly be equal to 0 0.72 i this is after n is equal to 8 that is after 16 days now remember that on odd days the price decreases by 20 percent so on the 17th day the price of the article becomes 0 0.72 i into 0 0.8 which will be less than 0 0.6. This will be something like 72 into 8 will be something like 560 plus 16, 0.576i. Approximately. This is less than 0 0.6i. Note that again on the 18th day, as the price will be increased by 20%, the price again crosses above 0 0.6. So it will become 0 0.576i. This is the price of the article on the 17th day into 1.2 which will be greater than 0.6i so it will again come back above 60 percent of the initial price but on the 17th day for the first time the price of the article becomes less than 60 percent of its initial price so the correct answer is 17th day in this question we are told that there is a rice trader and he mixes three types of rice that is type a type b and type c and the price of the type A is greater than the price of type B is greater than the price of type C. Let us assume that uh, each of the prices is A, B and C per kg. We are told that if uh, X kgs contain type A, type B and type C in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 2 and sold at the price of type A then the profit is 66.67%. So if the ratio or if the mixture contains A, B and C in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 2, then what is the cost price of the mixture? The cost price will be A plus 2B plus 2C whole divided by 1 plus 2 plus 2 that is 5. This is the original cost price of the mixture. And the selling price is basically the selling price of A is the cost price of A. So if they are doing it this way where the cost price is A plus 2B plus 2C by 5 and the selling price is A, the profit percentage is 66.67%. What this will tell us is that A divided by A plus 2B plus 2C divided by 5 is equal to 100 plus 66.67 whole divided by 100. This is basically from the formula for the profit percentage. We can simplify this as 5A by A plus 2B plus 2C is equal to 166.67 by 100 that is 5 by 3. We can cancel 5 and we are going to get 3A is equal to A plus 2B plus 2C or if you simplify it A is equal to B plus C. This is the first equation that we have. Now we are also told that if they actually mix 2X by 5 amount of C to the original uh, mixture that is initially x uh, kgs contain x by 5 of a 2x by 5 of b and 2x by 5 of c now they are adding 2x by 5 of c additionally so the ratio the new ratio of uh, each of the three varieties of rice will be x by 5 2x by 5 and 4x by 5 so the required ratio will be 1 is to 4 2 is to 4 and if they sell it at the price of type b then the profit percentage is only 16.67 percent now we are required to find out the uh, cost price of type a the ratio of the cost price of type a to that of type b that is we are required to find out a by b so even for the second one we'll do the same thing if they are mixed in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 4 the cost price will be a plus 2b plus 4c divided by 7 and the selling price has been given to us as b in this case the profit percentage is only 16.67 percent therefore the ratio of the selling price to cost price is 100 plus 16.67 divided by 100 or that will equal 7 by 6 so if you simplify this you are going to get b divided by a plus 2b plus 4c divided by 7 is equal to 7 by 6 as the profit percentage is 16.67%, the selling price by cost price, the ratio will be 7 by 6. So if you are again simplifying it, you can cancel 7 on both sides. So 6B will equal A plus 2B plus 4C or 4B is equal to A plus 4C 
we are required to find out the ratio of a by b so we'll eliminate c c is equal to a minus b so we can easily simplify this as 4b is equal to a plus 4a minus 4b or we can again simplify whatever has been given over here as 8b is equal to 5a or a by b is equal to 8 by 5 so the required ratio of the cost of rise of type a to that of type b is 8 is to 5. In this question it is mentioned that Gopal borrows uh, rupees x from Ankit at x percent annual interest. So here is Ankit and he gives uh, x rupees at 8 percent interest to Gopal. Now Gopal lends uh, adds y of his own money and lends rupees x plus y to Ishan at 10 percent annual interest. So there is Ishan here and Gopal lends x plus y at 10 percent. At the end of the year after returning Ankit's dues, the net interest retained by Gopal is the same as that accrued to Ankit. So first in this uh, instance when Gopal lends x plus y to Ishan, the total interest that Gopal gets is x plus y into 10 by 100. And the net interest that Gopal has to pay to Ankit is x by 100 into 8. Therefore, after paying Ankit's dues, the net interest that Gopal receives is x plus y into this is 1 by 10, 1 by 10 minus 8x by 100. This is what Gopal has with him after returning Ankit's dues. Now, we are told that this is equal to the net interest that Ankit receives. So, this is actually equal to 8x by 100. Now you can simplify this, so it will be x plus y is equal to 16x by 10 or y is equal to 6x by 10 which is equal to 3x by 5. Now let us continue the question. On the other hand, if Gopal had lent x plus 2y to Ishan, so instead of x plus y, if he had lent uh, x plus 2y at 10 percent the net interest that would be retained by him would have increased by rupees 150. So in the second instance and the first instance, the only difference is the additional y that Gopal has lent to Ishan. So the interest accrued on the additional y is 150. So for one year, y into 10 by 100 accrues 150 or y is equal to 1500. Therefore x which is equal to 5y by 3 is equal to 2500. Now if all the interests are compounded annually, find the value of x plus y. We know that x is equal to 2500 and y is equal to 1500. So x plus y is equal to 4000. So the answer in this case is 4000. In this question it is given that point P lies between points A and B such that the length of BP is thrice that of AP. So there are two points A and B. Now point P lies between AB such that the length of AP is one third the length of BP. Now car 1 starts from A and moves towards B. So car 1 starts from A and moves towards B. Simultaneously car 2 starts from B and moves towards A. At the same time car 2 starts from B and moves towards A. Car 2 reaches point P 1 hour after car 1 reaches point uh, P. So suppose the time taken by car 1 to reach from A to P, suppose this time is T, then the time taken by car 2 to reach P from B is T plus 1. If the speed of car 2 is half the speed of car 1, so let us assume that the speed of car 1 is S, therefore the speed of car 2 is S by 2. Then the time in minutes taken by car 1 to reach P from A is. So we basically we are required to find out the value of T in minutes. Now we assume that the speed of car 1 is S. So the speed of car 2 is S by 2. Similarly the time taken by car 1 to reach uh, P from A is T. Therefore the time taken by car 2 to reach P from B is T plus 1 where this 1 is 1 hour. Now, 
we know that the distance that is BP is equal to 3 into AP. Now the distance BP is actually speed into time. What is the speed? That is the speed of car 2. Speed of car 2 is S by 2 into the time taken is T plus 1 is equal to 3 times AP. And what is AP? It is again speed into distance where the speed is that of car 1 which is S into the time taken which is T. Now if you simplify this we can cancel S on both sides. So T plus 1 is equal to you can take uh, 2 to the other side of the equation 2 into 3 into t which is equal to 60. Therefore 1 is equal to 5t or t is equal to 1 by 5. But remember that this is 1 by 5 hours which is equal to 60 minutes by 5 which is equal to 12 minutes. So the required answer where you have to find the value of t in minutes is 12. In this question we are told that there are two friends Arun and Bhavin and they start from two cities P and Q and they start walking towards each other. So let us assume that these are the two cities this is P and this is Q. Arun is going from P to Q and Bhavin is going from Q to P. Now they meet for the first time when both of them are at a distance of 60 kilometers from P. So let us assume that they meet somewhere over here. So during this time P has uh, A has traveled 60 kilometers and if you are assuming that the total distance between A and B is S kilometers then the distance traveled by Bavin will be S minus 60. Now after they meet Arun continues to travel towards Q and Bavin continues to travel towards P and they meet for the second time and they reach uh, both the respective cities and then they start back and the second time they meet at a distance of 80 kilometers from P. So Arun goes, Arun reaches Q and then he turns back. Similarly, Bavin goes to P and then he turns back and then they again start walking towards each other and this time they meet at a point which is 80 kilometers from Q. So this is 80 kilometers. So the distance from P will be S minus 80. The ratio of the speeds of Arun and Bavin is M is to N where M and N are relatively prime. What is the value of M plus N? So to do that let us first calculate the value of s. Once we calculate the value of s we can easily calculate their respective ratio of speeds. The ratio of speeds of p and q will be equal to the distance traveled by them at the start before they meet for the first time. For example in the same time that Arun has walked 60 kilometers, Bavin has walked s minus 60 kilometers. So this is the ratio of their speed. This is equal to m by n. Now what is the distance walked by Arun before they meet for the second time? Before they meet for the second time, Arun has completed one round of eight, uh, P to Q. Then he walked back 80 kilometers. So the total distance walked by Arun is S plus 80 before they meet for the second time. And in this time, what is the distance walked by Bavin? He also completed one distance from P to Q. So this is S. And then he walked back. And the distance that he walked back is S minus 80. So the total distance walked by Bavin will be S plus S minus 80. Now this is a ratio that we have in S. It is one variable and one equation. So we can find the value of S. Once we find the value of S, we can easily calculate the value of M by N. So we'll just cross multiply this given equation. So this will imply that 60 into S plus S minus 80 is 2S minus 80 is equal to S plus 80 into S minus 60. This is a quadratic equation so this will imply that 120s minus 16 to 80 is 4800 is equal to s square plus 80s minus 60s minus 4800. So you can cancel 4800 on both sides and if you simplify you are going to get that 100s is equal to s square. You can cancel s again on both sides so the value of s which is the distance between p and q is 100 kilometers. Therefore, the ratio of the speeds of Arun and Bhavin is 60 by S minus 60, which is equal to 60 by 40, which is equal to 3 by 2. So, M is equal to 3 and N is equal to 2. So, the value of M plus N is 5. In this question, we are told that there is an owner of an art shop and he has a painting and he sells the painting. But before he sells the painting, he initially hikes up the price by X percent. And then he gives a discount of the same of x percent and then he sells. 
but during the first cycle he realized that the price has uh, decreased by 441 but once he repeated this cycle again that is increased the price by x percent and decreased it by x percent he realized that the new selling price is 1944.81 and we are required to find out what is the original price of the painting so let us assume that the original price of the painting is p after he increased the price by x percent it becomes p into 1 plus x now he gives a discount of again x percent so it becomes p into 1 plus x into 1 minus x now the difference between the original price that is p and the new price this is given as 444 441 so if you simplify this you are going to get p into p minus p into 1 minus x square is equal to 441 or p into x square is equal to 441 this is one equation we have a similar equation that is if he repeated the cycle again then he sold the uh, disc, uh, painting for 1900 1944.81 but what will the price be after the second cycle it will become p into 1 plus x into 1 minus x this is the price after the first cycle and again 1 plus x into 1 minus x this is the price after the second cycle and this we are told is equal to 1944.81 so again you are going to get another equation p and x and we are supposed to find out what is the original price of the painting that is we are required to find out what is the value of p so if you look at the second equation this is p into 1 minus x square into 1 minus x square this we are told is equal to 1944.81 now we need to calculate the value of p so we will eliminate x square from the second equation from the first equation x square is equal to 441 by p so from the second equation this becomes 1944.81 is equal to p into 1 minus 441 by p into 1 minus 441 by p so this becomes the right hand side becomes 441 minus p whole square is equal to 1944.81 into p you can simplify this as p square minus 882 p plus 441 square is equal to 1944.81 p you can bring uh, p to the other side so this becomes p square minus 1944.81 plus 881 this becomes 0.81 this is 6 this is 2 this is 8 and this is 2 minus 2826.81 p plus 441 whole square is equal to 0 now this is a quadratic equation there are multiple ways in which you can solve it you have been given four equations so you can input each of the values into the equation and see which of them is uh, working or you can just use the formula for uh, solving quadratic equations for example the value of p will equal 2826.81 plus square root of 2826.81 whole square minus 4 into 441 whole square divided by 2 this is basically the equation of the quadratic uh, equations which is if the equation is if the quadratic equation is ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0 the value of x is equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac by 2a now you can simplify this using the online calculator that will be given in the examination and you will get the answer as 2756.25 so the correct answer is 2756.25 this question if you just look at the options also you will be able to easily solve it you know that after the second cycle the price has uh, become 1944.81 so if you assume that p is the original price after the first price it reduced by 441 so it will be p minus 441 after the second price second uh, price it would also again decrease let us assume that it has decreased by something like x now p minus 441 minus say some x1 just to avoid confusion is given as 1944.81 so the value of p which is the original price will be 1944.81 plus 441 so that will be roughly around 2380 approximately plus x1 now if you look x1 is the decrease that he gets during the second cycle if you look at the options given this is definitely not b because it is something around 2200 it is definitely not option d because it is just 2000 
it is probably not even C because the difference between 2380 and 2500 is just 120. Now something which has gone down by 441 in the first cycle would not go down by just 120 in the second cycle. So you can just check for that also. For example, you can input uh, 2500 in the option in the given quadratic equation and find out that it won't work. Or by just looking at the options, you know that there is an excellent chance that it will be 2756. Because the difference between 2756 and 2380, which is the value of x1, will be approximately again 380. So this intuitively seems correct that uh, the first time the price has gone down by 440 and the second time it has gone down by 380. So probably this is correct. So you can even approach it this way where you have uh, very good speed, but the accuracy is not excellent, but it is still fairly good. So even by looking at the options, you can get A or you can solve it completely like we have solved now and get the answer as A, which is 2756. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, it is given that we have to find out the number of numbers which have two or more digits which can be formed using the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 such that in each such number the digits are not repeated and all the digits appear in ascending order. So let us first find out how many numbers can be formed using two digits. Then we will find out how many numbers can be formed using exactly three digits and so on till nine digits because we have to find out all the numbers which have two or more digits. So suppose we are looking to find out numbers which have exactly two digits. Now we can select those two digits in 9C two ways. Now once we have selected the digits, because the digits have to appear in ascending order, we can't arrange them in any other manner. We have to arrange them in only one manner which is the ascending manner. So for example, if we have selected the two numbers as 3 and 4, the selection is in our hands but once we have selected them the arrangement is not in our hands they have to be arranged only in ascending order which is 3 4 similarly the number of ways in which we can select three digits out of these nine digits will be 9 c3 now once you have selected the three digits for example let the three digits be 8 5 and 2 once we have selected 8 5 and 2 we can arrange them in only one manner and that one manner is the ascending manner in this case, it will be 2, 5 and 8. So over here, for each number that is 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, dot, dot, dot till 9, the only thing that is in our hands is selection. Once we have selected, arrangement is not in our hands. Therefore, the number of two digit numbers that can be formed is 9C2. The number of three digit numbers that can be formed is 9C3. The number of four digit numbers that can be formed is 9C4 and so on. Similarly, the number of nine digit numbers such that all the numbers are in ascending order that can be formed is 9C9. Therefore, the total number of numbers that can be formed using uh, these 9 digits which have uh, digits in ascending order and the total number of digits is 2 or more that is all the conditions are matching will be 9C2 plus 9C3 plus 9C4 plus dot 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 till 9C9. Now we have to calculate this and there is an easy way in which we can calculate it. For any number n, nc0 plus nc1 plus nc2 plus dot 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 plus ncn is equal to 2 to the power n. We can uh, use a simple number like say to verify this. Suppose n is equal to 3. Therefore 3c0 plus 3c1 plus 3c2 plus 3c3 will equal 2 to the power 3 which is equal to 8. You can easily verify it because 3 C 0 is 1, 3 C 1 is 3, 3 C 2 is 3 and 3 C 3 is 1. So this number 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 is equal to 2 cube which is equal to 8. This is true for all values of n. So in this case we know that 9 C 0 plus 9 C 1 plus 9 C 2 plus dot 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 plus 9c9 is equal to 2 to the power 9. Now 2 to the power 9 is equal to 512. So the sum of 9c2 plus 9c3 that is the last part of the given sum can be easily calculated because 9c0 is equal to 1 and 9c1 is equal to 9. So this required sum that is 9c2 plus 9c3 plus dot 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 till 9c9 
is equal to 512 minus 1 minus 9 which is equal to 502. You can individually calculate the value of 9c2, 9c3 dot 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 till 9c9 and the sum will equal 502 but this is an easier way in which you can calculate it. So the required answer in this case is 502. In this question we are told that the probability that company A releases a mobile is 0 0.7 and once it releases a mobile the probability that it is a success is 0 0.8. So the probability that uh, company A's mobile is success is equal to 0 0.7 which is the probability that a mobile is actually released into 0 0.8. That is once it is released the probability that it is a success is 0 0.8. This is equal to 0 0.56. This number for company B is given to us. The probability that company B's mobile is a success is equal to 0 0.28. This is given to us. So the overall probability that the company, the mobile is a success will be 0 0.56 plus 0 0.28 which is 0 0.84. Now what we are told is that the mobile that was released is actually a success. What is the probability that it was released by company A? So we know that it is a success. Now if it is by company A, the probability is 0 0.56. If it is by company B, it is 0 0.28. So the probability that it is actually released by company A, given that it is a success, will be equal to 0 0.56 divided by 0 0.84, which is equal to 2 by 3. So the correct answer is option C. In this question it is given that John borrowed 2.1 lakhs from a bank at an interest rate of 10% per annum compounded annually and he repays this loan in two equal installments, the first one after one year and the second one after another year. Now we are told that the first installment uh, takes care of the interest as well as some of the principal amount. Similarly the second one takes care of the rest of the principal and the interest due thereupon. We are required to find out the value of each installment. So, there is 2.1 lakhs that John took. This is at the end of one year he pays x and at the end of the second year he pays another x. Now we are required to find out the value of x. Now when he takes 2.1 at the end of one year at an interest rate of 10% the value becomes 2.1 into 1.1 which is equal to 2.31. Now of this John pays off x. So for the remaining year, the principal will be 2.31 minus x and this at the end of one more year becomes 2.31 minus x into 1.1. At this point, John pays off x and this will be cleared. So this is actually equal to x. Now if we simplify this, we are going to calculate, we are going to get the value of x which is 2.31 into 1.1 minus x into 1.1 .1 is equal to x or 2.31 into 1.1 .1 is equal to 2.1x. Now we can simplify this 2.31 divided by 2.1 is actually equal to 1.1. .1. We have just found out earlier. So the value of x is 1.1 .1 into 1.1 .1, which is equal to 1.21 lakhs. So the answer that we are looking for is 1.21 lakhs. In this question we are told that there was a survey which was conducted in a school to find out how many students like particular subjects. Now if you read the question you can easily figure out that a person, a student can like one subject or no subject or more than one subject. So there is some sort of an overlap between the number of subjects that a student can like. So this kind of questions whenever there is an overlap between two parameters will be a Venn diagrams question. So if you look at it 89% of the students like mathematics. So 89% of the students like maths. 92% of the students like physics, 85% of the students like chemistry, 74% of the students like biology and 78% of the students like languages. We are also told that 2% of the students like none of the above mentioned subjects. The total number of students in the school is 400 and we are required to find out what is the minimum number of students 
who like none of the five subjects so what we'll do is this we'll assume that the number of students who liked exactly one subject is a these are the students who liked exactly one subject let us assume that the number of students who liked exactly two subjects is b and the number of students who liked exactly three subjects is c number of students who liked exactly four subjects is d and number of students who liked exactly five subjects is e now we are required to find out the minimum value of e now we have some equations that we can form using the information that is already given we know that the total number of students who liked exactly one subject plus the number of students who liked two subjects plus the number of students who liked three subjects plus the number of students who liked four subjects plus the number of students who liked five subjects can be found out that is a plus b plus c plus d plus e is equal to 98 notice that over here even though we are mentioning this as number of students we are actually calculating the percentage first so for example ignore the fact that there are 400 students for now we'll try to find out the minimum possible percentage for e once we find out the minimum possible percentage we can multiply it with 400 to get the minimum possible number so let us first focus on finding the minimum possible percentage of students because most of the information that is given to us is in percentages so it will be easier to calculate so each of this is basically a percentage a percent is the percentage of students who liked exactly one subject b percent is the percentage of students who liked exactly two subjects and so on so if you're summing up a plus b plus c plus d plus c this is out of 100 percent of students we know that two percent of students did not like any subject so the sum of a plus b plus c plus d plus c is equal to 98 we also know that if a percent of the students like exactly one subject then that is a plus if b percent of the students like two subjects that is they like say maths and physics if you are calculating the student subject liking uh, quotient so this is if you are multiplying two with b to find out that okay two students like two different subjects so the total number of subjects like this two plus three students like three subjects three into c plus four into d plus five into e so e percent of the students like all five subjects so these e percent of students are giving 5e number of subjects liked if you calculate it that way this will be the sum of all the given numbers this will be the sum of 89 plus 92 plus 85 plus 74 plus 78 because each of this 89 will go to one of either a or b or c or d or e so a plus 2b plus 3c plus 4d into 5e which is the number of subjects that are liked by each of the students will equal 89 plus 92 that is 181 181 plus 85 is 266 266 plus 44 is 340 340 plus 78 is 418 these are the two equations that we have to calculate the percentage of e to find out the minimum possible value of e and once we calculate that we can calculate the minimum possible number of students now how are we going to minimize e if we suppose that uh, e is equal to 0 that is the minimum possible value of e then we'll have two equations we'll have that a plus b plus c plus d is equal to 98 and a plus 2b plus 3c plus 4d is equal to 418 now we know that each of a b c d and d each one of them is less than or equal to 98 because the sum of all of them is equal to 98 and each one of them is a non-negative integer then a plus b plus c plus d plus e is has to each of them individually has to be less than or equal to 98 therefore the maximum value if you are ignoring 5e in the second equation will have to go to d because it has the highest coefficient its coefficient is 4 so if you are actually giving all of 98 to d the value of 4d will equal 4 into 98 this is 392 so 392 is the maximum possible value of a plus b 2b plus 3c plus 4d if a plus b plus c plus d is equal to 98 so whenever you want to minimize e you want to maximize the coefficient amongst the rest which is the highest so in this case it has to be d so what we'll do is we'll assume a b and c to be equal to 0 we'll try to maximize d in this case the value of e will be minimized because we are giving most of the other uh, number to d then it becomes quite easy then we have only two equations to solve that is d plus c is equal to 98 and 4d plus 5e is equal to 418 here 4d plus 4e 
if you are multiplying the first equation by 4 is equal to 392 or the value of e which is minimum will equal 18 plus 8 that is 26 and the value of d which will be maximum is 72. Notice that whenever you are decreasing d a little more than 72 the value of e will also increase and a and b and c will also become non-zero. So in order to ma minimize the value of e you want to maximize the value of d because d has the highest coefficient in the second equation. In this case the minimum possible percentage of students who like all the five subjects is 26 percent. Again remember that we have calculated each one of them as a percentage. The sum of all these percents is 100 but because there are 2 percent of students who don't like uh, all the subjects we have calculated this as 98 percent. Similarly the sum of the percentage of students who like different subjects we have added all the percentages. We didn't calculate the actual numbers. So the minimum possible percentage of students who like all the five subjects is 26. The total number of students in the school is 400. So the minimum possible number of students who like all the five subjects is 26 percent of 400. This is 26 into 4, this is equal to 104. In this question we have two functions, f of x and g of x. f of x is given as 20x by x squared plus 1 and g of x is given as 2 by 4x minus 2x squared minus 1. Both the functions are defined for all real x, that is x can be any real number. Now based on the value that x takes, both f of x and g of x will have two specified respective ranges. Now we are required to find out how many positive natural numbers are common between these two ranges of f of x and g of x. That is amongst all the values that f of x can take and amongst all the values of g of x can take, how many natural numbers are common between these two ranges. So now let us look at both of them separately. Let us first look at f of x. Let us try to find out how many natural numbers can be part of the range of f of x. We will do the same for g of x and then we will take the common set out. So let us assume that f of x is equal to a. That is f of x is equal to 20x by x square plus 1. Let us call this a. Now we will convert this into a quadratic equation in uh, x and then because x has to be real we will find out its discriminant and based on that we are going to get a range for a. So for example this will be transformed into x square plus 1 into a minus 20x is equal to 0 or x square minus 20 by a x plus 1 is equal to 0. This is a quadratic equation in x. Therefore, the discriminant has to be greater than 0. That is, b for any quadratic equation a x square plus b x plus c is equal to 0. For this equation to have real roots, b square minus 4 ac has to be greater than or equal to 0. This is the rule of quadratic equations. So over here b is the coefficient of x which is minus 20 by a therefore b square will be 400 by a square this has to be greater than or equal to 4ac that is 4 into the value of a is the coefficient of x square which is 1 into c is the constant term which is also 1 or 100 by a square has to be greater than or equal to 1 because a square will be positive we can multiply both sides with a square. So 100 has to be greater than or equal to a square or a must lie between minus 10 and plus 10. So the number of positive integral values that a can take uh, in f of x is 1 to 10. This is the set of positive integral real num integral numbers which are part of the range of f of x. Now we will calculate the same thing for even g of x and then take the common intersection out. In g of x again let us assume that g of x which is equal to 2 by 4x minus 2x square minus 1 this is equal to say b. We will again convert this into a quadratic equation. So 2 by b is equal to 4x minus 2x square minus 1 or 2x square minus 4x plus 1 plus 2 by b is equal to 0. This is the quadratic equation. Again the roots of the quadratic equation have to be real because these functions are defined only for real numbers. Therefore the discriminant that is b square minus 4ac has to be greater than or equal to 0. b square is 4 into 4 that is 16 is greater than or equal to 4 into a is 2 into c is 1 plus 2 by b. This would imply that 2 is greater than or equal to 1 plus 2 by b or 2 by b 
is less than or equal to 1. Now we are only looking at the positive values of B. So we can uh, easily multiply both sides with B because we are only looking at the positive integral values. If you are not looking for positive integral values, we will have to subtract 1 from it which also we can do. For example, in this case it will be 2 by B minus 1 is less than or equal to 0 or 2 minus B by B is less than or equal to 0 or B into B minus 2 is greater than or equal to 0. What this would imply is B has to be either less than or equal to 0 or B has to be greater than or equal to 2. Now therefore the we are not concerned with the less than or equal to 0 part. We are only concerned with the greater than or equal to 2 part. In fact over here because B was in the denominator we will again have to see if B can actually equal 0 or not. But all those things can be ignored for now because we are only looking at the range of B which is in the positive integral domain. So we are only looking for the second part that is that B has to be greater than or equal to 2. So B can take any value which is greater than or equal to 2. So B will be 2 to infinity. Now we are looking for the set of numbers which are common between these two uh, sets and the common numbers will be 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 and 10. These are 9 positive integral numbers which are common between f of x and g of x. In this question it is given that Ramesh and Gautam are 22 students are among 22 students who wrote an examination. So there is Ramesh, there is Gautam and there are 20 other students. Ramesh scored 82.5. The average score of the 21 students other than Gautam is 62. So if you ignore Gautam, the 21 students have scored 62, the average score. So using this we can find out the total sum of the students of these 20 students. Well, we can figure it out how. The average score of all the 22 students, that is all of them, is one more than the average of the 21 students other than Ramesh. That is other uh, than Ramesh. So let us assume that the average of the 21 students other than Ramesh is A. So the average of all the 22 students is A plus 1. Using this, uh, we need, can calculate the value of A and then we will proceed further. Over here, we have to require the score of Gautam. So using the second information that is the average of all the 22 students is A plus 1 and the average of the 21 students other than uh, Ramesh is A, we can calculate the value, the score of Ramesh. We will see how. We know that uh, the total uh, 22 students, the average of uh, these 22 students is A plus 1. So the total uh, score by all the 22 students is 22 into A plus 1. Uh, similarly, the average of the 21 students other than Ramesh is A. So their total is 21 into A. Now this difference between these two is the score of Ramesh. So this is equal to 82.5. Using this equation, we can calculate the value of A. This is 22A plus 22 minus 21A is equal to 82.5 or A is equal to 60.5. This is the first step. Now once we know the value of uh, the average of all the 21 students and the 22 students, we need to calculate the score of Gautam. For that, let us, uh, we are also told that the average score of all the students other than Gautam is 22. So the total of all the students other than Gautam is 21 into 62. Whereas the total of all the 22 students is 22 students into their entire average is 60.5 sorry their average is a plus 1 so it will be 61.5 so using this we can calculate the score of Gautam 21 into 62 is 1302 22 into 61.5 if you use your calculator will be 11 into 123 so this will be 1230 plus 123 which will be 3531 so this will be 1353 so 1353 minus 1302 is the score of Gautam, this will be 51. So first we have uh, used the information that is given about the average of the 22 students and the average of the 21 students other than Ramesh to calculate the actual average of all the students. The average of the 21 students that is A we calculated is to be equal to 60.5 and the average of all the 22 students we have calculated this as 61.5. Once we have got that, we have used the information that uh, if you remove Gautam, the average is 62 and if you include Gautam, the average is 61.5.
So the total of all the 22 students is 22 into 61.5 which is 1353 and the total of the 21 students without Gautam is 21 into 62 which is equal to 1302. The difference between these two 1353 and 1302 is the score of Gautam which is equal to 51. So the answer in this case is 51. In this question, we are given a quadratic equation x square plus a plus 3 into x minus a plus 5 is equal to 0 and we are required to find out the minimum possible value of the sum of the squares of this quadratic equation. Now notice that we don't know the value of a. a is a variable but it will vary such that we want to minimize the sum of the squares. So let us assume that the roots of the equation are alpha and beta. By the properties of quadratic equations, we know that alpha plus beta is equal to a plus 3 minus of a plus 3. Remember that if there is a quadratic equation ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0, the sum of the roots is equal to minus b by a and the product of the roots is equal to c by a. When the given equation is x square plus a plus 3 x minus of a plus 5 is equal to 0, a is the coefficient of x square. So in this formula, a will equal 1, b will equal minus of a plus 3, sorry b will equal a plus 3, b is the coefficient of x and c is the constant term, this will equal minus of a plus 5. So the sum of the roots which is alpha plus beta is minus b by a. In this case that will equal minus of a plus 3 and the product of the roots equals alpha into beta which is c by a. Now c is minus a by 5 and a is 1. So the product of the roots is minus of a plus 5. What we are required to find out is minimizing the sum of the squares. That is we need to minimize alpha square plus beta square. But alpha square plus beta square is equal to alpha plus beta whole square minus 2 alpha beta. Now alpha plus beta whole square will be a plus 3 whole square and minus of 2 alpha beta will be minus of 2 into minus of a plus 5. So this will be minus of 2 into minus a plus 5. So here we can cancel both the negatives. Negative into negative is positive. So this will equal a square plus 6a plus 9 plus 2a plus 10 or this will equal a square plus 8a plus 19. This is the expression that we have to minimize. Now we can easily complete the squares. You know that the coefficient of the coefficient of a is 8. So we can uh, complete the square by making this 8 by 4 whole square. a plus 8 by 2 whole square. So this will be a square plus 8a plus 16 plus 3. 8 square plus 8a plus 16 is a plus 4 whole square plus 3. Now we know that a plus 4 whole square cannot be negative. So the minimum value of the sum of the squares is 3 which is which happens when a is equal to minus 4. So the minimum possible value of the sum of the squares is 3. In this question it is given that there are two points a and b and they are 150 kilometers apart. Now cars 1 and 2 travel from a to b but car 2 starts when car 1 is already 20 kilometers away from a. So first car 1 starts, it travels 20 kilometers and then car 2 starts and goes towards B. Each car travels at 100 kilometers per hour for the first 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers per, per hour for the next 50 kilometers and 25 kilometers per hour for the last 50 kilometers. So we can divide the distance between A to B into 3 parts. Into 3 parts, each of them will be 50 kilometers long. Now both the cars travel at the same speed for each of these three journeys but the individual speeds uh, with respect to each of these segments is different. For the first 50 kilometers they travel at 100 kilometers per hour. Uh, for the second one it is 50 kilometers per hour and for the third one it is 25 kilometers per hour. Now we are required to find out the distance between car 2 and B when car 1 reaches B. So let us first find out the time difference between when car 1 has started and car 2 has started. 
So car one covered 20 kilometers at the speed of 100 kilometers per hour before car two has started. So the time gap between car one and car two is equal to 20 by 100 which is equal to 1 by 5 hours. This is equal to 12 minutes. So 12 minutes after car 1 has started, car 1 has covered 20 kilometers and then car 2 has started. Now the second thing that we should consider is as the speeds of the cars is the same at each of the respective segments, the total time taken by both the cars is the same. So total time taken by car 1 is the same as total time taken by car 2. The only thing is car 1 starts early and car 1 finishes early. Car 2 starts 12 minutes later and finishes 12 minutes later. Therefore, by the time car 1 reaches B, car 2 is 12 minutes behind. Now we are required to find out what does 12 minutes represent in terms of distance. That is how much distance is car 2 behind. Now you can figure out that the last segment it covers at 25 kilometers per hour it covers its distance of 50 kilometers. So again just to remove any confusion the first 50 kilometers are covered at 100 kilometers per hour and this takes 1 by 2 hours that is 30 minutes. The second 50 kilometers are covered at 50 kilometers per hour so this takes 1 hour and the last 50 kilometers are covered at 25 kilometers per hour so they take 2 hours. So when we are required to find out where car 2 is 12 minutes before reaching B, you know that it is in the last 50 kilometers because it travels the last 2 hours in the third segment. So the speed at which it is traveling is 25 kilometers per hour and the time is 12 minutes. So the distance that car 2 is from B is equal to 12 by 60 into 25 which is equal to 5 kilometers. Notice that the total time taken by car 1 is the same as the total time taken by car 2 because car 2 has started 12 minutes later, car 2 will reach 12 minutes later and when car 2 is 12 minutes away from B, we know that it is in the last 50 kilometers. So it is traveling at 25 kilometers per hour. So it is 5 kilometers away from B. In this question, it is given that if the population of a town is P at the beginning of the year, at the beginning of the next year, it becomes 2P plus 3. Now, we are told that the beginning at the beginning of 2019, the population of the town is 1000. We are required to find out the population at the beginning of 2034. So, <clears throat> if at the beginning of the first year, the population is P, at the beginning of the second year, it becomes 2P plus 3. And at the beginning of the third year, this term is multiplied by 2 and 3 is added to it. So when this is multiplied by 2, we are going to get 4p plus 3 into 2 from here and an additional 3 is added. So this becomes 4p plus 3 into 1 plus 2. Now at the beginning of the fourth year, this term is again multiplied by 2 and then 3 is added. So this becomes first 4p when multiplied by 2 is 8p and 3 into 1 plus 2 into 2 becomes 3 into 2 plus 4 and then an additional 3 is added so this becomes 8p into 8p plus 3 into 1 plus 2 plus 4. Similarly at the beginning of the fifth year it becomes this entire term is multiplied by 2 so it becomes 16p plus 3 into 2 plus 4 plus 8 and an additional 3 is added plus 3. So this becomes 16p plus 3 into 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8. Now you can see a pattern emerging. So at the beginning of the nth year, the total number becomes 2 to the power n minus 1 into p plus 3 into 1 plus 2 plus dot dot dot. Here there will be n minus 1 terms. So this becomes plus 2 to the power n minus 2. 
Now, now if you are looking at the question that is given, 2019, that is at the beginning of the first year, there is 1000. And 2034, here notice that 2019 is the first year, 2020 will be the second year, and 2034 will be the 16th year. Notice that it will be the 16th year and not the 15th year because these kind of things matter in this calculation. So at the beginning of the 16th year, the total will be 2 to the power 15 into t plus 3 into 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus 2 to the power 14. We will substitute 1000 in place of p once the calculation becomes more straightforward. So this is 2 to the power 15 into p plus 3 into 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 to the plus 2 to the power 14 is actually equal to 2 to the power 15 minus 1. So this will be 2 to the power 15 into p plus 3 minus 3. Here if you substitute uh, 1000 in place of p, the answer that you are going to get is 1003 into 2 to the power 15 minus 3. This is the answer. This is a slightly calculation intensive problem and you have to ensure that you don't commit any silly mistakes when you are making the calculation. In this question a triangle ABC is given and there are points D, E and F which are given which divide uh, the sides in the ratio 3 is to 1. You can look at the image and so you get a triangle D, E and F. Inside the triangle D, F similarly another three points G, H, I are drawn such that they divide uh, the sides in the ratio 1 is to 2. So you have uh, one outer triangle ABC, a triangle inside it DEF and a further uh, triangle inside it GHI. Now we are required to find out the ratio of the area ABC to that of the inner triangle GHI. Now let us first consider the triangle <coughs> E, B and F. For ease of calculations, I assume that uh, the length of the side AB is 4x because it is divided in the ratio 3 is to 1. Similarly, the length of the side 3C is 4y and the length of the side uh, CA is 4z. Now, for triangle EBF, if you want to calculate the area, this equals half into EB, EB is x into BF, which is equal to 3y into sin B. We are just using the area of a triangle, which is half AB sin C. Now, this is equal to 3 by 2 into xy sin b. Now the area of the bigger triangle ABC is equal to half into AB which is 4x into BC which is 4y into sin b. This is equal to 16 by 2 xy sin b. What you can actually notice is the value of this, the area of this smaller triangle is 3 by 16th that of the bigger triangle by comparing these two values. Similarly, you can calculate the area of the other triangles that is triangle AED and triangle DFC. Both of them will also be equal to 3 by 16th into the bigger triangles area, let us assume that is A. So the total area of the three triangles outside is equal to 9 by 16a. Therefore, the area of the inner triangle DEF is equal to a minus 3 by 16 into 3a. This comes to 7 by 16a. Now we have calculated the area of DEF. We will use the same technique to calculate the area of the inner triangle that is GHI. In this case, the area of uh, the triangle G H E will equal 2 into 1 by 3 into 3 of the area of the bigger triangle D E F. This is into 7 by 16 A. Similarly, the other two triangles that is D G and I as well as the triangle I, H and F, we can find out the areas. They will also be equal to the same. 
So the total area of the three inner circles will be that area of GHE into 3. This will come to 14 by 14A by 48. Now this is the area, this is the sum of the areas of the three triangles outside. So we need to calculate the area of the inner triangle GHI which will equal 7 by 16 A, this is the area of DEF minus 14 by 48 A which is equal to 7 A by 48. Therefore, the required ratio is ratio of ABC to that of GHI is equal to 48 by 7. 48 is to 7. So, to recap, let us uh, clear everything off and let us uh, explain what exactly we have done in more detail. To recap, what we found was the if the area of the bigger triangle ABC is equal to A, we found that the area of triangle AED is equal to area of triangle EBF is equal to area of triangle DFC is equal to 3 by 16 A. Therefore, to find out the area of triangle DEF, we just subtract the sum of the three small areas from the bigger area. This will equal A minus 3 by 16 into 3 A, which will come to 7 by 16 A. Now we applied the same uh, rule, the sign rule to find out the areas of the three smaller triangles inside DEF and we found out that area of DIG is equal to area of IFH is equal to area of GEH is equal to 2 by 9 into area of DEF. Therefore, the area of GHI is we have to area of DEF minus 2 by 3 into area of DEF which will come to area of DEF by 3. When you are equating it with the area of uh, ABC this comes to 7 by 48A. Therefore, the required ratio is 48 is to 7. We are just using sign rule multiple times to get the answer. Google search crack for free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question it is given that there are a total of 200 students of which 105 like pizza and 134 like burger. Then we are required to find out the number of students who like only burger can possibly be. So what we will do is we will first draw this is a Venn diagram question clearly because it is implied that there are some people who like only pizza, there are some people who like only burger and there will be some people who like both pizza and burger and also there will be some people who like neither of the two. So any question which has uh, this sort of a setting which is that uh, there are more than one attributes that a particular student can like, you know that this is a Venn diagram question. So suppose this circle represents all the students who like pizza and this circle represents all the students who like burger. We are told that 134 students like burger and 105 students like pizza. Now what are we required to find out? We are required to find out some interval where the number of students who like only burger can be. So let us assume that that interval is x. So x over here denotes the students, the number of students who like only burger. Then the intersection of the number of students who like both burger and pizza will be 134 minus x because you want the total number of students who like burger to be 134. So the intersection between pizza and burger will be 134 minus x. Now this would imply that the number of students who like only pizza that is people who are inside this area will equal 105 which is the total number of students who like pizza minus 
134 minus x which is the intersection between pizza and burger so this will be if you simplify x minus 29 so this is going to be x minus 29 now so we know for sure that x is greater than or equal to 29 because you don't want x minus 29 to be negative there will not be minus 10 students who like only pizza that number has to be greater than or equal to 0 so you know that x is greater than or equal to 29 there is one more information that you will have to take care of which is that the total number of students is 200 so the number of students who like pizza and burger has to be less than or equal to 200 because there are why will it not be exactly equal to 200 because you know that the, there can be some students who like neither pizza nor burger and you know that that set of students is also greater than or equal to 0. So it would imply that the number of students who are within this union of pizza and burger has to be less than or equal to 200. If you calculate it that will be x minus 29 that is this number of students who like only pizza plus 134 minus x which is the number of students who like both pizza and burger plus x which is the number of students who like only burger this has to be less than or equal to 200 if you simplify x minus 29 plus 134 minus x this will equal 105 so 105 plus x is less than or equal to 200 or x is less than or equal to 95 so you know that 95 is greater than or equal to x is greater than or equal to 29 this is the interval within which the number of students who like only burger falls in now let us look at the options the first option is 23 but that is less than 29 so this is not the answer let us look at the second option 26 is also less than 29 so this is also not the correct answer the third option is 96 but you know that 96 is greater than 95 so this is also not the answer the final option is 93 which lies within the interval that we have uh, discussed before so the correct answer is option D which is 93 remember that 93 is a possibility we are not saying that the number of students who like only burger is definitely 93 but 93 falls within the prescribed range so it is the correct answer the numbers 1 2 to 9 are arranged in a 3 to 3 into 3 square grid in such a way that each number occurs once and the entries along each column uh, uh, each number occurs once and the entries along each column, each row and each of the two diagonals adds up to the same value. If the top left and the top right entries of the grid are 6 and 2 respectively, then the bottom middle entry is. So what we have been given is that there is a 3 into 3 grid of this sort. And uh, this is 6 and this is 2 and the sum along each of the rows each of the columns and each of the diagonals, two diagonals, so this number and this number, all of these uh, uh, five, six, seven, eight numbers are equal. Now, if all the three rows are equal, then uh, each of them should be one third of the total possible sum for, of uh, numbers from one to nine. So the sum of numbers from one to nine, as we know, is 45. So each of these row total should be 15. Similarly, each of these column total should also be 15. The diagonal totals should also be 15 then. So this is how we get uh, the, uh, 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 the, so uh, the, uh, this is how we get the, uh, this as such. So uh, now that we know, have this information, let's uh, uh, just, let's see what would be the, what would be the possible configuration of this grid. So we have been told that, uh, the value along each column, each row and each of the two diagonals add up, adds up to the same value. So this value is 15. So we have already placed 6 and 2. So that is 8. So uh, 15 minus 8 is 7. So this missing value should be 7. Now what we have remaining is 1, uh, 2 is done. So I will remove 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 6 is done, 7 is done and 2 is done. Now we have 1, 3, 4, 5, 8 and 9. Now let's consider the case of 9. If we put 9 in this row, uh, in this column as such, the first column, the uh, sum would be 15 already with 6 and 9. Then there would be uh, no value that can take the third cell as such. So 9 cannot be in this column. 
Similarly, if 9 is in this column, the sum would be 16, which would exit, uh, exceed this uh, 15 value as such. So 9 cannot be in this column either. So the 9 has to be in this column. Now we know that the sum along the diagonal is also 15. So if 9 is in this place, uh, in the uh, bottom row in the third column, then this sum alone would be 15 and no value can take this middle, uh, uh, middle cell as such. So the, uh, the 9 cannot be here, therefore the 9 has to be here. Now this column total is 15, this is 11, so this must be 4. So we have placed 4 and 9 also. Now let's consider 8. Now if we place 8 in this column, that sum alone would be 15. And then uh, we can't place anything in the third cell in the same column. So 8 can't be in this column, it has to be in this column as such. Now uh, 8 can be, uh, if 8 is over here, the column uh, row sum of this row would be uh, more than 17 as such. So 8 cannot be in this row, so 8 has to be in this row. Now, uh, now that we have, uh, we know that this sum along the diagonal is equal to the sums along the rows and columns. Since this is 6 and 4, this must be 5. If this is 5 and uh, as we see this is 13 plus 2, 15, so the condition is satisfied. Uh, we have placed most of the elements now. Now just considering the uh, row total here is 15, so this must be 3 and the row total here is uh, 15, so this must be 1. So we have placed all the elements from 1 to 9. Therefore we are asked what is the bottom middle entry. The bottom middle entry is 3. Therefore the answer to this question is 3. So as you could see, this did not require any knowledge as such. This was more of a logical reasoning question than a quant question as such. The only thing that you needed to calculate was that uh, if uh, you given that the row totals, column totals and diagonal totals are equal, the row totals can be one third of the sum of the uh, 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 1 to n as numbers as such. So you just needed to know how to sum up 1 to 9 quickly and uh, one third of that you would get the row totals and column totals and then just by using simple logical reasoning you could solve the remaining question as such. So as you could see this was not, uh, this did not require any prior knowledge of any formula as such. So this was a pretty easy question for you to solve had you not had any other uh, experience with any other formulas or you have not prepared even then you would have been able to solve this question. A shopkeeper sells tomatoes and he has 100 kgs of tomatoes with him. So the total number of tomatoes with him are 100 kgs. He sells them in packets of 1 kg and 3 kg. So let us assume that he sold A packets of 1 kg and suppose he sold B packets of 3 kg. Now he offers 2 packets of 1 kg free for customers who bought a 3 kg packet. So what is the total number of tomatoes that are sold? In the A packets of 1 kg, the total number of tomatoes sold is A. In the B packets of 3 kgs, the total number of tomatoes sold is 3B. But for every packet of B, that is every packet of 3 kgs, he is also giving 2 1 kgs free. So for every 3 kg packet sold, he is giving 2 kgs free because there are B packets of 3 kgs sold, he is giving 2B packets for free. So the total amount of tomatoes sold is A plus 5B. This is equal to the total tomatoes that he has which is equal to 100. Now he marks up the price of the tomatoes by 30% and he ends up realizing a profit of 17%. Let the cost price of tomatoes be equal to x per kg. Therefore the mark price is equal to 1.3x. So a packet of tomatoes which are sold with 1 kgs, the mark price will be equal to 1.3x. And the B packets uh, which are sold for 3 kgs, the mark price will be equal to 3.9x. So what is the total amount of money that he made? This will equal 1.3x into A plus 3.9x into B. This we are told is equal to 100 into x. This is the total cost price into 1 plus 17% which is the profit. So this is equal to 1.17. Or if you simplify it, you are going to get and you cancel x on all the terms, you are going to get that 1.3a plus 3.9b is equal to 117. Now you know that uh, you can divide all the terms by 1.3 because all of them are multiples of 13. So if you divide the entire terms with uh, 1.3, you are going to get that a plus 3b is equal to 90. This is the second equation. 90 is basically 117 divided by 1.3 and this is the first equation.
So if you divide the second equation from the first equation, you are going to get that 2b is equal to 100 minus 90 which is equal to 10 or b is equal to 5. Therefore, the value of a is equal to 75. So he sold 75 packets of 1 kg tomatoes and therefore the total tomato sold is 75. He sold 5 packets of 3 kg tomatoes. So he sold 15 kgs in the 3 kg packets and for each of these 5 packets he also gave 2 into 5 that is equal to 10 tomatoes for free. If you add all of them 15 plus 10 plus 75 you are going to get 100 kgs of tomatoes which is what he usually had. He had at the start. The question is what is the total quantity of tomatoes sold in the 3 kg packets that is equal to 15 kgs which is 3 into 5. In this question we are told that there is a triangle ABC. Let us assume this is ABC. This is A, this is B and this is C. The medians BD, so B will be over here, this is BD and uh, CE, this will be CE, this is BD, this is CE, they intersect at point O. The area of the triangle ABC is given to be 108 square centimeters. We are required to calculate the area of triangle EOD. So let us join E and D. Let us assume that the area of uh, EOD triangle EOD is equal to P. What can we say about the area of triangle EOB? This area will be 2P. Why is that the case? The reason for that is because O is the centroid of the triangle ABC and every centroid divides the median in the ratio of 2 is to 1. So this will be 2 and this will be 1. The length of OB to that of OD is 2 is to 1. Similarly, the length of OC to O will also be 2 is to 1. So this will be 2 and this will be 1. That is the ratio just for the sake of understanding this can be 2a and this will be a and this will be 2b and this will be b. Now this would uh, imply that the area of uh, triangle COD will be 2p. And what is the area of uh, triangle BOC? This will be 2 times 2p. This will be equal to 4p. If you are trying to understand why this is the case, imagine that you have a triangle like this. This is a separate triangle. Now suppose a line is drawn to some point on the base. Let this be x, y and z and let this be w. The ratio of triangle, the area of triangle x, y, w to that of the area of w, x, z. This area is equal to this ratio is y, w divided by z, w. Because the height of triangle w, x y and the height of triangle w x z both of them are the same. The height will essentially equal the length of the perpendicular drawn from x to y z. So if the height is the same the ratio of the areas is basically the ratio of the length of the basis. So in this case this will be equal to x w by x z. Whatever is this ratio that will be the ratio of the areas. If you are using this uh, concept multiple times you will be able to easily figure out the respective ratios of the areas of the triangles. If you are looking at EOD divided by BOE, this ratio is same as uh, this is O. So, this is same as OD divided by OB. And because centroid divides this in the ratio of 2 is to 1, this will be 1 is to 2. So, if this is P, this will be 2P. For the same exact reason, area of triangle DOC will be 2P. Now, if you are comparing the areas of triangle EBO, that is this triangle and triangle BOC, this is equal to EO, that is this length, divided by CO, that is this length. This also will be 1 by 2. We know that the area of uh, triangle EBO is 2P, so this will be equal to 4P. That is how we got it. Now, we know that uh, ED uh, is dividing the sides uh, AB and AC in the ratio uh, equally because this is basically the medians. So, now we know that if the area of triangle AED is say Y, 
the area of the bottom part is p plus 2p plus 4p plus 2p this is equal to 9p now we know that area of triangle aed divided by area of triangle abc is equal to 1 is to 4 we will come to that uh, right now just accept that it will be 1 is to 4 so this would imply that y divided by y plus 9p is equal to 1 is to 4 or if you simplify this you will figure out that y is equal to 3p so this is equal to 3p and this bottom area is 9p so the total area of triangle abc will be 12p which is equal to 108 or the value of p will be equal to 9 square centimeters now if you are trying to understand let me clear this off if you are trying to understand why the ratio of the area of the smaller triangle and the bigger triangle is 1 is to 4 if say this is a triangle so this is how the triangle is and you join the midpoints of two sides now we know a lot of information about this if this is a this is b and this is c and this is d and this is e if say d and d are midpoints of b and c these two are the same and these two are the same now a few things that you should know is that d will be always parallel to bc and the area of triangle ade will be exactly one fourth the area of triangle abc which is the larger triangle or trying to simplify this further the area of triangle ade will be one third the trapezium the bottom trapezium which is debc so if this is x this will be 3x and the area of triangle abc will be 4x in our earlier problem we figured out that the area of this bottom trapezium is 9p therefore the area of the top uh, triangle is 3p which is one third of it therefore the total area is 12p which is given to us as 108 so the value of p will be 9 square centimeters so the answer for this question is 9. in this question it is given that there is a circle of radius 11 centimeters of which cd is a diameter so suppose there is a circle cd is the diameter the length of the radius is 11 centimeters so cd which is the diameter is equal to 22 centimeters there is a chord ab of length 20.5 centimeters ab and cd intersect at point e inside the circle so let us assume that this is ab and ab the length of ab it is given is equal to 20.5 centimeters CE has a length of 7 cm so this is 7 then the difference of the lengths of BE this is E and AE in centimeters so we are required to find out BE minus AE this is the difference so before we get into it there is one theorem uh, important theorem in geometry it is quite straightforward which is called the intersecting chords theorem we will use that theorem in this uh, problem we can solve it without using it also but using it the solution becomes very straightforward so suppose there is a circle and suppose it has two chords now suppose the chords are a b and c d and suppose they intersect at s this can be any two chords in the circle then a s into b s is equal to c s into ds what we are saying is when we multiply the respective lengths of each of the small parts from the point of intersection the product will remain the same so as which is this point at this length into bs which is this length will equal cs which is this length into ds which is this length you can prove it uh, using similarity of two triangles because many of the angles are equal when you complete the triangles but there is no need of proof just remember this theorem it is an important theorem <coughs> we will apply the same theorem in this problem because as you can see AB is a chord and CD even though it is a diameter is also another special chord. So once we know that CE is equal to 7 centimeters we know that DE is equal to 15 centimeters. <coughs> we know the length of DE because we know the length of CD it is equal to 22 centimeters so DE is equal to 15. Let us assume that the length of A is equal to X so the length of BA will be equal to 20.5 minus X because we know the length of AB. Now using the theorem that we just described, the intersecting chords theorem, it would mean that 20.5 minus x into x is equal to 7 into 15. This is a quadratic equation in x, you can simplify it by 
uh, expanding the bracket. So it will be x square minus 20.5x plus 105 is equal to 0. 20.5 is 10 plus 10.5. You can factorize this easily as x minus 10 into x minus 10.5 is equal to 0. So it has two solutions. Solution 1 is that x is equal to 10 and solution 2 is equal to x is equal to 10.5. Therefore, the length of A is either 10 centimeters or 10.5 centimeters. In this case, the length of B is equal to 20.5 minus x, which is equal to 10.5. And in this case, the length of B is again equal to 20.5 minus x, so B is equal to 10. In both the cases, the difference between the two chords, the two line segments B and A, will be 10.5 minus 10, which is equal to 0.5 centimeters. So, the answer in this case is 0.5 centimeters. This is a good use of the theorem that we discovered, intersecting chords theorem. Just read it so that you will understand this better. In this question, we are told that a person earned an interest of S rupees and he invested a principal at a simple interest of 3 years. So, S is simple interest of a principal, let us assume is P. For three years, let us assume that the rate of interest R percent. Now, he earned an interest of C when he invested the same principal at a compound interest for two years. So, C for a compound interest, the principal is the same, the time period is two years, and the rate of interest is the same, it is uh, considered to be R percent. If the ratio of S is to C is 5 is to 11, which of the following can be the rate of interest? So, let us first calculate what is the simple interest for three years for a principal P and a rate of interest of R percent. Then the simple interest will be equal to P into 3 into R. So, R will be rate of interest, it will most likely be less than uh, 1, which we will come to know. Therefore, the compound interest for 2 years is equal to P into 1 plus R whole square minus P, which is the principal. So, this is equal to P into 2R plus R square. Now, the ratio of simple interest to compound interest is given as 15 is to 11. So, P into 3 into R divided by P into 2R plus R square is equal to 15 by 11. We can cancel P on both sides in the numerator and denominator. We can even cancel 1R. So, the left hand side becomes equal to 3 by 2 plus R because we will cancel 1R from 2R and 1R from R square. This is equal to 15 by 11. We can cross multiply. So, 33 will equal 15 into 2 plus r that is 30 plus 15 r or 15 r will equal 3 or r is equal to 3 by 15 which is equal to 1 by 5 which is equal to 20 percent. So, the required rate of interest is 20 percent. In this question we are required to find out the smallest integer n for which the cubic equation n cube minus 11 n square plus 32 n minus 28 is greater than 0. So, whenever you see this kind of a question, the first thing that you should try to do is try to factorize this cubic equation. So, to factorize we will have to find out at least one factor because uh, factorizing a quadratic equation is very easy, but factorizing a cubic equation is slightly more tricky. So, we will try to find out at least one uh, factor for this cubic equation. Once we find out one factor, we will convert this into a quadratic equation and then try to answer the question. Now, to find out at least one number, uh, substitute n is equal to 1 in this. Now, if you substitute n is equal to 1, what will this become? This will be 1 cube that is 1 minus 11 into 1 square that is 11 plus 32 into 1 is 32 minus 28. This is minus 10 plus 32 is 22. 22 minus 28 is minus 6. As this resultant number is not equal to 0, we can infer that n minus 1 is not a factor of the cubic equation. Now, let us substitute n is equal to 2. Now, if you substitute n is equal to 2, n cube will be 8 minus 11 into n square is 11 into 4 that is 44 plus 32 into n is 32 into 2 that is 64 minus 28. This will be 8 minus uh, 44 is minus 36. Minus 36 plus 64 is 28. 28 minus 28 is equal to 0. 
Now we have noticed that this becomes 0 whenever n is equal to 2. This would imply that n minus 2 is a factor of this given cubic equation. So once we know that n minus 2 is a factor, we will try to factorize this in such a way that we can find this as n minus 2 into a quadratic equation. Now how are we going to transform this uh, cubic equation? We will uh, first write down n cube minus 2 n square. Why are we writing it as minus 2 n square? Because we want to take n square common here and this will become n minus 2. So once you have minus 2 n square, you have to subtract another minus 9 n square because the total over here is 11. So this will be minus 9 n square and if you want to again take uh, n minus 2 common, the next number has to be plus 18 n because what we want to do over here is that we will take minus 9 n common. So this will be again n minus 2. You have taken 18 n over here but the total over here is 32. So the remaining number is plus 14 n minus 28. Over here you will take again n minus 2 common so it will be 14. So what we have done is we have factorized n, uh, the given cubic equation into uh, n minus 2 into a quadratic equation and the quadratic equation over here is n square minus 9n plus 14. Now this is the quadratic equation that you have. This can be easily factorized as n minus 2 into n minus 2 into n minus 7. 9 square minus 9n plus 14 is equal to n minus 2 into n minus 7. So we are required to find out the smallest integer n such that n minus 2 into n minus 2 into n minus 7 is greater than 0 or n minus 2 whole square into n minus 7 is greater than 0. Now clearly n minus 2 whole, whole square is always greater than 0 irrespective of what the value of n is. It is actually greater than or equal to 0. It will equal 0 when n is equal to 2. For every other integer n minus 2 is always greater than 0. So we can actually ignore this. The only thing that we should be concerned about is that n minus 7 has to be greater than 0. And the smallest integer n for which n minus 7 is greater than 0 is when n is equal to 8. So the answer in this case is 8. What we have done is we have first found out one factor for the given cubic equation. Once we realize that n minus 2 is a factor, we have tried to simplify this cubic equation into n minus 2 into a quadratic equation. Once we had this quadratic equation, we factorized the quadratic equation. So we found out that this is equal to n minus 2 whole square into n minus 7. Now n minus 2 whole square is always greater than 0, so we will ignore it for this question. We just have to find out the smallest integer n for which n minus 7 is greater than 0 and that will happen when n is equal to 8. So the answer is 8. In this question we are told that k is a natural number and the divisors of 10 to the power k are a1, a2, a3 dot 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 till ap. So we have uh, 10 to the power k which is equal to if you do the prime factorization of 10 to the power k it is 2 to the power k into 5 to the power k. Now how many factors does 10 to the power k have? You take the prime factorization of a number then you look at the powers of the prime factors add 1 and multiply them together to get the number of factors. So in this case the number of factors of 10 to the power k is k plus 1 into k plus 1. We are told that there are p factors so the value of p is equal to k plus 1 into k plus 1 which is k plus 1 whole square. We are also told that the logarithm of a1 to the base 10 plus logarithm of a2 to the base 10 dot 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 a logarithm of ap to the base 10 is equal to 605 or log of a1 to the base 10 plus log of a2 to the base 10 plus dot 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 plus log of ap to the base 10 is equal to 605. The left hand side you can combine all the terms to the base 10 and you are going to get that this is equal to log of a1 into a2 into dot 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 into ap whole to the base 10 is equal to 605 or the product of all the uh, factors that is a1 into a2 into dot 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 into ap is equal to 10 to the power 605. Now if you are given a number and if you are given all the factors what is the product of all the factors that might sound a little complicated. So what we are going to do is we are going to multiply the first the smallest factor with that of the largest factor. Let us assume that without loss of generality we can assume that a1 is the smallest factor, 
a2 is the second smallest factor and dot 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 till ap you are just basically picking up the smallest factor and you are multiplying it with the largest factor so in this case if you multiply a1 with ap you are going to get the number itself that is 10 to the power k if you take any number if you are for example taking uh, 96 the smallest factor of 96 is 1 and the largest factor of 96 is 96 if you multiply both of them you are going to get 96 similarly if you are picking the second smallest factor and multiply it with the second largest factor you are again going to get 10 to the power k again in the case of 96 it is going to be 2 into 48 you repeat the same thing you pick the third smallest factor and multiply it with the third largest factor you are again going to get 10 to the power k in the case of 96 again just for explanation it will be 3 into 32 you continue doing this for p times and the second factor will become a1 this will also equal 10 to the power k now if you are multiplying all of these given equations it will be equal to a1 into a2 into dot 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 into ap into ap into ap minus 1 into dot 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 into a1 this will be the left hand side you are basically picking up all the first terms and you are picking up all the second terms and the product is basically the same this is equal to this is repeated there are p factors so 10 to the power k is repeated p times so this is equal to 10 to the power k into p we already know what is uh, a1 into a2 into dot 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 ap that is given to us this is equal to 10 to the power 605 so 10 to the power 605 and the second term will also equal 10 to the power 605 is equal to 10 to the power k into p or 10 to the power 1210 is equal to 10 to the power k into p because the number is the same the exponent also has to be the same or 1210 is equal to k into p we also know that p is equal to k plus 1 whole square so 1210 is equal to k into k plus 1 into k plus 1 we know that k is a natural number so if you just look at the right hand side and if you keep substituting the numbers from 1 to 10 you will notice that when k is equal to 10 the value of the right hand side will become equal to 10 into 11 into 11 which is equal to 1 to 1 0 so the value of k has to equal 10 We are told that the arithmetic mean of 25 students in an examination is 50. So there are 25 students, the average mark scored by them is 50. So the total mark scored by these 25 students is 25 into 50 which is 1250. We are told that 5 of the students are the toppers and they have scored the same number of marks. So let us assume that each of them has scored T. So because there are 5 toppers, the total mark scored by these 5 toppers is 5T. So there are 20 students left who are not the toppers. And the scores, uh, the total score by these 20 students will be equal to 1250 minus 5t. We are told that the least marks was 30. And all of these remaining 20 students scored distinct integers. So we are trying to maximize the scores by the toppers. So as you are trying to maximize the scores by the toppers, you would want to minimize the scores by the remaining 20 people. So the remaining uh, people would have to score 30 plus 31 plus 32 plus dot 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 till 49 what is the minimum uh, value of this what is the sum of these uh, 20 students that is what is the value of 30 plus 31 plus dot 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 till 49 that will be equal to 20 divided by 2 into 30 plus 49 remember that in any arithmetic progression if you know the first term and if you know the last term and you know the number of terms the sum is equal to the number of terms into the first term plus the last term divided by 2 in this particular case there are 20 terms so it is 20 by 2 into the first term plus the last term this will be 790 the scores by the remaining 20 students is 790 that is the minimum possible value of the sum of the remaining 20 students this would imply that if you are trying to maximize the value of t 1250 minus 5t is equal to 790 or the value of 5t is equal to 460 or the value of t is equal to 92 so the maximum possible score by the toppers is 92 because the minimum score of the remaining uh, 20 students the minimum uh, sum of those 20 scores is 790 in that particular case the value of t is 92 which will be the maximum possible score of the toppers
In this question, you are told that there is a sphere which is placed on top of a cylinder as shown in the figure. You are given that the radius of the sphere is 14 centimeters. You are told that the radius of the cylinder is 7 centimeters. And you are asked to find out, you are also given the height of the cylinder that is 10 centimeters. And you are required to find out the total height of the figure. So what exactly is the problem? Uh, if there is no overlap, so say this is the sphere, some part of the sphere is going into the cylinder say till over here if there is no overlap over here finding out the total height is quite easy the total height will be the height of the cylinder which is 10 centimeters plus two times the radius that is the diameter of the sphere that will be plus 28 so if there was no overlap over here the total height of the uh, given figure will be 38 centimeters quite easy but because there is an overlap over here we are counting this height that is the height of the cylinder which is inserted into the height of the sphere which is inserted into the cylinder twice which we don't want to do so what we'll do is we'll just consider the sphere and the part of the sphere which is already inserted into the cylinder now say this is the center of the sphere you are told that the radius of the sphere is 14 centimeters now the chord that you see over here is basically the diameter of the cylinder now the radius of the cylinder is given as 7 centimeters so the height of the sphere which is above the cylinder and below the center of the sphere can be easily calculated because this is a right angle triangle the hypotenuse is 14 centimeters and the length of the chord is 7 centimeters though the third side will be square root of 14 square minus 7 square 14 square is 196 minus 7 square is 49 so this will be square root of 147 which is 7 root 3 so this is 7 root 3 so if you look at the height that we are supposed to calculate this is basically how uh, the given figure will look on a cross section the cylinder's height over here is 10 centimeters you have the center of the sphere the part of the sphere which is below its center but above the cylinder we have just calculated this as equal to 7 root 3 centimeters and then you have one radius of the sphere which is 14 centimeters above so the total height of the figure is 14 plus 10 that is 24 plus 7 root 3 this is the height of the figure we at Kraku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MB examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question there is an examination which contains 100 questions and if somebody answers the question correct he gets 3 marks. If he answers the question wrong he gets minus 2 and if he doesn't attempt the question he gets minus 1. We are supposed to find out what are the different scores that are possible for a student who is taking this examination. Clearly the maximum number of marks that he can score is if he is getting all the 100 questions correct then he will score 300 and the minimum marks is if he is getting all the 100 questions wrong he has attempted all of them and then he is scoring minus 200. So if you are assuming that he has gotten A questions correct, B questions wrong and C questions are unattempted his score will be 3A minus 2B minus C. Now if you are trying to find out what are all the possible uh, values that this can take, it looks slightly complicated because of the way the marking system has been designed. So we will slightly modify it. We are going to say that instead of getting 3 for a correct answer, minus 2 for a wrong answer and minus 1 for not attempting, we will add everything up by 2. So we are saying that if he gets a question correct, he gets 5. If he gets a question wrong, he gets 0. And if he doesn't attempt a question, he gets 1. So it will essentially be the same thing but whatever score we get in this system we have to just decrease it by 200 to get his actual score because for every question whatever is his response we are adding plus 2 to it. This will just make the calculations easy. So now we are supposed to find out what are all the values that can be taken by 5a plus c where a plus b plus c is equal to 100. Now what we have discussed earlier in this new marking system the maximum score will be 500 and the minimum score is 0. Now clearly the total possible values if you are just looking at it are 501. All the natural numbers which start from 0 and end at 500. 
seem to be the solution but some of them cannot be taken cannot uh, for example these two equations cannot have uh, cannot be uh, 5a plus c cannot take a certain uh, set of values if a plus b plus c is uh, equal to 100 and a and b and c are all integers how are we going to find them out let us first look at the top bracket let us try to see if he can hit 500 clearly if he gets a is equal to 100 when he gets all the questions correct then he can reach 500 can he reach 499 he cannot get 499 because in the case where a is equal to 99 the scores that he can get are only 495 and 496 this will happen the first case when b is equal to 1 and the second case will happen when c is equal to 1 when you are just trying to calculate the value of 5a plus c 5a will be 495 and if c is equal to 1 his score will be 496 if c is equal to 0 his score will be 495 so the three values that cannot be reached are 497 and 498 there are two values and 499 these three values cannot be reached let us go further if a is equal to 98 then 5a is equal to 490 so he can hit 490 when b is equal to 2 he can hit 491 when b is equal to 1 and c is equal to 1 and he can hit 492 when b is equal to 0 and c is equal to 2 but the values that he cannot hit are 493 and 494 these are values that he cannot hit he can again hit 495 when a is equal to 99 and b is equal to 1 let us see the case when a is equal to 97 then 5a will be 97 into 5 which is 485 so 485 can be his score now the value of c can be either 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 so his score can be either 485 or 486 or 487 or 488 when his score is 488 it would imply that a is equal to 97 and c is equal to 3 now a plus c itself is equal to 100 so c cannot be 4 so the number that cannot be achieved the score is 489 is a score that cannot be achieved now when you make a to be equal to 96 4a 5a will be equal to 480 and the value of c will vary from 0 1 2 3 and 4 so when c is equal to 4 in this particular case 5a plus c will equal 484 so all these values are possible and after 484 he can also get 485 when you increase the value of a from 96 to 97 so every number which is below 485 can be achieved as a score similarly if you are looking at the lower end if you are looking at whether a score of 0 is possible or 1 is possible or 2 is possible all these are very clearly possible by making everything else to be 0 and just putting c to be equal to this particular score and b will be equal to 100 minus uh, c you are essentially saying a is equal to 0 so the lower end has no problem the only scores that are uh, problematic are the ones at the top and we have identified six scores that cannot be achieved the six scores are 497 498 499 493 494 and 489 these are scores in the new system where we have given plus two for every question if you're looking at the original question or or the original scores that cannot be achieved you have to just subtract 200 from each of these scores so the scores that cannot be achieved in the original system will be 299 298 297 294 293 and 289 these are the scores that cannot be achieved every other score can be achieved so the total number between 0 and 500 is 501 of which six scores cannot be achieved so the number of different scores that can be achieved is 500 minus 6 which is 495In this question it is given that Rama's score was 1 twelfth the sum of the scores of Mohan and Anjali. So it is given that R is equal to 1 twelfth into M plus A. After a review the score of each one of them has increased by 6. So Rama's score has become R plus 6, Mohan's score has become M plus 6 and Anjali's score has become A plus 6. The revised score of Anjali, Mohan and Rama were in the ratio 11 is to 10 is to 3. So Anjali, Mohan and Rama were in the ratio 11 is to 10 is to 3. Then Anjali's score exceeded Rama's score by. So we are required to find out the value of A minus R is equal to how much. Uh, so let us assume that because the ratios are 11 is to 10 is to 3, 
the actual values are 11k, 10k and 3k. Using this we will calculate the value of k then find out how much each one of them has scored and then calculate the value of a minus r. So because uh, a plus 6 is equal to 11k, a is equal to 11k minus 6 and m is equal to 10k minus 6 and r is equal to 3k minus 6. Now we are told that r is equal to 1 12th of m plus a. So 3k minus 6 is equal to 1 by 12 into m plus a. The value of m plus a will be 21k minus 12. So now we can cross multiply uh, the both the sides with 12. So this becomes 36k minus 6 into 12 is 72 is equal to 21k minus 12. You can simplify this and find out that 15k is equal to 60 or k is equal to 4. Therefore, the value of a which is equal to 11k minus 6 will be 11k is 44 minus 6 is 38 and the value of r is equal to 3k minus 6 that is 3 into 4 12 minus 6 is 6. We are required to find out the value of a minus r this will equal 32. So the correct answer is 32. In this question we are given a product of 3 terms 2 to the power 4, 3 to the power 5 and 10 to the power 4. We are required to find out how many factors of this number are perfect squares. So whenever you want to find out uh, how many of the factors are perfect squares you have to first do the prime factorization. In this case 2 is a prime factor and 3 is a prime factor but 10 is not a prime number. 10 is actually equal to 2 into 5. So the first step should be to actually do the proper prime factorization of the given number. So suppose the given number n is equal to 2 to the power 4 into 3 to the power 5 into 10 to the power 4. We can simplify this as 2 to the power 4 into 3 to the power 5 into 2 to the power 4 into 5 to the power 4. That is because 10 to the power 4 is equal to 2 to the power 4 into 5 to the power 4. This can be simplified as 2 to the power 4 plus 4 that is equal to 2 to the power 8. into 3 to the power 5 into 5 to the power 4. Now for this number we are required to find out how many of the factors are perfect squares. Let us assume that a prime factor of this number is 2 to the power a into 3 to the power b into 5 to the power c. Now if this is a perfect square then a has to be all a, b and c have to be even numbers. So a has to be either 0 or 2 or 4 or 6 or 8. Similarly, b also has to be even. So, b can be either 0 or 2 or 4. Similarly, c also has to be even. So, it can be either 0 or 2 or 4. So, a can take 5 values, b can take 3 values and c can take 3 values. So, the total possibilities, the total number of uh, factors which are perfect squares will be 5 into 3 into 3. This is equal to 45. But, we are required to find out how many of them are greater than 1. One of the factors which is included in this 45 is 1. That will happen in the case where a is equal to 0, b is equal to 0 and c is equal to 0. So we have to remove that one particular case from 45. So the required answer will be 45 minus 1 which is equal to 44. Remember that to find out anything about factors first do the prime factorization. Once you have the prime factorization for a factor to be a perfect square all the exponents of the prime numbers should be even numbers then you can easily calculate the required number which in this case is 44. In this question it is given that a seller gives a discount of 15% on the retail price and she still makes a profit of 2%. So as the profit is 2% let us assume that the cost price is 100. So the selling price will be 1 or 2 as the profit is 2%. Now we are told that after giving 15% discount on the retail price, the selling price is 1 or 2. So if you assume the retail price that is the market price as equal to M, 1 or 2 is equal to 0 0.85 into M as the discount is 15%. Therefore M is equal to 102 by 0 0.85. Now this is equal to 1 or 2 into 100 by 85. Now we 17 is a common factor between 1 or 2 and 85. So this will be 6 by 5. This is equal to 120. 
So if the cost price is 100, selling price is 1 or 2, the retail price is equal to 120. Now which of the following ensures that she makes a profit of 20%? So as the cost price is 100, to make a profit of 20%, the selling price has to be 120. Therefore, as the retail price is also 120, there should be no discount given. So let us look at the options. The first option says that the discount has to be 5% on the retail price. This is wrong. Give a discount of 2% on the retail price. This is also wrong. Increase the retail price by 2%. This is also not needed. If you just sell at the retail price, that is 120, then the profit made on this transaction will be 20%. So the answer is option D. Just sell at the retail price of 120. A man has uh, three metals, iron, aluminium and copper. So the volume of iron is 405 centimeter cube, volume of aluminium is 783 and volume of copper with him is 351. Using these metals he is making small cylinders. The radius of each of the small cylinders is 3 centimeters. We don't know the height. So we have to ensure that the volume of each of the small cylinders have the same volume. So let us assume that the volume of the small cylinders is V. So as the total metal uh, is 405, for example in iron, the number of small cylinders that he'll make, which are of iron is 405 by V. Similarly, the number of aluminium that he'll make is 783 by V. And the number of copper that he'll make is 351 by V. These are the different uh, cylind uh, cylinders of different metals that he'll make. Now we have to ensure that uh, the total number of such cylinders is kept at a minimum. That is we want uh, the sum of these three numbers that is the number of cylinders of each metal to be at the minimum. And then we are required to find out the total surface area of each of these cylinders. So what we will do first is we will figure out at what value of V will the total number of cylinders be minimum. Use that value of V from that value of V we will get the volume of the cylinders. We already know the radius. So for each of the small cylinder we will calculate the height. Then we will calculate the total surface area of all the cylinders. But first thing if you want to minimize the sum of 405 by V plus 783 by V plus 351 by V, we have to keep V as high as possible. But we should also ensure that each of these three numbers are natural numbers because they represent the number of cylinders of each metal. So they can't be fractions. So V has to divide 405, V has to divide 783 and V has to divide 351. That is V should be a factor of all of these three numbers and V should be as high as possible. This implies that V should be the HCF that is the highest common factor of 405, 783 and 351. So now if you are given three numbers and if you have to find the highest common factor of these three numbers, there is one small trick which you can use. That is the HCF of three numbers a, B and C will be the HCF of A minus B, B and C. You can choose any two numbers A and B. If you subtract their, uh, if you find their difference, the HCF should even uh, be a factor of the difference. So in this case, to quickly find out the HCF of, the, HCF of these three numbers, we will subtract 351 from 405. Because these are the two numbers which are closest to each other, we can find one number to be small. And from then we can find out the HCF easily. So in this case the HCF will equal 405 minus 351 is 54, 783 and 351. Now if you look at 54 you can figure out that uh, it is a multiple of 9. So we will uh, calculate it is a multiple of 9 and it is a multiple of 27 and 2. Clearly the other two numbers are odd numbers. 783 and 351. So we will check if 27 divides either of these two numbers. 783 for example is 810 minus 27. 810 is uh, 27 into 30. So 783 can be represented as 27 into 29. Similarly 351 if you calculate can be represented as 27 into 13. So clearly 27 is a multiple of the other two numbers and we know that 54 is equal to 27 into 2. So the HCF of these three numbers is equal to 27. So the volume V is 27. So the volume of each of the small cylinders is equal to 27. And the number of such cylinders will be 405 by V, 405 by 27 is equal to 
405 is equal to 27 into 15. So you will have 15 iron small uh, cylinders of aluminium you will have 29, 29 because 783 by 27 is equal to 29 and for copper you will have 351 by V which is equal to 351 by is equal to 13. So the total number of small cylinders that you will have is 15 plus 29 plus 13 this will equal 57. Now let us calculate the height of the small cylinders. We need the height to calculate the total surface area. So if the height is h, the surface, the volume of the small cylinder will be pi into r square into h. This is equal to 27. We know that r is equal to 3. So pi into 9 into h is equal to 27 or h is equal to 3 by pi. So each of the small cylinder, the height is 3 by pi, the radius is 3 centimeters and the total number of such small cylinders is 57. We just need to calculate the total surface area. Now for any given cylinder, the total surface area is equal to 2 pi r into r plus h. In this case, for each of the small cylinder, the total surface area will be equal to 2 pi into r is 3 into 3 plus 3 by pi. Now you can cancel pi, so this will become 6 pi, uh, you can take 3 also outside, so it will be 18 into 1 plus pi. This is the total surface area of each of the small cylinders, but we have 56, 57 such small cylinders, therefore for the entire all these cylinders the total surface area will be 57 into 18 into 1 plus pi. If you calculate it, you will find out that this is equal to 1026 into 1 plus pi. That is the answer. So there are two steps in this. First you have to calculate what is the volume of each of the small cylinder. The volume has to be a factor of each of the three numbers that are given. That is 405, 783 and 351. And it should also be as high as possible because we want to keep the number of cylinders to be at its minimum. Once you figure out that uh, the volume has to be the highest common factor of these three numbers, we then calculate what is the highest common factor. We figure out that it is 27. Using the fact that the volume is 27, we calculate the height of the small cylinder. That is equal to 3 by pi. Then we calculate the total surface area of each of the small cylinders. And then we calculate the total surface area of all the 57 small cylinders. In this question, we are required to find out the number of paths from the point 1, 1 to the point 8, 10 via the point 4, 6. Now each step that you take is either uh, to the right or to the uh, top. So it should be either parallel to the x-axis or parallel to the y-axis. So let us assume that these are the two axes. Now suppose that uh, this is the initial point. This is 1, 1. Let us name this point as A. And this is the final point uh, 8, 10. Let us name this as B. And then there is a point in the middle which is uh, 4, 6. Let us assume that this is point C. So we need to go from A to B, but we have to first go uh, to C. So to find out the total number of ways in which this is possible, let us first calculate the number of ways in which you can go from A to C. Let us assume that this is say X number of ways. We will also find out the number of ways in which you can go from C to B. Let us assume that this is Y. Then the required answer is X into Y. Now to go from A to C, you have to go three steps to the right and five steps to the top. This is because this is four minus one, that is three steps to the right and six minus one, that is five steps to the top. Now the order in which you choose the three steps to the right doesn't matter. That is you can either go all the three steps at the start and then traverse uh, five steps or you can first go one step to the right, go three steps to the top and again go one step to the right and go the remaining two steps to the top and then finally take the last remaining step to the right. The order in which you choose these eight steps doesn't matter, but amongst the eight, that is three plus five steps, there should be three steps to the right. So the number of ways in which you can choose three steps to the right amongst the eight uh, steps that you take in total is 8C3. So to go from A to C, you have to take a total of eight steps and amongst these eight steps, there should be definitely three steps which are to the right. Once you select the three steps to the right, the remaining five steps will be to the top, so you need not choose them. 
So the number of ways in which you can do that is 8C3. This is the value of x that we discussed earlier. 8C3 will be 8 into 7 into 6 by 6 which is equal to 56. Similarly to go from C to B you have to go 4 steps to the right and 4 steps to the top. This is because 8 minus 4 is 4 and 10 minus 6 is 4. So you have to take a total of 8 steps that is 4 plus 4. But again the order in which you go doesn't matter. At the end of the day if you take 4 steps to the right and 4 steps to the top you will end up at B. So the number of ways in which you can select which 4 steps you take out of these 8 steps is 8C4. This is equal to Y. So 8C4 will be 8 into 7 into 6 into 5 by 24. So if you simplify this is going to be 70. 7 into 5 is 35 into 2 is 70. So the answer that you are looking for is x into y that is 56 into 70. You can use your calculator to find out that 56 into 70 will be 3920. So the answer that you are looking for is 3920. In this question a logarithm is given log of 97 minus 56 root 3 by log of square root of 7 by 4 root 3. It looks complex on the first glance but once you identify that 97 minus 56 root 3 is actually equal to 7 minus 4 root 3 whole square it becomes very easy. Why would you identify this as 7 minus 4 root 3 whole square because you should first look at 97 and know that 97 is equal to 49 plus 48. And if you look at the denominator it is 7 plus 4 root 3. So you should try to think if we can simplify the numerator in terms of 7 and 4 root 3. So 90, uh, 7, if you multiply 7 minus 4 root 3 with itself it will become 7 square which is 49 plus 4 root 3 whole square is 48 minus 2 into 7 into 4 root 3. This will become 97 minus 56 root 3 which is the numerator. Now in the denominator the square root we can bring it outside the logarithm by multiplying it with half. So the given uh, fraction will actually become 2 into log of 7 minus 4 root 3 which is actually equal to log of 7 minus uh, 4 root 3 whole square whole divided by half into log of 7 plus 4 root 3. So you can uh, bring the half in the denominator also to the numerator and the numerator will become 4 and we can remove the denominator. Now again if you look at uh, log of 7 minus 4 root 3 by 7 plus 4 root 3 you should again remember that 7 square is 49 and 4 root 3 whole square is 48. So 7 minus 4 root 3 is equal to 1 by 7 plus 4 root 3. These are important fractions because if you multiply both of them you are going to get 7 square minus 4 root 3 whole square which is equal to 49 minus 48 which is equal to 1. So this is of the form x square minus y square which is equal to x minus y into x plus y. So 7 minus 4 root 3 into 7 plus 4 root 3 is equal to 7 square minus 4 root 3 whole square which is equal to 1. Therefore the initial assumption that we made that is 7 minus 4 root 3 is equal to 1 by 7 plus 4 root 3 is valid. Therefore log of 7 minus 4 root 3 is equal to minus of log of 7 plus 4 root 3. Now when you divide both the logarithms the resultant quotient will be minus 1 or log of 7 minus 4 root 3 by log of 7 plus 4 root 3 this entire thing will equal minus 1. Therefore the given fraction will be 4 into minus 1 which is equal to minus 4. So the answer in this case is minus 4. There are many ways to simplify this. As I was saying earlier there are two important steps in this problem to simplify. The first thing is identifying 97 minus 56 root 3 as 7 minus 4 root 3 whole square. The second step is identifying that 7 minus 4 root 3 into 7 plus 4 root 3 is equal to 1. Once you have done both of this, getting the answer and simplifying this will can be done in a within a minute. In this question, we are told that there is a tank and the capacity of the tank is 1200 liters. 
there are two taps a and b and uh, both of them fill the tank tap a fills the tank in 30 hours so every hour because the volume of the tank is 1200 liters tap a fills 1200 by 30 that is 40 liters per hour similarly tap b takes 40 hours to fill the tank and the volume of the tank we know is 1200 liters so every hour tab b fills 1200 by 40 that is 30 liters per hour now there is also a hole in the tank but the amount of water that leaks out of the hole is not constant it is mentioned that it decreases uniformly over time at the start the water leaks from the hole at the rate of half a liter per minute so from the hole at the start it is half a liter per minute so 30 liters per hour is leaking at the start but after 4 hours it reduces to 100 ml per minute so into 60 is 6 liters per hour is uh, leaking out of the hole after 4 hours so from 30 liters to 6 liters it is uniformly decreasing now and it becomes constant after that now we are required to find out if both the taps are open how long will it take to fill the tank so the first thing that you should do is consider how much water is filled into the tank in the first four hours because the water that is seeping out of the hole is not constant and after four hours it is fairly simple because we know that 40 liters plus 30 liters are being filled into the tank and six liters are emptying from the tank so we know that the amount of water that is relatively or effectively getting into the tank is constant after four hours now if you're looking at the first four hours let us first draw the axis so this is the y and x axis now initially the amount of water that is being uh, drained out of the hole is 30 liters per hour at the end of 4 hours it becomes 6 liters per hour so it will be something like this and after that it remains constant at 6 liters per hour so it is uh, constant now what we know is that this is 30 liters per hour so the y axis represents how much is the uh, rate of flow out of the hole and the x-axis represents the time so this is the first four hours this is when it is zero this is 30 liters and this is six liters and after that it is constant at six liters per hour now how much water is uh, removed by the hole in the first four hours it is the area of this trapezium so once you find out the area of the trapezium you know how much water has been removed because of the hole for the first four hours what is the area of the trapezium it is quite easy you know the lengths of both the parallel sides the length of the parallel side is 30 plus 6 so the area of the trapezium is 30 plus 6 divided by 2 which is the average of the length of the parallel sides into the distance between the parallel sides the distance between the parallel sides is 4 hours so into 4 this is 36 by 2 that is 18 into 4 which is 72 liters so because of the hole in the first 4 hours 72 liters of water is removed and how much water is filled into the tank because of a and b in the first 4 hours it is 40 plus 30 that is 70 liters into 4 that is 280 liters so a plus b in 4 hours fill 280 liters of which the hole removes 72 liters so how much is the uh, effective amount of water that is in the tank after 4 hours it is 280 minus 72 so that is 208 liters this has been filled into the tank in the first 4 hours so what is the amount of water that needs to be filled into the tank that is 1200 minus 208 so that is 1200 minus 208 is 992 liters have to be filled into the tank after 4 hours but after 4 hours the amount of water that is getting into the tank is constant it is 40 liters plus 30 liters that is 70 liters minus 6 liters so 64 liters are filled into the tank every hour after the first 4 hours therefore how much time does it take it takes 992 by 64 992 by 64 is if you divide both the numerator and denominator by 8 it is 124 by 8 this is equal to 62 by 4 this is equal to 31 by 2 which is equal to 15.5 hours so after the first four hours the tank will be completely filled in 15.5 hours so what is the total time that it takes to fill the tank it is 15.5 plus 4 that is 19.5 hours
In this question, it is given that there was a shopkeeper who arranged a stock of apples that he had in a triangular format. By triangular format, the first row will have 1, the second row will have 2, the third row will have 3 and so on. Now after a point of, and he was selling it, uh, he was selling all the apples from the top down. So first he was clearing off the first row, then he was clearing off the second row and so on. After a point of time, there was a customer who came and saw that there were 126 apples when she came to buy. And we are, we are supposed to find out the number of uh, rows that were remaining when the customer came. So it was also given that the initial number of apples did not exceed 150. <coughs> If we assume that the number of uh, rows initially were n, the total number of apples that were there will be 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus n. This is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2. Now we know that this is greater than or equal to 126 because that was the number of apples that she saw after the shopkeeper sold some apples and it is also less than or equal to 150. This was given to us in the question. So using this we can get a sense of what n is. So if you multiply all the numbers by 2, we are going to get an inequality which says that 300 is greater than or equal to n into n plus 1 is greater than or equal to 252. Now 252 is close to 16 square that is 256. So we will first assume that n is equal to 15. If n is equal to 15, n into n plus 1 will be 15 into 16. This is equal to 240. Now this is not satisfied because we need n into n plus 1 to be between 252 and 300. So n is not equal to 15. Now let us assume that n is equal to 16. In that case n into n plus 1 will be 16 into 17. 16 into 17 is 256 plus 16 that is 272. This falls within the window. So one of the options for n is that n is equal to 16. Now let us assume that n is equal to 17. Then 17 into 18, which is n into n plus 1, 17 into 18 will equal 289 plus 17, which is equal to 306. Now this is greater than the highest bound, so n can't be 17 or any number above it. So the only valid number for n is that n is equal to 16. So initially in the triangular uh, row, there were 16 rows of apples and the total number of apples that were there initially will be. 16 into 17 by 2 this is equal to 17 into 8 which is equal to 136 so the initial number of apples that were there were 136 and they were in 16 rows now by the time the uh, customer came to purchase there were only 126 apples that means 10 apples were uh, sold off already after the first row is sold off there will be one apple which will be sold off after the second apple, two more apples, that is a total of three apples are sold off. After the third row is sold off, three more apples are sold off, that is three plus three, six apples are sold off. And after the fourth row is sold off, six plus four, that is ten apples are sold off. So from 136 apples, ten apples are sold off after four rows are sold off. So the first four rows will contain ten apples which are sold off and the remaining twelve rows will contain 126 apples which are remaining. So by the time the customer comes, she sees 126 apples and the number of rows that she sees are 12. So the answer that we are looking for is 12. To solve this, we have first calculated the number of rows that were there initially. There is only 16 which is a valid number of rows. Once we have found out that there were 16 ap uh, rows, we found out that there were initially a total of 136 apples. Once we knew that it was 136 apples, we figured out that 10 apples were sold because 136 minus 126 is 10. So if 10 apples are sold, it means that the first 4 rows are empty and if the first 4 rows are empty, there are 12 rows remaining. So the required answer is 12. In this question, it is given that there is a cyclist who will leave A at 10 am and reaches B at 11 am. So suppose this is 10 am. The cyclist cycles and reaches B at 11 a.m. Now starting at 10, 1 a.m. every motor minute a motorcyclist leaves A and moves towards B. So there is a motorcyclist who will start at uh, 10, 1 and he will reach B at some time. Similarly another motorcyclist leaves at uh, 10, 2 and he reaches B at uh, a different time and so on. 45 such motorcyclists uh, reach B by 11 a.m. So by 11 a.m. There is another motorcyclist who will leave at some point. All the motorcycles have the same speed. 
So the time taken by each motorcycle to go from A to B is the same. And we are told that uh, 45 motorcyclists have reached uh, B by 11 a.m. If the cyclist has doubled his speed, how many motorcycles would have reached B by the time the cyclist reached B? So if the cyclist has doubled his speed, he would have reached B at 10.30 a.m. Right now he is taking 1 hour to reach B from A. If he doubles his speed, he will just take 30 minutes. Now what we are required to find out is first how much time does a motorcyclist take to go from A to B. Now you can easily see that there are uh, if 45 motorcycles reach B by 11 a.m. We will try to calculate what is the last time at which the motorcycle left A and reached B at 11 a.m. So the first motorcycle leaves at 10 1. The second motorcycle leaves at 10 2. Similarly, the 45th motorcycle, which is the last motorcycle to reach B, left A at 10.45. So, this is the start time of the last motorcycle, which reached B at 11 a.m. So, for a motorcycle, the time it takes to reach B from A is 15 minutes. The motorcycle, which left at 10.46, would reach B at 11.1. That is something that you should remember. So now we are required to find out how many motorcycles reach B by the time the cyclist reach B. So if the cyclist doubles his speed, he will again leave at 10 a.m. but he will reach B at 10.30 a.m. So the last motorcyclist who would reach B before the cyclist or around the same time would have to leave A at 10.15. So the number of such motorcyclists will be 10 1 will be the first motorcycle, 10 2 will be the second motorcycle and the 15th motorcyclist would leave A at 10 15 am. So the answer we are looking at is 15. 15 motorcyclists would reach B before 10 30 am and that is the answer. Google search Kraku Cat Formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are asked to find out the product of the distinct roots of this equation that is given, which is modulus of x square minus x minus 6 is equal to x plus 2. So what we will do is because there is modulus over here, we will first uh, consider both the cases. Case 1 is when uh, the expression inside it is negative and case 2 is when the expression inside it is positive. So we will divide it into two cases. This is when x square minus x minus 6 is greater than 0. And this is when x square minus x minus 6 is less than 0. If it is equal to 0, it won't matter because it will lie in both the cases, but the answer will remain the same. So, in this case, when x square minus x minus 6 is greater than 0, modulus of x square minus x minus 6 will equal x square minus x minus 6. Now, we are told that this modulus is equal to x plus 2. So, this will mean that x plus 2 is equal to x square minus x minus 6. So then we can uh, simplify it and it will become x square minus 2x minus 8 is equal to 0. x square minus 2x minus 8 is equal to x minus 4 into x plus 2 is equal to 0 or x is equal to 4 or minus 2. Now we will have to check if in both these cases x square minus x minus 6 is greater than 0. I am putting it as greater than or equal to 0 because it won't matter in case of modulus. So, when you put x is equal to 4, it will become x square minus x minus 6 will become 16 minus 4 minus 6 which is equal to 6. This is greater than 0, so this is a valid answer. Similarly, when you put x is equal to minus 2, x square will be 4, minus x will be plus 2 and minus 6 will be minus 6. So, this is equal to 0. So, this is also a valid solution. So, in this case, the two solutions that we have are x is equal to 4 and x is equal to minus 2. Similarly, if you uh, consider the case where x square minus x minus 6 is less than or equal to 0, in this case, modulus of x square minus x minus 6 will equal minus of x square plus x plus 6 because this is negative. So, modulus of y when y is negative is equal to minus y. This is true whenever y is less than 0. So, in this case, x square minus x minus 6 is minus of x square plus x plus 6. But we know that the value of this modulus is equal to x plus 2. 
So x plus 2 is equal to minus of x square plus x plus 6. You can cancel x and you can take x square to the other side and then you will get x square is equal to 4 or x is equal to plus 2 or minus 2. Again we will have to check whether uh, in this case x square minus x minus 6 is less than or equal to 0. So if you input that you are going to get <coughs> uh, in if x is equal to 2 it will be 4 minus 2 minus 6 so this is equal to minus 4 so this is a valid solution if you input uh, x is equal to minus 2 as we have seen earlier x square minus x minus 6 will equal 0 so this is also a valid solution so the number of distinct roots that you have are the actual distinct roots are 4 minus 2 and 2 these are the only three cases we have considered minus 2 twice because in both the cases we have put uh, greater than or equal to 0 so when you look at the distinct roots they are 4 minus 2 and 2 and their product will equal minus 2 into 2 into 4 which is equal to minus 16. So the answer that we are looking for in this case is minus 16. So whenever you see a question where there is a modulus try to see if you can consider two different cases where uh, the value inside the modulus is greater than 0 or the value inside the modulus is less than 0 and then you can solve it find the distinct roots and then answer the question. So this question is, uh, uh, this question looks like it's a question on solids, but it's actually not. The A ball of diameter 4 centimeters is kept on the uh, top of a hollow cylinder standing vertically. The height of the cylinder is 3 centimeters while its volume is 9 pi cubic centimeters. Then the vertical distance in centimeters of the topmost point of the ball from the base of the cylinder is, let's start, start by first drawing this out. So we have this cylinder like this, which is 3 centimeters. So this is the like the base and we have a uh, ball of, uh, actually I will uh, remove this because uh, I need to draw the ball also. So this is 3 centimeters long and there is a ball which is, uh, which has a diameter 4 centimeters. So the diameter will lie slightly outside the top of the cylinder. So the diagram will be somewhat like this where this 3 centimeters will be a chord of the circle as such. Uh, uh, sorry, the height is 3 centimeters. We don't know the radius of the uh, cylinder, but the uh, diameter of the cylinder will be a chord of the circle. And we know that the, the diameter of this, uh, this uh, ball is 4 centimeters. So this radius is 2 centimeters. As you can see, to find the uh, uh, this length, we have to find the length from the top of the ball to the base of the cylinder. So, we have to find this length as such. But to find this length, we just need the 2D cross section. We do not need the solid uh, as such entirely to find the height of the solid. So, all we needed was this 2D uh, cross section as such. Now, we have to find out uh, this length as such. So, first let us find out what is the radius of the uh, given cylinder. Because the radius of the cylinder is essentially the forms this chord as such. Uh, we are given that the volume of the cylinder is 9 pi cubic uh, centimeters. Uh, the formula for the uh, volume of the cylinder is pi r square h and h is given as 3. So, uh, we substituting this we get uh, 9 pi is equal to 3 pi r square. So, r square is equal to 3 or r is equal to root 3. So, this is equal to root 3. So, this is a right angle triangle with the uh, uh, because this is a chord, so a uh, line joining the midpoint of the chord uh, to the center of the circle will be perpendicular to the chord as such. So this is a right angle triangle with uh, hypotenuse 2 and uh, one side as root 3. So the other side will be uh, 2 square minus root 3 square that is essentially uh, 1. So this length is 1. So we get this length as 1. This is uh, the other radius. So this is 2 and this is the height of the cylinder that is 3. Therefore, the length of the, uh, the therefore the distance in centimeters from the topmost point of the ball to the base of the cylinder, this distance is equal to 2 plus 1 plus 3 that is 6 centimeter. As you could see this became very simple once we drew the diagram. Uh, whenever they are asking you not to find like the volume or anything of that sort, they are just asking you to find the distance or the length or something of that sort. Always remember that most of the times you just have to consider the 2D cross section of it. Uh, in this case, like you had this, uh, so in this case you had a uh, cylinder, a hollow cylinder and a ball resting on it. 
So if you had slice slice that cylinder uh, in the middle, like this entire figure in the middle, then you would have gotten the topmost point at the top, as shown in the figure, and you would have gotten the base of the cylinder. So if you had sliced in the middle, you would have gotten this 2D cross section. And once you have this 2D cross section, it just is a basic. Uh, you just had to um, uh, apply basic geometry fundamentals. for circles and uh, for chords as such to find out this length as such so you needed uh, fundamentals of how to find uh, uh, the the uh, uh, basic uh, idea about chords as such that uh, the line joining the midpoint of the chord to the center of the circle is perpendicular to the chord you needed uh, how to find the volume of a cylinder the formula for volume of a cylinder uh, and just using that basic information you could easily calculate the distance of the topmost point of the uh, ball to the base of the cylinder as such so it required some basic formula but if you knew the formulas that are required in geometry you would have been easily able to solve this question as such in this question it is given that abcd is a quadrilateral and its diagonals are perpendicular to each other so let us first draw the diagonal so that so this is abcd ab is given as 75 so this is 75 cd is given as 40 so this is 40 AD is to BC is equal to three is to four. So let AD be equal to three x and BC be equal to four x. So this is four x and this is three x. Find the sum of the lengths of AD plus BC. So we are basically asked to find out three x plus four x, which is equal to seven x. This is what we need to find out. To calculate this, let us assume that the diagonals intersect at a point called O. Now each of the angles around O is a right angle. So let us assume that uh, the four uh, sides OB, OC, OD, and OA are B, C, D, and A. We are doing this because we can use Pythagoras theorem repeatedly to get an equation and calculate the value of x. So if you cal, if you look at the triangle OAB, a square plus b square is equal to seventy five square. Similarly, b square plus c square. Is equal to sixteen x square. This is from the triangle OBC. Similarly, in triangle OCD, c square plus d square is equal to forty square. And in triangle OAD, a square plus d square is equal to this is three x so nine x square. Now you have four equations. This is equation one, equation two, equation three, and equation four. If you add equation one and three, and equation two and four, if you equ add equation one and three, you get a square plus b square plus c square plus d square is equal to seventy-five square plus forty square. Equation two and four. Also give b square plus c square plus a square plus d square is equal to sixteen x square plus nine x square. This is equal to twenty five x square. Notice that the left hand side of both the equations are the same. Therefore, twenty five x square should equal seventy five square plus forty square or seventy sorry seventy five square plus forty square is equal to twenty five x square. If you simplify seventy five square, seventy five square plus forty square will equal seven two two five. This is equal to twenty five x square, or x square is equal to two hundred and eighty nine, or x is equal to seventeen. Now, what are we required to find out? We are required to find out seven x. So, in this case, seven into seventeen is equal to one one nine is the answer. In this question, it is given that when they work alone, B needs twenty five percent more time to finish a job than A does. So it is given that accordingly, if A and B do the job alone, A will uh, B needs twenty five percent more time than A uh, requires. So let us assume that the amount of work done by B in one day is say one unit. Therefore, the amount of work done by A in one day is one point two five units. 
in this case we know that the efficiency of a is 25 percent more because of which b requires 25 percent more time to do the same job as a does now it is also told that the two of them finish the job in 13 days in the following manner a works alone till half the job is done so initially for the first 50 percent of the job only a will work then a and b work together for four days after that a and b both of them work for four days and finally b works alone to complete the remaining five percent of the job and finally this five percent is finished by b alone in how many days can b alone finish the entire job so if you look at it a works alone initially for 50 percent of the job then a plus b work alone for four days then finally b works alone for the remaining five percent of the job what this basically tells us is in the four days that a and b work together they have worked for 100 which is the total amount of work minus 50 which is the initial work done by a alone plus 5 which is the work done by b alone this is equal to 45 percent so in four days that a and b have worked they managed to finish 45 percent of the job now in four days a will do 1.52 units per day and b will do one unit per day so a plus b when they are working together they finish 2.25 units of work per day so in four days they will finish 2.25 into 4 which is equal to 9 units of work but what we know over here is that this 9 units of work is 45 percent of the whole job so this 9 units is equal to 45 percent of total work therefore the total work that needs to be done is 9 units of work by 0 0.45 which is equal to 20 units so the total work that is there that should be completed is 20 units of work and b does one unit of work per day so the total number of days taken by b to finish the work is 20 because the total work that needs to be done is 20 units and b does one unit of work per day so the required answer is 20 days in this question there are two key things that you have to remember because b takes 25 percent more time than a takes to complete the job it would imply that a's efficiency is 25 percent more than b so if you assume that b does one unit of work per day a will do 1.25 units of work per day the second thing that you should observe is because a finished 50 percent of the job initially and b finished 5 percent of the job at the end a plus b when they are working together for four days they finished 45 percent of the job once you understand both these uh, things solving the question will not take a lot of time in this question a function f is given such that f of x plus y is equal to f of x into f of y where x and y are positive integers it is also given that f of 1 is equal to 2 uh, we are also given a function which uh, an expression which says that f of a plus 1 plus f of a plus 2 dot 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 plus f of a plus n is equal to 16 into 2 to the power n minus 1 and we are required to find out the value of a so let us first look at uh, the expression that is given and try to figure out the values of f of 2 f of 3 and so on to get a sense of how the function actually behaves so f of 2 is equal to f of 1 plus 1 which according to the function that was given will be f of 1 into f of 1 we are already told that f of 1 is equal to 2 so this will be 2 square similarly f of 3 will be f of 2 plus 1 which is equal to f of 2 into f of 1 f of 2 is 2 square and f of 1 is 2 so this will be equal to 2 cube you can easily see that f of n will equal 2 to the power n for any natural number n so the lh uh, the left hand side of the given expression that is f of a plus 1 plus f of a plus 2 plus dot 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 plus f of a plus n will equal 2 to the power a plus 1 
प्लस टू टू द पावर ए प्लस टू प्लस डॉट 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 प्लस टू टू द पावर ए प्लस एन हियर यू कैन सी दैट ऑल ऑफ देम आर ग्रेटर दे आर पावर्स ऑफ टू विच आर ग्रेटर देन ए प्लस वन सो लेट एस टेक टू टू द पावर ए प्लस वन कॉमन इन द सम सो दिस विल बी वन प्लस टू प्लस डॉट 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 द लास्ट टर्म विल बी ए प्लस एन माइनस ए प्लस वन सो दैट विल बी प्लस टू टू द पावर एन माइनस वन now this sum that is 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 plus 2 to the power n minus 1 equals 2 to the power n minus 1 into 2 to the power a plus 1 this is a simple sum of a geometric progression where the first term is 1 and the uh, common difference is 2 and the common ratio is 2 so to this sum actually equals 2 to the power a plus 1 into 2 to the power n minus 1 but we are told that the right hand side this equals 16 into 2 to the power n minus 1. This is already given in the question. So you can cancel 2 to the power n minus 1 and 2 to the power n minus 1, and uh, come to the conclusion that a plus 1 is equal to 4. A plus 1 is equal to 4 because 16 is equal to 2 to the power 4. So if you are equating the power of 2 on both sides, a plus 1 will equal 4, and a will equal 3. So the answer in this case is 3. To solve this question, you just need to figure out what is the value of f of n. We have figured out that f of n is equal to two to the power n. Then notice that uh, all the terms which are given in the left hand side are part of a geometric progression. Calculate the sum of the geometric progression and cancel out the common terms and find out that a is equal to three, which is the answer. In this question, we are told that the work done by a man, woman, and child are in the ratio three is to two is to one. That is, if a uh, there is a man, woman, and child. Let us assume that the work done by a man in a day is three x. Then the work done by a woman is two x, and the work done by a child is x. We are also told that the daily wages of twenty men plus thirty women plus thirty six children is equal to seventy eight rupees. That is, what is the total work done by these guys in one day? Twenty men will do sixty x work. 30 women will do 30 into 2x, which is again 60x, and 36 children will do 36 into x, so that is 36x. Or the total work that will be done by them is 156x, for which they are paid a total of 78 rupees. That is to make x units of work. What is the amount of money that is paid to them? It will be 78 divided by 156, which is equal to 1 by 2 rupees. We are asked to find out what will the total wages be for 15 men plus 21 women. Plus 30 children over 18 weeks. That is 18 into 7 days. What is the total work done by 15 men in one day? It will be 15 into 3x, so that is 45x. By 21 women will be 21 into 2x, so that is equal to 42x. And by 30 children it will be 30x. So the total work done by these guys in one day will be 45 plus 42, that is 87x. 87 plus 30, that is equal to 117x. This is the total amount of work done by them in one day. For which, what is the total amount of money that will be paid to them? That will be into half. So that is one one seven into one by two. This is the total amount of money that is paid to them in one day. We are required to find out how much they will be paid in eighteen weeks. So you multiply it with eighteen and with seven. Eighteen divided by two is nine. So we are required to find out the value of one one seven into nine into seven is sixty three. This will be equal to seven three seven one, which is the answer. In this question, it is given that there are five employees in a company called A, B, C, D, and D. E. Each of them got two hikes on in two consecutive years. For example, A got P percent and P plus one percent. B got P plus two and P minus one, and so on. If you see the sum of the two hikes is the same. The sum of the two hikes for each one of them is two P plus one, because P plus P plus one is P plus one. P plus two plus P minus one is also two P plus one, and so on. now we are required to we are also told that at the end of the two years the salary of each one of them is the same and we are required to find out who got the least hike so at the end of the two years all of them had the same salary so we had to find out who had the highest salary at the start of the two years so let us assume that the salary of each one of them is a b c d and e we are required to find out which of them is the highest at the start when your salary is the highest then you will get the least amount of hike if uh, the salary is the same at the end of 2 years so if you look at it 
for example a into 100 plus p by 100 let us assume that the final salary of each of all of them is f it is the same into 100 plus p plus 1 by 100 is equal to f or a is equal to 100 we are uh, multiplying this 100 and 100 to the other side so it will be 10,000 f by 100 plus p into 101 plus p this is the value of a similarly the value of b will be 10,000 f by this is the salary of a so this will be 102 plus p into 99 plus p the value of c will be 10,000 f by 103 plus p into 98 plus p and the value of d will be 10,000 f by 104 plus p into 97 plus p and the value of e will be 10,000 f by 105 plus p into 96 plus p now we are required to find out which of these five numbers is the highest if you notice the numerator is the same for each one of them and it is the denominator which is differing so we'll find out which of the following denominators is the lowest because the numerator is the same whenever the denominator is the lowest then the total fraction will be the highest so we'll just calculate the denominator the denominator again of each one of them is quite similar so this will be p square plus 201 p plus 100 into 101 similarly for b the denominator will be p square plus 201 p plus 102 into 99 and for c it will be only the denominator p square plus 201 p plus 103 into 98 and for d it will be p square plus 201 p plus 104 into 97 and lastly it will be p square plus 201 p plus 105 into 96 as you can see for each of the denominators the first two terms are the same so we can ignore them so we'll have to look at which of the final terms is the lowest now again the final terms if you observe closely the sum of the two terms is the same that is 100 plus 100 plus 101 is 201 102 plus 99 is 201 103 plus 98 is 201 104 plus 97 is 201 and 105 into 96 is 201 so the sum is the same so the number which will be the least will be 105 into 96 because both of them are furthest away from each other and in fact the highest will be 100 into 101 so for uh, these uh, terms the denominator of e will be the lowest and as the numerators of all of them are the same e as a whole the fraction will be the highest and because e is highest the amount of hike that e got will be the lowest amongst the five so the answer that you're looking for is e in general when you're solving these kind of questions to solve them fast uh, if you are seeing a pattern the pattern that we are observing over here is that sum of each of them is the same then only compare the first term and the last term because in most uh, likelihood they will have the extremes so if you just compare a and e and you can uh, figure out that e is larger than a you can answer the question faster anyway the answer in this case is e In this question it is given that there is a circle and the center of the circle is in the first quadrant so if you draw the x the y axis and the x axis this is the first quadrant this is the second quadrant this is the third quadrant and this is the fourth quadrant so the center of the circle is in the first quadrant and it touches the x axis at x is equal to 5 let us assume that this is x is equal to 5 so the circle will be something like this now because this is touching uh, the x axis at x is equal to 5 if you draw a line which is connecting the center of the circle and the point at which x axis touches the circle this will be perpendicular because this is a tangent and because this is uh, x is equal to 5 so this will be 5 comma 0 the center of the circle will be something like 5 comma 5 
where y is the radius of the circle. So the center of the circle is of the form phi comma y. What should be the radius of the circle such that it touches another line which is 4x minus 3y is equal to 0. So suppose this is the line 4x minus 3y is equal to 0. Now we are told that the line 4x minus 3y is equal to 0 is also a tangent to the given circle. That is again if you draw a line which is connecting which is perpendicular to the line 4x minus 3y that will be a tangent. How do you know that it will be a tangent? So whenever you are connecting the point to a line and if you are drawing a circle the way we can identify that a particular line is a tangent to a circle is if you connect the center of the circle O to that given line by drawing a perpendicular and the distance of the length of the perpendicular should equal the radius of the circle. So what we will do over here is from the point phi comma y we will calculate the distance by distance we just mean the length of the perpendicular from this point to the line 4x minus 3y is equal to 0. Now once you get that length we have to equate the length to equal the radius of the circle. And only in that case will the given line be a tangent. So we will first calculate the length of the perpendicular that is the perpendicular distance of the line from the point and then equate it to the radius. The radius of the circle we already know is equal to y. And what is the length of the perpendicular? There is another formula, useful formula that you should remember. If there is a point x1 comma y1 and if you want to calculate the length of the perpendicular from this point to a line ax plus by plus c is equal to 0, you have to substitute ax1 plus by1 plus c, the modulus of it that is the absolute value of it divided by square root of a square plus b square where a is the coefficient of x and b is the coefficient of y. We will use the same formula over here. So to calculate the distance of the center to the line and we are equating it to the radius, the radius is y. To calculate the distance we will just use this given formula and this will equal modulus of 4 into x1. What is x1? x1 is 5 plus b in this case b is minus 3 so minus 3 into y1 what is y1 we have assumed that that equals a variable y and we want to calculate the value of y plus c there is no constant term in the given line the line passes through origin so it is 4x minus 3y is equal to 0 so the constant term c is 0 plus 0 divided by square root of a square plus b square in this square, in this case a is equal to 4, so square root of 4 square plus b square. b square is minus 3, so square of b square is 3 square. Square root of 4 square plus 3 square is 5, so we can simplify the given equation as 5y is equal to modulus of 20 minus 3y. Now there are two cases, to remove the modulus we will equate it to plus or minus of the left hand side. So case 1 is 20 minus 3y is equal to 5y. And the other case is 20 minus 3y is equal to minus 5y. Now you can easily calculate that this equals 8y is equal to 20 or y is equal to 20 by 8. This is equal to 5 by 2. In the second case 20 is equal to minus 2y or y is equal to minus 10. But we know that y cannot equal minus 10 because we are told that the center is in the first quadrant. So both the points, both the coordinates have to be greater than 0. That is 5 and y, both of them have to be greater than 0. So the case where y is equal to minus 10 is ruled out. So the only possible value for y is 5 by 2. And when y is 5 by 2, that is equal to the radius of the circle, which we have to calculate. So the correct answer is that the radius of the circle will equal 5 by 2. In this question it is given that David bought a few pencils and he decides to sell the pencils in packets uh, of n pencils each and he earns a profit of 20% while doing it. Now suppose he packed uh, n-1 pencils per packet and sold them at the same price then his profit would be 20% more than what he had earned earlier by selling the packets at n pencils per packet. Now what is the least number of pencils that David could have bought? So what has been given to us is that let the cost of buying uh, the pencils, let us assume that he bought n pencils and let the cost be equal to t. 
Now, if he sold these uh, pencils as small n, the number of packets he would have sold is n by small n. And let us assume that the price of each packet is a. So, by selling n by small n packets at a each, he earned 1.2 t. This is the profit that he earned. Now, what we are told is that when he sold the packets uh, having n minus 1 pencils per packet, the profit he would have earned is 20% more than what he had earned by selling n pencils per packet. So the keyword over here is that the profit has increased by 20%. The amount or the sales price has not increased by 20%. So what is the new profit? The old profit is 0.2t. The new profit is 20% greater than this. So the new profit is 0.24t. Therefore the new selling price is 1.24t. And this is equal to n by small n minus 1 which is the number of packets he sold and he sold them at the same price that is into a. Now you can easily solve for small n. If you divide the first equation by the second equation there are many unknowns but most of them will get cancelled. For example capital N small a and t will get cancelled and you will be left with n divided by n minus 1 is equal to 31 by 30 or 30 n is equal to 31 small n minus 31 or n is equal to 31. Now we are required to find out what is the least number of pencils that David could have bought. Now we should notice that capital N is a multiple of both small n as well as small n minus 1. So capital N divides is a multiple of both 31 as well as 30. Now the smallest such number which is both a multiple of both 31 and 30 is the LCM of 30 and 31 which is equal to 930. So the correct answer that is the smallest number of pencils that David could have bought is 930. In this question we are told that ABC started working together for a project and A left the work 9 days before completion, B left the work 7 days before completion, C finished the work. So initially a, B and C were working together. They worked for something like N days. After some time A left and B and C were working together. And how many days uh, did B and C work together? They worked together for some days and B left 7 days before the completion of the work. So for the last 7 days C was working alone. Therefore B and C worked together for 2 days. And before that A, B and C all of them were working together. We are given some uh, information. We are told that if A had worked for one more day. So if A had worked for one more day. Then the work would have been completed two days before the actual time. That is if A had worked for one day more. Then C would not have to work for seven days. C would have worked only for something like uh, five days. So one additional day that A has worked would have saved two days of C's work. Or the amount of work that A does in one day is equal to two times the amount of work that C does. We are also told that had B worked for two days more. So instead of quitting after two days, if B had worked, continue to work for two more days, then the work would have been finished three days before the actual time. That is if B had worked for two days more, C would not have to work for three days. This would imply that the amount of work that B does in two days is equal to the amount of work that C does in 3 days or the efficiency of B is 3 by 2 times that of C. Now we are told that if how many days would A, B and C take to complete a different work which could have been done by C in 18 days alone. So for that new job let us assume that the total work is 18 units. Therefore the efficiency of C is 1 unit per day. Therefore, the efficiency of A is 2 times that of C. So, this is 2 units per day. And the efficiency of B is 3 by 2 times that of C. So, this is 1.5 units per day. So, if A, B and C all of them are working together, the amount of work that they will complete in one day is 4.5 units per day. This is A plus B plus C. Therefore, the total amount of time that they are going to take is 18 divided by 4.5 which is equal to 4 days. So, if A, B and C all of them are working together, 
they would complete this new job in four days. Google search Krakow free cat mock. Click on the first link. You can attempt a free mock test, which was attempted by 30,000 cat aspirants in the actual exam format. After completing the test, you get detailed solutions, analysis, and percentile along with your scorecard to gauge your All India performance. Click on the solution to get video solutions from our expert faculty. In this question, it is given that A and B are two regular polygons and they have A and B sides respectively. So there is a polygon A and there is a polygon B. The number of sides of A is A and the number of sides of B is B. It is given that B is equal to 2A and each interior angle of B is 3 by 2 times each interior angle of A. So the interior angle of uh, A, let us assume it is equal to X, then each of the interior angles of B is equal to 3X by 2. We are required to find out the interior angles of a polygon which has A plus B sides. Now this is the question. To find out, let us first uh, do a small diversion. We will talk about what is interior angle and what is exterior angle. So suppose you have a regular hexagon. All the angles which are inside are interior angles. And all the angles which are outside are exterior angles. So for example, if this is a regular hexagon, this angle is an interior angle and the angle which is basically supplementary to it will be a exterior angle. So if say this is A, the exterior angle will equal 180 minus A. This is true for all of the vertices. So if say this is B, then this will be 180 minus B. So the exterior angle will be 180 minus B whenever the interior angle is equal to B. Now there are many formulas that you can remember with respect to interior angles and exterior angles. But the one formula that I use to avoid confusion is that the sum of all the exterior angles of any convex polygon is equal to 360 degrees. So if you have many exterior angles, the sum of all the exterior angles of any convex polygon is equal to 360 degrees. So in this case, what I will do is I'll first find out the exterior angles. So the exterior angles of A will equal 180 minus X because all the angles equal X, all the interior angles equal X, all the exterior angles will equal 180 minus X and all the exterior angles of B will equal 180 minus 3X by 2. Now sum of all the exterior angles of A will equal 360 degrees and sum of all the exterior angles of B will also equal 360 degrees. If you just put those into formulae, there are 180 minus X into a. The number of exterior angles in A is small a. This is the number of sides that A has and each of the exterior angles equals 180 minus x. This is equal to 360 degrees which is also equal to 180 minus 3x by 2 which is the exterior angles of polygon B into the number of sides of B which is equal to B. This is the sum of all the exterior angles of B and this is the sum of all the exterior angles of A both the sums will equal 360 degrees. Using this we will calculate the value of x, from x we will calculate the value of small a and small b, then calculate the required answer. So we can use it, we can use the formula that we can use the equation that b is equal to 2a to simplify this. So 180 minus x into a is equal to 180 minus 3x by 2 into 2a. We can cancel a, so 180 minus x is equal to 360 minus 3x or x is equal to 90 degrees. So each of the interior angles of A is 90 degrees and each of the interior angles of B is equal to 135 degrees. So as each of the interior angles of A is equal to 90 degrees, the number of sides of A is 4. It is a square and the number of sides of B will be b is equal to 2a so that is equal to 8. So what we are required to find out is interior angles of a regular polygon which has a plus b which is equal to 12 sides. Now again to do this what we will do is calculate the exterior angle. Each of the exterior angles of a polygon which has 12 sides will equal 360 by 12 which is equal to 30 degrees. Therefore each of the interior angles will equal 180 minus 30 which is equal to 150 degrees. 
So if you have noticed this in all the equations what we have done is we have first found out the exterior angles. We have used the formula that the sum of exterior angles of all the polygons whether it has 4 sides or 8 sides or 12 sides the sum of the exterior angles of a convex polygon will always equal 360 degrees. We have used that to find out the value of A then we have found out the value of B and we have found out the value of A plus B which is equal to 12. Once we have found out that A plus B is equal to 12 we found out that each of the exterior angles of a 12 sided polygon will equal 30 degrees and hence each of the interior angles will equal 180 minus 30 which is equal to 150 degrees. Now there are many ways in which you can calculate this there will obviously be formulas of the uh, dimensions of the interior angles directly but what I feel is just keeping track of the exterior angles is less confusing we would not uh, use one formula from the other and even though it takes slightly more time we will be able to get the answer for sure with a lot of accuracy. So anyway in this question the answer is 150 degrees. In this question we are given a fraction n square plus 7n plus 12 by n square minus n minus 12 and we are required to find out the largest positive integer n for which the given fraction is also a positive integer. So let us assume that the given fraction is f and this equals n square plus 7n plus 12 by n square minus n minus 12. Now we can factorize the numerator as n plus 3 into n plus 4 and the denominator as n plus 3 into n minus 4. So we can cancel n plus 3 from both the numerator and denominator. So the given fraction will just become n plus 4 by n minus 4. Now we are required to find out the largest integer n such that this is a positive integer. Now we can simplify f further so that it becomes n plus 4 by n minus 4 which is equal to 1 plus 8 by n minus 4. How did we come to this conclusion? It is because n plus 4 is actually equal to n minus 4 plus 8. So if you divide n plus 4 by n minus 4, this actually becomes 1 plus 8 by n minus 4. Now we are required to find out the largest positive integer such that 8 by n minus 4 is also a positive integer. Now we can easily see that this will happen only when n minus 4 is equal to 8 or n is equal to 12. Because if n is greater than 12, n minus 4 will be greater than 8 and this will not be a positive integer. Therefore, f which is equal to 1 plus 8 by n minus 4 will also not be a positive integer. So, the maximum value of n for which 8 by n minus 4 is a positive integer will be if n minus 4 is equal to 8 and n is equal to 12. In which case, the value of the fraction f becomes 2. Because 8 by n minus 4 will become 1 and you have to add 1. So f becomes 2. So the maximum value largest positive integer n for which this is a positive integer is 12. That is the answer. In this question we are told that 100 people have attended a wedding. These 100 people include some men, some women and some children. So if you are assuming that the number of men who attended the wedding is m plus the number of women who attended the wedding is w plus the number of children who attended the wedding is C, M plus W plus C is equal to 100 and each man has given rupees 5, each woman has given rupees 4 and each child has given rupees 1. So 5M plus 4W plus C is the total money that is given to the married couple. This has been told to equal 200. We are given some more information between M and W. We are told that every woman attended the wedding along with her husband. So it would imply that W is less than or equal to m because for every woman we also have her husband and in addition to all these married men there are also some men who have attended it alone. Now the total number of men who attended the wedding we assume to be equal to m. Of this how many men have attended the wedding along with their wives this is equal to w which is the number of women who have attended the wedding and there are some men who attended it alone. What is their number? Their number will equal m minus w. Now some information that is given is that it is known that at least half of the men who attended the wedding came along with their wives. So the number of men who attended the wedding who came along with their wives is W. So W is greater than or equal to half the total number of men or 2W is greater than or equal to M. So we know that W is less than or equal to M and 2W is greater than or equal to M. This is basically the information that we have. We are supposed to calculate what is the difference between the number of men and women who attended the wedding. 
that is we are supposed to calculate the value of m minus w here we have two equations and we have three unknowns so how are you going to solve it we can solve it because we have some more information about m w and c all of them are integers and we also have an inequality between w and m so using this extra information we should be able to solve these equations so let us assume that this is the first equation and this is the second equation let us first remove c by subtracting the first equation from the second equation this would imply that 4m plus 3w is equal to 100 and we have to solve for the value of m and w 4m is a multiple of 4 because the coefficient 4 is a multiple of 4 and 100 is a multiple of 4 because 100 is equal to 4 into 25 so for 3w also has to be a multiple of 4 so this would imply that w has to be a multiple of 4 so let us assume that w is equal to 4 into k for some number k so the given equation will become 4m plus what is the value of 3w will equal 12k is equal to 100 or now you divide the entire equation by 4 so you are going to get m plus 3k is equal to 25 now let us try to enumerate all the different possibilities because we won't have a lot of possibilities over here if k is equal to 1 w is equal to 4k so that is equal to 4 and m is equal to 25 minus 3k which is 22 if k is equal to 2 w is equal to 8 and m is equal to 19 if k is equal to 3 w is equal to 12 and m is equal to 16 finally if k is equal to 4 w is equal to 16 and m is equal to 13 we don't need to go further because for all the values of k which are greater than or equal to 4 the value of w will be greater than the value of m but that is not allowed we know that m is greater than or equal to w so this is not possible even the first and the second cases are not possible because we know that 2w has to be greater than or equal to m in the first case w is equal to 4 so 2w is equal to 8 but that is less than 22 similarly in the second case w is equal to 8 and m is equal to 19 so 2w will be 16 which is less than 19 so this is also not possible the only case which satisfies all the conditions is the third case in which case w is equal to 12 m is equal to 16 and in this case what will the value of c be c is equal to 100 minus w minus m so that is 100 minus 28 which is equal to 72 and we are supposed to calculate the difference between men and women that is m minus w which is 16 minus 12 which is equal to 4. In this question we are told that one part of a hostel's expense is fixed while the other is proportional to the number of its borders. So the expense of a hostel is fixed let us call the fixed portion to be equal to f plus a proportionality constant k into n okay where n is the number of borders as the number of borders increases the variable expense also increases proportionally and the fixed cost will remain the same which is f the revenue that it generates per border is the same it is 1600 so the revenue is 1600 n so the total profit that it makes will be equal to 1600 n which is the total revenue minus f minus k n so the profit per border which is the information that is given to us will be equal to this total profit divided by n so this will be 1600 minus k minus f divided by n we are given the profit per border when the number of borders is 50 we are also given the profit per border when the number of borders is 75 so when the number of borders is 50 the profit per border will be 1600 minus k minus f divided by 50 this we are told is equal to 200 and when the number of borders is 75 the profit per border will be 1600 minus k minus f by 75 this we are told is 250 so if you subtract the first equation from the second equation we are going to get that f by 50 minus f by 75 is equal to 250 minus 200 which is 50 f by 50 minus f by 75 is f by 150 f by 150 is 50 or the value of f is equal to 7500 now we can calculate the value of k also 
what is 1600 minus k? In the first equation, you can substitute the value of f in any one of the two equations. If you are substituting it in the first equation, 1600 minus k minus f by 50, that is 7500 divided by 50 is 150 is equal to 200 or the value of k is 1250. We are asked to calculate the total profit when the number of borders is 50. The total profit is 1600n minus f minus kn or the total profit when n is equal to 80 will be equal to n into 1600 minus what is f 7500 minus kn k is 1250 minus 1250 n or simplifying it this is 350 into n minus 7500 what is the value of n the value of n is 80 so this is 350 into 80 minus 7500 350 into 80 is 28000 minus 7500 so the total profit will be 20500 in this question we are told that x is a real number such that log of 5 to the base 3 is equal to log of x plus 2 to the base 5 and we are required to find out an interval between within which x will lie. So let us first understand how log 5 to the base 3 what is the actual value of this. We know that log 5 to the base 3 will be greater than log of 3 to the base 3. Why is this greater than log 3 to the base 3 because 5 is greater than 3 and what is the value of log 3 to the base 3 this is equal to 1. We also know that log of 5 to the base 3 is less than log of 9 to the base 3. Why is this the case? Because 5 is less than 9. And what is the value of log 9 to the base 3? It is equal to 2. So we know that the left hand side that is log 5 to the base 3 lies between 1 and 2. Therefore, log of x plus 2 to the base 5 also lies between 1 and 2. So now let us uh, raise the, we will eliminate the base. So we know that x plus 2 will therefore lie between 5 to the power 1 and 5 to the power 2 or x plus 2 has to lie between 5 and 25. Now subtracting my, uh, 2 from all the sides, we know that 3 has to be less than x which is less than 23. Now this is something that we know for sure. And there is only one option which actually satisfies it, which is option D. So the correct answer is option D. In this question, it is given that there are two circles. The radius of each of the circles is 4 centimeters. So let us first draw both the circles. They are touching each other. They touch each other externally. Each of the two circles is again touched externally by a third circle. If these three circles have a common tangent, so as there is a circle which is touching these two circles externally and there is a common tangent, let us assume that this is the common tangent and this is how the circles look like. Now we are told that uh, the radius of the bigger circles is 4 centimeters. So this is 4 and this is 4. We are required to find out the radius of the smaller circle. Let us assume that the radius of the smaller circle is r. Now first thing you should do whenever you have uh, circles which are touching each other is to join the centers. This won't work always but this works most of the times because you know immediately that uh, the distance between the two centers is the sum of the radius of the circles. So first thing we will do is connect all the circles, all the centers of the three circles. So you will get a nice triangle. The We know the sides of the triangle. The sides of the triangle are for example if you name uh, the first uh, center as A the second center as B for triangle ABC you know that AB is equal to 4 plus 4 this is equal to 8 centimeters whenever there are two circles which are touching each other the distance between the centers is the sum of the radii similarly AC is equal to 4 plus R here we are assuming that the radius of the smaller circle is R and we need to find out the value of R and the length of BC is also equal to 4 plus R we know this. Now what we will do is, we will connect, if you just look at the triangle ABC here, ABC is an isosceles triangle because AC is equal to BC. This is A, this is B and this is C. We will connect C, we will draw a perpendicular from C to AB. 
Now the length of say if this is touching at D, the length of CD is equal to 4 minus R. Why is this equal to 4 minus R? Because the length of uh, D and say this point is E, the length of D is also equal to 4 because D is parallel to A, F is parallel to B, G. Because all these three lines are parallel, they are basically uh, parts of rectangles. So we know that D is equal to 4 and the value of uh, C E that is from the center of the smaller circle to the tangent is R. So the length of C D which is basically the height of the isosceles triangle is equal to 4 minus R. So we know that this is equal to 4 minus R. We know that A C is equal to 4 plus R over here. We know that B C is equal to 4 plus R over here and we know that A B is equal to 4. So basically B D is equal to 4 and A D is equal to 4. Now using this you can easily calculate the length of R. How can we do this? If you consider any one of the uh, triangles say A C D this is a right angle triangle where 4 plus r is the hypotenuse and the two sides are 4 and 4 minus r. So in triangle ACD which is a right angle triangle AC square is equal to CD square plus AD square. AC square is 4 plus r square is equal to CD square is 4 minus r square plus AD square is 4 square. You can simplify this as 16 plus 8R plus R square is equal to 16 minus 8R plus R square plus 16. You can simplify this, you can cancel the common terms and you will get 16R is equal to 16 or R is equal to 1. To solve this question, the first thing we did was connect the centers of all the circles. Then figure out that uh, the centers of the circles form an isosceles triangle. Then we found out that the height of the isosceles triangle is 4 minus r. Once we found that uh, solving for r is very simple and in this case r will equal 1. In this question it is given that x, y and z are 3 positive real numbers such that x to the power log 7 to the base 4 is 64, y to the power log 11 to the base 9 is 81 and z to the power log 25 to the base 17 is square root of 17. And we are asked to find out the sum of x to the power log 7 to the base 4 whole square plus y to the power log 11 to the base 9 whole square plus z to the power log 25 to the base 17 whole square. So if you are looking at the first term of the expression x to the power log of 7 to the base 4 whole square this is equal to x to the power log of 7 to the base 4 whole to the power log of 7 to the base 4. We are already given the value of x to the power log 7 to the base 4 that is equal to 64. So the first term of the given expression will be of the form 64 to the power log of 7 to the base 4. But 64 can be written as 4 cube. So this is equal to 4 cube that is 4 to the power 3 times log of 7 to the base 4. This is equal to 4 to the power log of 7 cube to the base 4. We know a theorem in logarithms which says that a to the power log of b to the base a is equal to a is equal to b. That is you can cancel logarithm of uh, to the base a in the exponent with the base a itself. In the same way over here we have the base to be equal to 4 and the base of the logarithm is also equal to 4. So this term will be equal to 7 cube which is equal to 343. So the first term is equal to 343. What is the value of the second term? That is equal to y to the power log of 11 to the base 9 whole square. Square is in the exponent. So this is equal to y to the power log of 11 to the base 9 whole to the power log of 11 to the base 9. We again know the value of y to the power log 11 to the base 9 that is given as equal to 81. So this is equal to 81 to the power log of 11 to the base 9. You can again express 81 as 9 square. So this will become equal to 9 to the power 2 times log of 11 to the base 9 which is equal to 9 to the power log of 11 square that is 121 to the base 9. Again we use the same formula which is that a to the power of log of b to the base a is equal to b. So this will equal 121. 
or the second term is equal to 121 the first term is equal to 343 similarly we can find out the value of the third term the value of the third term is z to the power log of 25 to the base 17 whole square this is equal to z to the power log of 25 to the base 17 whole to the power log of 25 to the base 17 the term in the bracket is equal to square root of 17 so this is equal to square root of 17 to the power log of 25 to the base 17 square root of 17 can be written as 17 to the power of half this is equal to 17 to the power of half into log of 25 to the base 17 this is equal to 17 to the power log of square root of 25 is 5 5 to the base 17 we can again cancel 17 and log to the base 17 so this will equal 5 so the value of the third term is equal to 5 so the sum of the expression is 343 plus 121 plus 5 343 plus 121 is 464 plus 5 is equal to 469 so the answer to this question is 469In this question we are told that there is a right angle triangle ABC so this is 90 degrees in which a circle is drawn with the center O which is located on the side AB such that AC and BC are its tangents. Now so it looks something like this the center is O when you connect O to B B is a tangent BC is a tangent and you AC is also a tangent so you will connect O to a point D where the line AC touches uh, the circle. So OD will be 90 degrees because when you connect the center to the point at which the tangent touches the circle, the tangent and that line will be perpendicular. Now we are told that AO is to BO is equal to 25 is to 24. So let us assume that AO is 25x, therefore BO will be 24x, therefore the radius of the triangle is 24x which is also OD so this will also be 24x. Now we are told that the length of the perimeter is 392, we are required to calculate the length of AC. So we will first calculate the lengths of the other two sides BC and AC in terms of X. Once we get that we will calculate the perimeter of the triangle in terms of X by just adding AB plus BC plus AC, we will calculate the value of X and from that we can easily calculate the length of AC. So how do we find out the length of the other uh, sides, first we will assume that let the angle a b equal to theta. Now using Pythagoras theorem because A O D is also a right angle triangle we know the hypotenuse that is equal to 25 x and we know one of the sides that is equal to 24 x so we can easily calculate the length of A D. A D square will be 25 x whole square minus 24 x whole square. So this will be 625 x square minus 576 x square this is equal to 49x square so AD is equal to 7x so this is 7x once we calculate the uh, length of uh, AD we can easily calculate the length of sin theta cos theta and tan theta for example in this case cos theta is equal to the adjacent side by hypotenuse that is 7x divided by 25x so this is 7 by 25 similarly sin theta will be the opposite side in this case 24x divided by the hypotenuse that is 25x so this is 24 by 25 and similarly tan theta will be sin theta by cos theta which is equal to 24 by 7. Why are we using this because we know that angle A is also part of the larger right angle triangle which is ABC. So if you are considering the triangle ABC sin theta or for example if you are looking at tan theta tan theta is equal to opposite side that is BC divided by adjacent side that is AB. So this we are told is 24 by 7. So BC will be equal to the length of AB is 25x plus 24x that is 49x. So 49x into 24 by 7. So this is 7x. So BC is equal to 24 into 7x which is 168x. AB by AC is equal to cos theta. This is equal to 7 by 25. Therefore AC will be equal to 
AB into 25 by 7. Again, AB is 49x. So, this is 49x into 25 by 7. This is 7x. So, that is 25 into 7x. This is equal to 175x. So, now you know the sides of the triangle in terms of x. This is 175x. This is 168x. And uh, AB is 49x. So, the sum is 165 plus 178. That is 350 minus 7. So, that is 343x plus 49x. So, the perimeter of the triangle is 392x when you are calculating it in terms of x. But we are told that the perimeter is 392 centimeters. Therefore, 392x is 392 centimeters or x is equal to 1. Now, we are required to find out the length of AC. The length of AC is 175x, which will be equal to 175 centimeters. In this question, it is given that humans and robots can perform a job at different efficiencies. 15 humans plus 5 robots can, uh, working together, take 30 days to finish the job. So, if uh, 15 humans plus 5 robots work, they take 30 days. Similarly, 5 humans plus 15 robots working together take 60 days. That is 5 humans plus 15 robots take 60 days to finish it. How many days will 15 humans working together without any robot take to finish the work? So, we are required to find out how many days 15 humans alone will take to finish the job. So, because uh, we have 30 days and 60 days on the right hand side, let us try to assume that the total work is a certain number of units. Because it is 30 and 60, let us try to take the LCM of 30 and 60 which is 60. So, let the total work be equal to 60 units. Why 60? Because we just want uh, calculations to be simpler and because there is 30 and 60, we are taking the LCM of the two. So, 15 humans plus 5 robots finish 60 units of uh, work in 30 days. So, in one day, 15 humans plus 5 robots finish 2 units of work. Similarly, in one day, 5 humans plus 15 robots will finish in 60 days they are finishing 60 units of work so in one day they finish one unit of work now solving these two equations we will find out the value of h and r which is the number of units of work one human does in a day and the number of units of work that one robot will do in a day then we will find out how much work 15 humans will do in one day and using that we will calculate the number of days required to finish this job so, it is quite simple whenever you see that uh, the coefficients are symmetrical that is this is 15h and 5r and 5h and 15r the first thing you should do is add both of them up. So, if you add both these equations you will get 20h plus 20r is equal to 3. Now, you can easily simplify this that h plus r is equal to 3 by 20. Now, using this you can easily calculate the value of h and r because we need the value of h only let us try to use the first equation. So, we will multiply the third equation with 5. So, we will get 5h plus 5r is equal to 3 by 20 into 5. So, this becomes 3 by 4. Now, if you look at the first equation, it is 15h plus 5r is equal to 2. Now, you can subtract the first equation, the third equation basically this equation from this equation. So, 1 minus 3 will be imply that 10h is equal to 2 minus 3 by 4. 2 minus 3 by 4 if you simplify will be 5 by 4 or h is equal to 5 by 4 by 10. So, 5 by 4 by 10 will equal 1 by 8. So, one human will do 1 by 8 unit of work in one single day. So, 15 humans will do 15 by 8 units of work in one day. Now, the total work is 60 units. So, how much time will they take? They will take 60 divided by 15 by 8. So, this will be 60 into 8 by 15. 60 by 15 is 4. So, this will be 32 days.
So if only 15 humans work without any robo, they are going to take 32 days to finish the work. In this question, we have three people, Amala, Bina and Gauri. They invest money in the ratio 3 is to 4 is to 5 in fixed deposits. So again, let us draw the table, Amala, Bina and Gauri. They invest fixed deposits in the ratio, the principals are in the ratio 3 is to 4 is to 5. And the respective annual interest rate is in the ratio 6 is to 5 is to 4. So this is the annual interest rate. And this is the rate and this is the principal. What is the total interest income in rupees after a year if Bina's interest exceeds Amala's interest by 250? So let us first calculate the respective interest of each one of them. So this will be 3 into 6 because the time is 1 year. 3 into 6 is 18. 4 into 5 is 20. And 5 into 4 is 20. Now Bina's interest that is 20 exceeds 18. You can assume that these are all proportions. These are not the exact values. So this will be 18k, 20k and 20k. So 20k is Bina's interest minus 18k which is Amala's interest is equal to 250. This is given to us. That is 2k is equal to 250 or k is equal to 125. We are required to find out their total interest income. The total interest income will be 18k plus 20k this is Bina's income plus Gauri's interest income which is 20k. This will be equal to 40 plus 18 is 58k. Now we need to calculate the value of 58k. We have already found out that the value of k is 125. So the answer will be 58 into 125. You can use your calculator to find this out. This will be 7250. This is the answer. We at Traku provide all the previous year CAT papers along with many other MBA examinations such as IIFT, ZAT, SNAP, MAT, CMAT, TIS and PGDBA in the actual exam format. You can attempt them as a test and get a detailed analysis of your performance or download them as PDFs. In this question it is given that there is a tank and it has two tabs attached to it. Tab A fills the tank in 10 hours and tab B empties the tank in 12 hours. So to make calculations easy, let us first find out the LCM of 10 and 12. The LCM of 10 and 12 is 60. So let us assume that the volume of the tank is a multiple of 60 because uh, there in this question we need to look at uh, different minutes. Let us assume that the volume of the tank is 60 into 60 which is equal to 3600. We just chose a big number which is a big multiple of 60 because we want to make calculations easy when we are calculating how much water is filled in by A and B per minute. So tap A fills the tank in 10 hours. The volume of the tank we assumed is equal to 3600 liters. So every hour tap A fills in 360 liters. This is per hour. Therefore every minute tap A fills in 6 liters. Similarly, if you are looking at tab B, it will empty 5 liters every minute. Because it takes 12 hours to empty 3600 liters, every hour it is emptying 300 liters or every minute it is emptying 5, uh, 5 liters. Now both the tabs are not open at the same time. Both the tabs follow a different cycle of opening and closing. If you look at the opening and closing schedule of both the tabs, let us draw a line so that it makes things easy to understand. Tab A follows a cycle of 30 minutes of opening and 30 minutes of closing. So if you are looking at A, it follows 30 minutes of opening and 30 minutes of closing. That is, it has a cycle of 1 hour. Tab B follows a cycle of 45 minutes of opening plus 45 minutes of closing. That is, its uh, cycle is for 1.5 hours. Therefore, if you are looking at A and B together, their cycle goes on for 3 hours, which is the LCM of 1 and 1.5 hours. First A will open and close for 30 minutes each, so that is for 1 hour. B will do the same for 1 and a half hour and they keep on repeating and as a whole the two uh, uh, pipes A and B repeat this cycle for 3 hours, after every 3 hours. So the first 30 minutes, both A and B are open 
and after 30 minutes A is closed but B continues to be open for another, 40, uh, another 15 minutes. After 45 minutes B is closed and A is also already closed. So both the taps are closed till 60 minutes and after 60 minutes A is open again and A remains open till 90 minutes. At this point only A is open and after 90 minutes A closes and then B opens and only B is open till 120 minutes because another 30 minutes have passed now both uh, A also gets open and A and B will be open for 15 minutes so this is 135 after which B is closed and A remains open for another 15 minutes this is at 150 and after 150 minutes both of them are closed for the next 30 minutes and after 180 minutes again as we have discussed the cycle restarts so this cycle continues after every 3 hours now let us try to understand how much water is filled in in each of these intervals in the first if uh, in an interval a plus b both of them are open the effective water that is filled in per minute is only 1 liter because a fills in 6 liters per minute and b empties 5 liters per minute if only a is open then the amount of water that is filled in is 6 liters and if only b is open the amount of water that is emptied out is minus 5 liters basically 5 liters are emptied out so if you're looking at how much water is filled in in this 3 hour cycle if you're looking at the first cycle after 30 minutes the water that is filled into the tank is plus 30 from 30 at 30 minutes the tank has 30 liters of water and b empties 5 liters every minute so after the first 6 minutes the tank is empty so even though b is open from 36 to 45 it doesn't do anything but in a normal cycle if you think that uh, some water has already been accumulated the amount of water that is emptied out by b in these 15 minutes will be minus 75 this will not hold true for the first cycle because after 36 minutes that is after 6 minutes the tank becomes empty but after uh, they continue for this, uh, some uh, period of time where some water has already accumulated into the tank in these 15 minutes b will empty 75 liters from 45 to 60 minutes nobody is working so there is nothing uh, that changes over here from 60 to 90 minutes where uh, 30 minutes have passed and only a is open the amount of water that is filled in is 6 into 30 which is plus 180 from 90 to 120 the amount of water that is emptied out of the tank by b will be 30 into minus 5 so this is minus 150 from 120 to 135 that is for 15 minutes both the taps are open so they will only fill 1 liter per minute or in 15 minutes they will fill 15 liters from 135 to 150 that is for 15 minutes only a is open so in this in those 15 minutes it is going to fill in plus 90 liters so overall in a normal cycle other than the first cycle the amount of water that is filled in by these taps in a, uh, in a matter of 3 hours will be plus 30 minus 75 plus 180 minus 150 plus 15 plus 90 if you calculate it this is going to be 180 minus 150 is 30 plus 30 is 60 60 plus 15 is 75 minus 75 is 0 so effectively it is only the last 90 liters that is filled in by the by both the taps so in 3 hours they fill in 90 liters we assume that the overall volume of the tank is 360 liters so if you are looking for what is the total time that it takes for these uh, taps to fill in the water you can normally assume this to be equal to 3600 divided by 90 into 3 so you will get this to be around say 120 liters 120 hours which is basically the total volume 3600 divided by 90 into 3 but in this particular case that won't hold true because they are not filling volume uh, they are not filling water into the tank in a uniform manner first a is filling then uh, a is closed then b is filling so they are not following a straight line of filling water into the tank they are following some sort of a zigzag uh, method to fill water into the tank so we'll have to be very careful about the extreme uh, values that is what happens in the first uh, cycle what happens in the last cycle those are uh, values that we have to be very careful because they are not filling water in a uniform manner if you're looking at the first cycle in the first cycle plus 30 liters is filled uh, by a and b as we have discussed earlier but after 36 minutes that is after six minutes when b alone is open the tank becomes empty then b will not be doing any work it will remain idle so at the end of 60 minutes the total vol water that is filled into the tank is zero the tank is essentially empty earlier we have assumed in a normal situation that uh, 
After 60 minutes, the effective change in the water level would be 30 minus 40, uh, 75, which is minus 45. But in the first case, that would not be true because the effective change will be zero because the tank will just be empty. And after 90 minutes, it will be plus 180. After 120 minutes, it is going to be minus 150. And again, everything else remains the same. So after the first uh, cycle, after the first three hours, the amount of water that is filled into the tank is 180 minus 150, that is 30 plus 15, so that is 45, plus 90, so that is equal to 135. So after the first three hours, 135 liters are filled in. The next three hours fill in 90. The next three hours fill in another 90. And this continues for some time. We will assume that because we need to fill in a total of 3,600 liters. We have already filled in 135 liters. So the remaining water that needs to be filled in is 3, 4, 6, 5 liters after the first cycle has finished. So let us assume that uh, the 90 liter cycle of 3 hours continues for say 37 times. So 37 into 3 hours is 111 hours. We are just getting the total volume that is filled to be close to 3600. Then we will again manually see how much water is filled in. Again just to reiterate the reason we are doing it is because the water is filled, being filled in in a zigzag manner. It is not being filled in in a straight line manner where we can just use ratio and proportion. So after 37 of these cycles, the total amount of water that is filled into the tank is 135 which is filled in in the first 3 hours plus 37 into 3 which is another 111 hours and in this 37 uh, cycles, the amount of water that is filled in is 37 into 90, this is equal to 3330 or the total amount of water that is filled into the tank after 114 hours in total is 3330 plus 135 which is equal to 3465. We still need to fill in another 135 liters. Now let us look at what will happen after the first 30 minutes. After another 0 0.5 hours, 30 liters are filled in. So the total volume in the tank is 3495. After another 15 minutes, 75 liters are emptied. So after another 0 0.25 hours, the volume in the tank will be 3495 minus 75. So that is 3420. Then the tank is empty for 15 minutes, so another 0.25, nothing happens. The tank, uh, the water level doesn't change because both A and B are not opening. In the next 30 minutes, only A is open and A fills in 180 liters. So after another 0.5 hours, from 3420, you add another 180, so the water level becomes 3600. So at this point, the tank is completely full. So how much time has elapsed? It is 114 plus 5, no, plus 0 0.5, so 114.05 plus 0 0.25, 0 0.25 and 0 0.5 is another 1 hour. So the total time it takes is 115.5 hours. In this question, we are uh, asked to find out the number of ordered pairs A and B such that modulus of A into B is equal to modulus of A plus modulus of B plus 72 when we are told that A and B are integers. So whenever you see this kind of a question, the first thing that you should remember is if you are finding the product of A and B and A plus B and we are told that A and B are integers, we should try to factorize it. So in this case, what we will do is first again because we are uh, all these have modulus in it, we will assume that modulus of A is equal to capital X and modulus of B is equal to capital Y. Once we find out the number of values that X and Y can have, we can easily figure out the number of values for A and B. In this case, it will just help us simplify things without getting confused. So the given equation will transform itself into x into y is equal to x plus y plus 72. Now we are told that x and y are integers. In this case, x and y will be whole numbers because they are modulus of a and modulus of b. And we are given the product of x, y and two constant x and y. So we will try to factorize it and we will keep the constant term on the other side. Then we can find out the number of integers that will satisfy this kind of equation. So if you bring all the terms which contain x and y to one side, xy minus x minus y is equal to 72. Now you should understand and with some practice you will figure out that to factorize this we will add 1 on both sides. So the left hand side will become x minus 1 into y minus 1 is equal to 73. Now there are different ways if the terms over here are not x and y, if there are say 4x and 5y. So for example if the given sum becomes xy minus 4x minus 5y 
then you have to add the product of 4 and 5 that is you have to add plus 20 so then it will become x minus 5 into y minus 4 is equal to something plus 20 so water is the coefficient of x and water is the coefficient of y multiply them and add them that way you can factorize it in this case the coefficient of x and y are minus 1 so we add 1 to both sides so as you know that x and y are uh, whole numbers in this case and 73 is a prime number it is quite easy to find out the different permutations of x and y which will satisfy this equation so because 73 is a prime number you want either x minus y to equal 73 and y minus 1 to equal 1 or you want x minus 1 to equal 1 and y minus 1 to equal 73 these are the only two possibilities because 73 has no other divisors other than 1 and 73 so you have that there are two possibilities over here either x is equal to 74 and y is equal to 2 or the other way around where x is equal to 2 and y is equal to 74 now remember that modulus of a is equal to x and modulus of b is equal to y so in this case we have modulus of a is equal to 74 and modulus of b is equal to 2 or the other way around where modulus of a is equal to 2 and modulus of b is equal to 74 this is the first case and this is the second case now in the first case clearly there are two four possibilities the four possibilities in the first case are that a is equal to 74 and b is equal to 2 or a is equal to 74 and b is equal to minus 2 or a is equal to minus 74 and b is equal to 2 or a is equal to minus 74 and b is equal to minus 2 these are the four possibilities in the first case similarly we will have four possibilities in the second case where a modulus of a is equal to 2 and modulus of b is equal to 74 the four possibilities are that a is equal to 2 and b is equal to 74 or a is equal to minus 2 and b is equal to 74 or a is equal to 2 and b is equal to minus 74 or a is equal to minus 2 and b is equal to minus 74 so again there are four possibilities so the total number of ordered pairs for a and b is 8 remember that once you are able to factorize it once you are able to understand that we have to factorize x and y into x minus 1 to y minus 1 and equal 73 because 73 is a prime number solving it and finding the number of ordered pairs is very easy also remember that whenever you get an equation which involves x y and constants uh, involving x and y factorizing it is very simple just add whatever is the product of the coefficient of x and y and then you will be able to easily simplify this so anyway the answer in this case is 8. In this question we are given that AB is the diameter of a circle of radius 5 centimeters. Uh, let us first draw AB. So this is suppose this is a circle and we have this is A and this is B and AB is the diameter. The radius of the circle is given as 5 centimeters. So the length of AB because AB is the diameter is 10 centimeters. <coughs> P and Q are two points on the circle such that the length of PB is 6 centimeters. So suppose this is P, the length of PB is given as 6 centimeters. The length of AB is 10 and the length of AP is twice the length of AQ. So the length of AP we will first find out and before we get into the calculation of AP, we should know one simple thing that is if there is a diameter. Uh, of a circle and you connect both of them to any point on the circle it need not be any specific point it will always be a right angle so assuming that this is uh, say this is k and l this is the diameter if you connect uh, k and l to any point on the circle they will uh, form a right angle triangle so for example even this will be a right angle triangle any point on the circle when connected to the opposite ends of a diameter will always be a right angle <clears throat> this is a theorem which you can remember so in this case a p b will be a right angle triangle and the hypotenuse is 10 centimeters and one of the side is 6 centimeters therefore the length of a p will equal by Pythagoras theorem square root of 10 square minus 6 square again a very simple thing which most of you would already know is that in a right angle triangle if one of the side is a and the other side is b the side opposite the right angle triangle which is the hypotenuse it, uh, the formula is a square plus b square is equal to c square this is the Pythagoras theorem which is quite useful so using this formula we can calculate the length of AP this will be square root of 10 square minus 6 square 
this will be square root of 100 minus 36 which is equal to square root of 64 which is equal to 8 centimeters. So we know that the length of AP is 8 and the length of AP is twice the length of AQ. Therefore the length of AQ will be 8 by 2 which is equal to 4 centimeters. So suppose Q is a point somewhere over here such that this is AQ, this is 4 centimeters. Then the length in centimeters of QB is nearest to. So we need to find out the length of QB. Again uh, using the earlier theorem about uh, a diameter and subtending right angle triangle at the on any point on the circumference. Here AQB is also a right angle triangle and the hypotenuse is the same which is 10 centimeters. Here one of the side is 4 centimeters therefore the length of the other side will be square root of 10 square minus 4 square which is equal to square root of 100 minus 16 which is equal to square root of 84 this is the length of BQ and square root of 84 you can use a calculator to find out that this is something like 9.16 centimeters amongst the options that are given the only option which is closest to it is 9.1 so the answer in this case is 9.1 centimeters. In this question, we are required to find out the number of solutions of uh, the given equation x minus y minus z is equal to 25, where x, y and z are positive integers, that is their natural numbers, such that x is less than or equal to 40, y is less than or equal to 12, and z is less than or equal to 12. So let us first try to enumerate it. Let us first find out the, value, the number of solutions when x is exactly equal to 40. This is the higher bound for x. So when x is equal to 40, it would imply that y plus z is equal to 15 because x minus y minus z is equal to 25. We know that y and z are natural numbers that is their positive integers less than 12. So the possible values for y are 3, 4, 5, dot, dot, dot till 12. Notice that y cannot be 2 because in that case z will be 13 which is more than the upper bound. And y cannot exceed 12 because that is the highest uh, possible value for y. So the number of solutions for this is 1, 2, 3, dot, dot, dot till 10. So when x is equal to 40, the number of solutions for this equation is 10. Similarly, let us calculate it for x is equal to 39. In this case, y plus z equals 14. And y can equal 2, 3, 4 and up to 12. Notice that in this case y can be 2 because z will be 12 in that and 12 is the highest possible value. So in this case the number of possible solutions for the equation is 11. Let us calculate it for x is equal to 38. Then y plus z is equal to 13 and the possible values of y are 1, 2, 3 till 12. So all the possible values from 1 to 12 are allowed. In this case the total number of solutions for the equation is 12. Now notice that when x becomes 37, y plus z is equal to 12 and here y can go from 1 to, it can go only up to 11 because the moment y becomes 12, z has to equal 0 but that is not possible because all of them are positive integers. So the number of possible solutions is 11. We can continue further and you can then notice a pattern. When x becomes 36, y plus z will equal 11. So the possible values of y vary from 1 to dot 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 till only 10 here. So the number of possible solutions is 10. And as you keep decreasing x, the number of possible solutions also keep decreasing by 1. For example, in the case when x is equal to 26, x cannot equal 26. Suppose x is equal to 28. Then y plus z is equal to 3. So the possible values of y will be only 1 or 2. Then the number of uh, possibilities is only 2. And when x is equal to 27, which is the least possible value for x, y plus z will equal 2 and y has to equal 1. In this case, z will also have to equal 1 and that is the minimum possible value for both y and z. So in this case, the total number of possible solutions is 1. So if you are trying to calculate the total possible solutions for the equation, it has to be 10 plus 11 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 
dot 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 till 1. Now we know the summation of uh, 1 to 12. The summation for any natural number, the sum of uh, all the natural numbers which are less than or equal to a particular number n, we have the formula that is 1 plus 2 plus dot 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 till n is equal to n into n plus 1 by 2. So in this case 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus dot 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 till 12 will equal 12 into 13 by 2 which is equal to 13 into 6 which is 78 and 10 plus 11 is 21. So the total number of solutions is 78 plus 21 which is equal to 99. So the answer in this case is 99. In this question, the average of 30 integers is given as 5. So, the average of 30 integers is given as 5. Therefore, the total will equal 30 into 5 which is equal to 150. Now, among these 30 integers, there are exactly 20 integers which do not exceed 5. So, 20 integers are less than or equal to 5 and 10 integers are definitely greater than 5. Now what is the highest possible value of the average of these 20 integers? We are required to find out the highest average of these 20 integers. We will find out the highest possible sum of these 20 integers and then we will take it forward. Now because these 10 integers are greater than 5, all these 10 integers are greater than or equal to 6. So in order to maximize the sum of these 20 integers, we have to minimize the sum of the other 10 integers. Why should we minimize the sum of the other 10 integers? Because the sum of these 20 and these 10 integers is constant. We already know that it is 150. So in order to maximize the sum of the 20 integers, we will minimize the sum of the 10 integers, which are greater than 5. Now we know that all the 10 integers are greater than or equal to 6. So the minimum possible sum of the 10 integers which are greater than 5 is equal to 6 into 10 which is equal to 60. Therefore, the maximum possible sum of the 20 integers which are less than or equal to 5 is equal to 150 which is the total sum minus 60 which is equal to 90. Therefore, the maximum possible average is equal to 90 by 20 which is equal to 4.5. Remember that there are 20 integers. Their sum, maximum possible sum is 90. So their maximum possible average is 90 by 20, which is equal to 4.5. This is the answer. In this question, it is given that there is a tank which is emptied every day at a fixed time. Now, immediately after that, either pump A or pump B or both of them start working in filling this tank to the brim. Now, on Monday it is told that the uh, pipe A was only working, pump A, and it uh, finished filling the pipe pep tank at 8 p.m. So, let us assume that the tank is emptied at uh, x p.m. every day. On Monday, when pump A was working, the tank was full at 8 p.m. So, pump A alone took 8 minus x hours to fill the tank. On Tuesday, pump B was working alone, and it finished filling the tank at 6 p.m. So, on Tuesday, pump B worked from x pm to 6 pm. So, pump B was able to fill the tank in 6 minus x hours. On Wednesday, pump A worked till 5 pm and pump B worked from 5 to 7 pm. So, on Wednesday again, pump A started working and A filled the tank from x pm to 5 pm. And from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m., B filled the tank. So, A worked for 5 minus x hours and B worked for 2 hours. And again, the tank was filled. Now, we are required to find out if on Thursday, both the pumps start uh, filling the tank simultaneously from x p.m., when will the tank be filled? So, let us assume that A fills small a liters of water per hour and b fills small b liters of water per hour. Now the volume of the tank will be 8 minus x into small a because 
pump A was able to fill the tank when it uh, pumped for 8 minus x hours. This is also equal to 6 minus x into B. This is the number of hours that pump B filled the tank alone. This is also equal to 5 minus x into A plus 2B. So now we basically have different equations and we have to find out the relationship between the different variables. So let us first uh, equate the first equation and the third equation. You can solve it in any way you want. I am just using 1 and 3 and the reason I am doing that is because I want to eliminate the x into a product. So in this case 8 minus x into a is equal to 5 minus x into a plus 2b or 8a is equal to 5a plus 2b or 3a is equal to 2b or a is equal to 2 by 3b. Now let us uh, equate the first equation and the second equation. This is that 8 minus x into a is equal to 6 minus x into b. Now we know that a is equal to 2b by 3. So 8 minus x into 2b by 3 is equal to 6 minus x into b. So this when you simplify you are going to get 16 minus 2x is equal to 18 minus 3x or x is equal to 2. So every day the time at which the tank is emptied which is x is 2 pm. Now using this we can also calculate how much time it will take when both the pumps are filling uh, simultaneously. Now the volume of the tank will be 8 minus x into a. This is from either any of the equations if you use you are going to get the volume to be the same. Here you are going to get it in terms of a and we know that x is equal to 2 so this is equal to 6a. Now when a and b are filling the tank simultaneously they will be filling a plus b liters per hour. Now we know that b is equal to 3a by 2. So they will be filling 5a by 2 liters every hour. Now the total volume that they have to fill is 6a. So the time that they take will be 6a by 5a by 2. This if, I, if you simplify you are going to get 2.4 hours. So after the tank is emptied at x pm that is 2 pm they are going to take 2.4 hours. Uh, that is 2 hours and 0.4 hours will be 0.4 into 60 minutes. 0.4 into 60 minutes is equal to 24 minutes. So they are going to take 2 hours and 24 minutes to fill the tank and they start filling at x pm which is 2 pm. So finally they will fill at 4 pm and 24 minutes. So the answer in this case is 424. In this question we are told that Ankita buys 4 kgs of cashews, 14 kgs of peanuts and 6 kgs of almonds when the cost of 7 kgs of cashews that is 7c is equal to 30 kgs of peanuts that is this is equal to 30p this is equal to 9 kgs of almonds. To make things easy let us assume that 7c is equal to 30p is equal to 9a is equal to uh, what is the LCM of 7, 30 and 9 this is equal to 630. So let us assume that the cost of 7 kgs of cashews is equal to the cost of 30 kgs of peanuts is equal to the cost of 9 kgs of almonds and this is equal to 630x. So the cost of cashews will be 90x, the cost of peanuts will be 21x and the cost of almonds will be 70x. This would tell us what is the cost of 4 kgs of cashews plus 14 kgs of peanuts plus 6 kgs of almonds. 4c will be 360x plus 14p is 21 into 14 that is 294x plus 6a is 6 into 70x which is 420x. This is equal to 1074x. This is the total cost price. This is how much they spent and how much did they buy? The total weight that they bought is equal to 4 plus 14 plus 16 that is 24 kgs. Let the selling price of 1 kg of this nuts be S. So the total selling price of 24 kgs is 24S. So 24S is equal to 1074X. This is the total cost price plus 1752. This is what we are told. This is one equation. 
We are also told that if they sold this 24 kgs as 4 kgs at the selling price for 4s and the remaining 20 kgs they sold at a discount of 20%. So they sold this 20 kgs at 0.8s. So they would sell it at 16s. So the total selling price will be 4s plus 16s which is 20s. In this particular case we are told that the profit is only 744. This would immediately tell us that 4s is equal to 1008 or the value of s is 252. If the value of s is 252, we can calculate that 24s minus 1752 will be equal to 4296. This is equal to 1074x from this equation or the value of x is equal to 4. How much did he spend on purchasing almonds? 6 uh, kgs of almonds is what he purchased. He spent 420x because 1 kg of almonds is 70x. So the total money that he spent is 420x which is 420 into 4 which is equal to 1680. So the answer for this question is option A. In this question it is given that there are two cars, they travel from the same distance starting at 10 am and 11 am. So the first car starts at 10 am and the second car starts at 11 am. They reach the common destination at the same point of time. If the first car travelled for at least 6 hours, then the highest possible percentage by which the speed of the second car exceeds that of the first car is. So let us assume that the total distance that they travel is D. So both the cars travel D uh, distance. It is given that the first car travelled for at least 6 hours. So let us assume that the first car travelled for 6 plus P hours. P is greater than or equal to 0. So as the second car started 1 hour later but reached at the same time, the time uh, travelled by the second car will be 5 plus P. So this will be 1 hour lesser than the first car. Therefore the speed of the first car is D by P plus 6. And the speed of the second car is d by p plus 5. This is distance by time taken. Now we are required to find out the highest possible percentage by which the speed of the second car exceeds the speed of the first car. Let us first find out the percentage and then we will try to maximize it. So the percentage will be d by p plus 5 minus d by p plus 6 by d by p plus 6. This is just by applying the formula for the percentage. So this will be, we can cancel D from all the numerator and denominator. So this will be 1 by P plus 5 minus 1 by P plus 6 by 1 by P plus 6. If you simplify this, you are going to get this as 1 by P plus 5. That is because the numerator in this case will be 1 by P plus 5 into P plus 6 and the denominator is 1 by P plus 6. So you can cancel 1 by P plus 6 from numerator and denominator. So the required percentage is 1 by p plus 5 and we are required to find out the highest possible value for this. So the highest possible value for 1 by p plus 5 will be when p is equal to 0 and the fraction will equal 1 by 5. As we are supposed to find out uh, the value in terms of percentage, this will be 1 by 5 into 100 which is equal to 20%. So the answer that you are looking for is 20%. In this question it is given that there is a tournament in which there are 43 junior level and 51 senior level participants. So there are 43 junior level participants and 51 senior level participants. Each pair of juniors play one match, each pair of seniors play one match. So basically the 43 juniors play matches uh, with amongst themselves and the number of matches that they will play will be 43C2. Basically you will have to select two juniors amongst 43. Similarly, the number of matches that the seniors will play will be 51 C2. There is no junior versus senior match. So they don't play matches against each other. They only play amongst their own groups. The number of girl versus girl matches in junior level is 153. While the number of boy versus boy match in senior level is 276. The number of matches a boy plays against a girl is. So let us assume that in this junior level there are small g number of girls and small b number of boys. So G plus B is 43. Similarly in the senior level let us assume that there is capital G girls and capital B boys. 
in this case capital G plus capital B is equal to 51. What is given in the question is that the number of girl versus girl matches in junior level is 153. That is small g c2 is 153 on g into g minus 1 by 2 is equal to 153 or g into g minus 1 is equal to 153 into 2 which is equal to 306. You can solve for this. You can easily get the answer of g as equal to 18. There are multiple ways in which you can solve this. One of the ways that I would assume to calculate the answer quite easily is that notice that g into g minus 1 is increasing. That is as the value of g increases, g into g minus 1 will increase and this is close to 306 which is close to 17 square that is 289. So I would look around for uh, answers, I look around for numbers between around 17 and you can figure out that if you substitute g is equal to 18, you are going to get the answer. So this value of small g is equal to 18. Similarly, we are even given that the number of boy versus boy matches in senior level is 276. That is capital B C2 is equal to 276 or B into B minus 1 by 2 is equal to 276 or B into B minus 1 is equal to 276 into 2. This is equal to 552. Again, you can uh, use multiple ways to calculate it. You can expand it as a quadratic equation to solve it. But again, you will understand that uh, the value for B that you are going to get is 24. How, I, how did I arrive at this? Because 552 is close to 576. Now, if you do rough trail and error, you can figure out that when B is equal to 24, B into B minus 1 is 552, which is solved. So, the number of the value of capital B is 24, the value of small g is 18. Using this, we can calculate the value of small b. The value of small b will be 43, which is the total number of juniors, minus the number of girls, that is 18. So, 43 minus 18 is 25. Similarly, the value of uh, capital B is 24. Therefore, the value of small g will be, capital G will be 51, which is the total number of seniors, minus 24, which is the number of boys. So, this will equal 27. Now, when you are required to find out the number of matches a boy plays against a girl, we will find out the number of matches in junior level and the number of matches in senior level and then sum them up. As there are 25 boys and 18 girls, the number of matches between them will be 25 into 18. 25 into 18, if you calculate, will be 450. Similarly, the number of boy versus uh, girl matches in senior level will be 24 into 27. You can again calculate this. This will be 108 into 6. This will be 648. So, this is 648 in senior level and 450 in junior level. So, the total number of boy versus girl matches will be 648 plus 450. This if you sum it up will be 1098. Now, suppose k is an integer such that the equation 2x square plus kx plus 5 has no real roots. If you have a quadratic equation which is of the form ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0, this equation has no real roots if the discriminant is less than 0. What is the discriminant of this uh, quadratic equation? The discriminant is equal to b square minus 4ac, the discriminant d. So, if d is less than 0, this will have no real roots. If d is equal to 0, then the roots will be real and equal or essentially it will have one real root. If d is greater than 0, it will have two distinct real roots. In this particular case, we are told that 2x square plus kx plus 5 has no real roots. That is the discriminant is less than 0. That would imply that k square minus 4 into 2 into 5 is less than 0 or k square is less than 40. If k square is less than 40 and k is an integer, what are the values that k can take? k will be either minus 6 or minus 5 or minus 4 or minus 3 or minus 2 or minus 1 or it will be 0 or it will be 6 or 5 or 4 or 3 or 2 or 1. We are also told that the second equation x square plus k minus 5x plus 1 has two distinct real roots that is the third case. Here the discriminant is greater than 0. 
So k minus 5 whole square is greater than 4. This can be simplified. This will be k square minus 10x plus 25 is greater than 4 or k square minus 10x plus 21 is greater than 0 or this is k minus 7 into k minus 3 is greater than 0. So either k is less than 3 or k is greater than 7. Which of these values satisfies k either being less than 3 or k being greater than 7? These four values do not satisfy it because they lie between 3 and 7. The values which satisfy it are 1, 2, 0 and minus 6, minus 5, minus 4, minus 3, minus 2 and minus 1. So the total number of such values is 6 plus 1 plus 2 which is 9. That is option A. Google search Kraku cat formulas PDF. Click on the first link. You will get a list of topics for cat. Click on one of the topics. Download the PDF to get a list of formulas for the topic. In this question, we are told that a company publishes to its customers that at a certain compound interest rate, a sum of money deposited by anyone will become 8 times in 3 years. Now, if the same amount is deposited at the same compound interest rate, after how many years will it become 16 times? So, let us assume that the initial uh, principal is P and the rate of interest is R. So, the information tells us that at the end of 3 years, the amount becomes equal to 8P. That is 8P is equal to P into 1 plus R by 100 whole cube. You can simplify this, you can cancel P on both sides. So, 1 plus R by 100 whole cube is equal to 8 or 1 plus R by 100 is equal to cube root of 8 which is equal to 2 or R by 100 is equal to 1. That is the rate of interest is equal to 100%. What we are told is that we have to calculate after how many years will it become 16 times. So let us assume that it becomes 16 times after say t years. So p into 1 plus R by 100 whole to the power t is equal to 16p. As we have found out earlier, R is equal to 100%. So 1 plus R by 100 is equal to 2. So P into 2 to the power T is equal to 16P. You can cancel P on both sides. So the value of T will become equal to 4 because 2 to the power 4 is equal to 16. So the correct answer is 4 years. In this question, we are given two equations. 5.55 to the power of x is equal to 0.555 to the power y is equal to 1000. Now, once this is given, we are required to find out the value of 1 by x minus 1 by y. So, the two equations we are given are similar to each other. 5.55 to the power x is equal to 1000 and 0.555 to the power of y is equal to 1000. We will take logarithm on both the sides. Therefore, x is equal to logarithm of 1000 to the base 5.55 and y is equal to log of 1000 to the base 0 0.555. We are required to find out 1 by x minus 1 by y. So, we will find out that 1 by x is equal to log of 5.55 to the base 1000 and 1 by y is equal to log of 0 0.555 to the base 1000. For beginners, there is a very simple theorem on logarithms which is that if x is equal to log of a to the base b, then 1 by x is equal to log of b to the base a. We have just used this formula twice in both the equations. Now we will uh, subtract 1 by x minus 1 by y is equal to log of 5.55 to the base 1000 minus log of 0 0.555 to the base 1000. This will equal log of 5.55 by 0 0.555 to the base 1000. This is another simple formula which is that if x is equal to log of a to the base c minus log of b to the base c then x will equal log of, notice that the base in both the cases are is the same, then this will equal a by b to the base c, which is what we have used here. The corollary is that if uh, x is equal to log of a to the base c 
plus log of b to the base c then x will equal log of a into b to the base c notice again that the base has to be same in both the cases anyway using the earlier formula we will get uh, 1 by x minus 1 by y is equal to log of 5.55 by 0 0.555 to the base 1000 this will equal log of 10 to the base 1000 now we can easily find out that 1000 is equal to 10 cube therefore the value of this logarithm will equal 1 by 3 the, therefore the answer that we are looking for is 1 by 3 1 by x minus 1 by y when simplified you are going to get a value of 1 by 3. In this question we are given that ABC is a right angle triangle with hypotenuse BC of length 20 centimeters. So let us assume that this is the right angle triangle A sorry this is B a and C. We know that BC is the hypotenuse and the length of BC is given to be 21, 20 centimeters. Now we are told that AP is a perpendicular on BC from A. So this is a perpendicular. Now the maximum possible length of AP is equal to, we are required to find out the maximum value of AP. So let us assume that the length of AP is equal to R. We will try to find out a function, a, the value of R as term uh, as an expression and then try to maximize the value of that expression. So let us start off by think, uh, assuming that the length of AB is equal to x, the length of AC is equal to y, the length of BP is equal to z. Now if BP is equal to z, the length of PC will be 20 minus z. Why would it be 20 minus z? Because we know that the length of BC is equal to 20. So we are just subtracting z from 20. Now we will use Pythagoras theorem multiple times that is uh, in triangle a b p x square here x is the hypotenuse is equal to r square plus z square similarly in triangle a p c y is the hypotenuse so y square is equal to r square plus 20 minus z whole square now remember that a b c itself is a right angle triangle so in triangle a b c x square plus y square is equal to 20 square where 20 is the length of the hypotenuse so if you add the first equation and the second equation we will get a term x square plus y square using uh, substituting 20 square in term uh, in place of it we can eliminate both x and y so that is what we are going to do next so we will add 1 plus 2 that is these two equations so x square plus y square is equal to r square plus r square so that is equal to 2 r square plus z square plus 20 minus z whole square. So that will be z square plus 20 minus z whole square. Now x square plus y square is equal to 20 square. So we will substitute that. So 20 square is equal to 2 r square plus z square plus 20 square minus 40 z plus z square. This is just an expansion of 20 minus z whole square. Now we will cancel out the common terms that is 20 square. And we'll try to find out the value of r square. So 2 r square is equal to 40 z minus 2 z square. Or r square is equal to 20 z minus z square. Now we'll have to vary z. The value of z can vary from 0 to 20 and try to maximize r square. You can do this in multiple ways. One of the ways that I do most often is uh, by completing of squares. So 20 minus z whole square, I will add and subtract 100 from both sides. This is equal to 100 minus 100 plus 20z minus z square. The reason I am adding, adding and subtracting 100 is because I want to complete a perfect square. So here r square is equal to 100 minus z square minus 20z plus 100. This is equal to 100 minus z minus 10 whole square. This is the value of r square. So we know that r square is equal to 100 minus a perfect square. The value of a perfect square will be at least equal to 0. So the maximum value of r square will be 100 which will happen when z is equal to 10. So the maximum value of r is equal to square root of 100 which is equal to 10. 
this will happen when z is equal to 10 or ABC is an isosceles triangle and the perpendicular is actually a median which bisects the hypotenuse. Anyway, the answer that we are looking for is 10. The key to knowing this is knowing how to fill uh, a complete a square and using Pythagoras theorem multiple times. The answer is 10 centimeters. In this question, we are given a rectangle ABCD, a diagonal AC is drawn for the rectangle and a perpendicular is BA is drawn from the vertex B to the diagonal AC. Another perpendicular is drawn from the point E to AB which is F and we are given the lengths of the sides AB as 8 centimeters, this is 8 and the length of the side BC as 6 centimeters and we are required to find the length of BF, we should find what is this. Now, because these are rectangles and a lot of perpendiculars are drawn, let us assume that the value of uh, this angle, the angle CAB is equal to theta. The reason we are assuming this is equal to theta is because it looks like we can find out the values of all the other angles in the rectangle and find sin theta and cos theta and try to see if we can simplify the value of BF into one of these uh, numbers. So, if this is theta, this angle will be 90 minus theta and this angle EBC will become theta. Now, because this is theta, the value of EBF will be 90 minus theta and the value of FEB, this will become theta. We know these things because of the perpendiculars. We also know that because the two sides of the rectangle are 8 and 6, we know that the length of the diagonal is equal to square root of 6 square plus 8 square which is equal to 10. Now, we also know that uh, sin theta where we define theta as the value of C A B is equal to 6 by 10 which is equal to 3 by 5. Similarly, cos theta is equal to 8 by 10 which is equal to 4 by 5. Now, the value of B in the triangle uh, BAC, the value of BA will be equal to cos theta into 6, because 6 is the hypotenuse of the triangle and B is the side which is lying uh, adjacent, which becomes 6 into 4 by 5, which is equal to 4.8. Now, in uh, triangle B F E B F B F is equal to B E into sin theta. This becomes 4.8 into 3 by 5 which is equal to 4.8 into 0 0.6 this equals 2.88 centimeters. In this question, we have just uh, found out the angles of all the triangles. Because of perpendiculars, we can assume, we can calculate that all the triangles have similar angles, either theta or minus theta and a right angle. So, once we get it, we are uh, transforming the sides into uh, values of sin theta or cos theta and finding the required value. In this question, we are told that there are two trains A and B. They start at the same time towards each other and uh, we are given some information about the times that they have taken. Let us assume that this is train A and this is train B, uh, this is station X and this is station Y. Let us assume that both of them meet at a point, let us call this point M, train A is starting from X, uh, it is going towards Y, B started from Y and it is going towards X. Let us assume that they met uh, for the first time after P minutes. So, the time that uh, A has taken to come from X to M is P and the time that B has taken to come from Y to M is also equal to P because they met each other after P minutes. Now, after they met, train B has taken 9 minutes to reach uh, station X. So, B has taken 9 minutes to reach uh, 
a after to reach x after it has left m and the total time that a has taken to reach b is 10 so the total amount of time that a has taken after m to reach y is 10 minus p now we are required to calculate the value of 9 plus p which is the total time that uh, train b has taken to go from y to x one of the things that you'll notice is the speed of uh, trains a and b has remained the same so the ratio of the time that uh, a has taken to go from m to y will be the same uh, basically the ratio of the time that they have taken to cover the distances from a to m from x to m that is this ratio and this ratio to go from m to y should remain the same because their speeds are the same the ratio of their speeds is also the same if you are looking at uh, one aspect what is the ratio of their speeds and if you are only comparing the times that they have taken to go from x to m that ratio will be p by 9 but you can also compare the ratio of speeds as the times that they have taken to go from m to y that will be equal to 10 minus p divided by p both of them have to be the same so now if you cross multiply we are going to get p square is equal to 90 minus 9p or p square plus 9p minus 90 is equal to 0 this is equal to p plus 15 into p minus 6 is equal to 0 or well, the value of p is equal to 6 minutes so this is 6 minutes so they met for the first time after 6 minutes b has taken 9 minutes to go from m to a a has taken only 4 minutes to go from m to b so the total time that a has taken is 6 plus 4 which is 10 and the total time that b has taken is 6 plus 9 which is equal to 15 so the correct answer is 15 minutes In this question we are told that there is a solid cylindrical wafer the height of the cylinder is 10 centimeters and the radius is 3.5 centimeters and this is cut into two equal halves along its height so initially before it is cut the cylinder will look from the side like a rectangle and from the top it will look like a circle now we are told that the height of the cylinder is 10 centimeters and the radius of the circle we are told is equal to 3.5 centimeters this is how the cylinder is looking now the cylinder is cut in half so the circle is cut in half and along the height you can find probably that it is cut like this and this is basically cut into two equal halves if you are looking from the side you will get two rectangles this is one half of the rectangle and this is another half of the rectangle and both of them will look like a semicircle the two parts this is one semicircle and this is another semicircle the radius of both of them will be 3.5 this is if you are looking at it from the top this semicircle will belong to one uh, rectangle and the other semicircle will belong to the other rectangle now both of them have been in, when they were like this they were transposed they were rotated by 90 degrees and they were put like uh, some sort of a cross now what we are told is uh, on top of this cross a uniform coat of 1 millimeter of uh, chocolate was put on so we are supposed to calculate what is the total volume of chocolate that was put on this wafer so to do that we had to first figure out what is the total surface area of the new cross that was formed and once we find out the total surface area if you are assuming that the total surface area we found is equal to t the total volume is equal to 2 into 0 0.1 centimeters because the width of the chocolate coating is 1 millimeter which is 0.1 centimeter so let us first find out the total surface area of the new cross that is formed and we'll multiply it with 0.1 to get the volume of the chocolate that is needed so if you're trying to identify what is the total surface area of the new figure let us look at it from the total surface area of the original cylinder the original cylinder has uh, the outer exterior circular part none of this has been uh, removed or nothing else has been added to the circular part by uh, cutting it in half and rotating it to form a cross so now it will look uh, the new figure will look something like this so this is a cylinder half of the cylinder and this is another half of the cylinder so the exterior circular part is still there so the total surface area is equal to 2 pi r h in addition to that the circular part at the end is also there there is not, no change to it so that is equal to plus 2 pi r square in addition to that when you are cutting the cylinder in half you are forming two rectangular parts in the middle now those two rectangular parts will still be there 
but some of it is covered by the overlap of the two cylindrical halves. So let us first find out what is the area of the two cylindrical halves that are formed. The area of the two cylindrical halves is basically the area that is formed by cutting the cylinder in half. This is a rectangle. The base of the rectangle is H and the height is equal to the diameter of the cylinder. So this is equal to 2R. Now you have two such parts. So that is going to equal plus 2 into H into 2R. And in addition to it, we have to subtract the part which is overlapping between the two rectangles. So that is minus 2 times because that overlap part is there in both the uh, half cylindrical uh, surfaces. 2 into this is a square of uh, radius of uh, side 2R. The length is 2R and the breadth is 2R. So this is minus 2 into 2R into 2R. So if you look at it for the total surface area, what we have done is First, we found out the total surface area of the original cylinder that remains unchanged. That entire part will be added. But because you are cutting the cylinder in half, you are forming two rectangular parts in the middle. So you are adding the area of the two rectangular parts. And because you are forming a cross, the area of overlap has to be subtracted. The area of overlap is a square of side 2R. So the total area will be 2 pi R H plus 2 pi R square plus 2 into H into 2R minus 2 into 2R into 2R. So if you calculate it, if you simplify and calculate, this is equal to 2 into 22 by 7 into 3.5 into 10 plus 2 into 22 by 7 into 3.5 into 3.5 plus 2 into 10 into 7 minus 2 into 7 into 7. So you can simplify this as 22 into 10 is 220 plus this also is cancelled 22 into 3.5 so that is 11 into 7 11 into 7 is 77 plus 2 into 10 into 7 that is 140 minus 2 into 7 into 7 so that is minus 98 so if you look at it this is going to equal 297 plus 42 this is equal to 339 centimeter square this is the total surface area on the entire surface area, a 0.1 centimeter coating is added. So the volume of the chocolate will be 339 into 0.1, which is equal to 33.9 centimeter cube. In this question, we are given 10 digits. The odd digits that are given are 3, 5, 7, 5 and 3. And the even digits that are given are 2, 4, 2, 2 and 8. So we have 5 odd digits and 5 even digits. We have to form 10 digit numbers such that the odd digits appear only in even places. So this is the first odd uh, digit say, this is the second odd digit, this is the third, this is the fourth and this is the fifth. They have to appear only in even places. So there will be one uh, number over here, one number over here, one number over here, one number over here and one number over here. Essentially, this is the first digit of the 10 digit number. This is the second digit. This has to be odd. This has to be even. This has to be even. This is odd. This is even. This is odd. This is even and this is odd. These five odd digits can occur only in these places. And these five even uh, numbers can appear only in the places where we have written E. So essentially, the total number of 10 digit numbers that can be formed is the arrangements that are possible of the 5 odd digits amongst themselves multiplied by the number of arrangements that are possible of the 5 even digits amongst themselves. If all of these 5 digits are unique, then the answer is quite simple. If all the 5 odd digits for example are unique, the number of ways in which we can arrange them will be 5 factorial. But over here we have 3 repeated 2 times and 5 repeated 2 times. Similarly, if all the even numbers are unique, the number of ways in which we can arrange them will be 5 factorial. But over here we have 2 which is repeated 3 times. In general, if you are given a set of n digits which have some uh, repetitions. Suppose there are uh, 3 a's, there are say 2 b's and all the remaining are say unique. And there are a total of say n digits over here. Then the number of ways in which we can arrange them will be n factorial divided by because a is repeated 3 times, 3 factorial. B is repeated 2 times, so 2 factorial. 
and if there is any other digit which is again repeated and if say it is repeated three times then we again divide it by three factorial and so on. So in the first case we have five odd digits in which three is repeated two times and five is repeated two times. So the number of ways in which we can arrange them will be five factorial which is the total number of digits divided by two factorial into two factorial. 1 2 factorial is because 3 is repeated 2 times and 1 2 factorial is because 5 is repeated 2 times. Similarly, the number of ways in which we can arrange the 5 even digits will be again into 5 factorial divided by because 2 is repeated 3 times 3 factorial. So, the correct answer will be 5 factorial whole square divided by 3 factorial into 2 factorial whole square which is option D. In this question, we are told that uh, there are four points A, B, C, D and there is a point E which is in the center. So, we are told that they are like this. This is A, this is B, this is C and this is D and this is the point E. We are told that A, B and C, D intersect at right angles at point E. We are told that B, C, C, E and D, D are B, C is 1.3. C is uh, 0 0.5 and uh, so B C is 1.3, C E is 0 0.5 and E D over here is 2.5. Because this is a right angle, we can figure out that the length of the side B E will be 1.2. Why is that the case? Because 13 square is equal to 5 square plus 12 square, they are a Pythagorean triplet. So, we can calculate the length of BE to be equal to 1.2. We are also told that AD is parallel to BC. So, it is like this. If AD is parallel to BC, angle A will be the same as angle B. Let us assume that both of them are X. For both of the triangles AED and CEB, we have one right angle and one angle as X. So, the other angle will also be the same. This will be Y and this will be Y. So, triangles AED is similar to triangle BEC because they are similar all of the sides will be in the proportion and that proportion will be 0 0.5 divided by 2.5 which is equal to 1 by 5. This would imply that the length of AE divided by the length of BE will be the same as the length of uh, DE divided by the length of CE because both of these triangles are similar. We know the length of BE this is 1.2. We know the length of DA, this is 2.5 and we know the length of EC, this is 0 0.5. 2.5 by 0 0.5 is 5, therefore the length of AE will be 1.2 into 5 which is 6 uh, meters. This would also tell us that the length of AD will be 5 times the length of BC which is equal to 6.5. What we are required to calculate is the total distance that this guy has uh, walked. He first went from A to B. And he has traveled 6 plus 7, uh, 1.2 which is 7.2. From B he has gone to C and he has traveled 1.3. And from C he has gone to D and therefore he has traveled plus 3. So the total distance that he has traveled is 7.2 plus 1.3 plus 3 which is equal to 11.5. So the required answer is option C 11.5. In this question, it is given that there are three salt solutions A, B and C and if they are mixed into the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 3, the resultant solution has a strength of 20 percent. However, if they are mixed in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1, the resultant solution has a strength of 30 percent. Now, a fourth solution is uh, formed mixing only B and C in the ratio 2 is to 7 and we are required to find out the strength of D to that of A. So, let us first understand what is the information that is given. There are three solutions A, B and C. Let us assume that their strengths are small a, small b and small c. If they are mixed into the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 3, the resultant solution will have 20 percent uh, strength. So, if they are mixed in the ratio 1 is to 2 is to 3, the resultant solution will have A plus 2B plus 3C by 1 plus 2 plus 3. This will be the strength based on the ratio and proportion formula that we know. So, this is equal to 20 percent or A plus 2B plus 3C is equal to 20 percent into 6 which is 1.2. So, this is the first equation that is given to us. 
Similarly, if they are mixed in the ratio 3 is to 2 is to 1, the resultant uh, solution will have a strength of 30 percent. This would imply that 3A plus 2B plus C is equal to 1, 3 plus 2 plus 1. Again, this is 6. So, 30 percent into 6 is 1.8 or 3A plus 2B plus C is equal to 1.8. This is the second equation that is given to us. Now, we are required to find out the strength of solution D. The strength of solution D, it has only B and C. They are mixed in the ratio 2 is to 7. So, this will be 2B plus 7C by 9. This is the strength of solution D and we are required to find out the ratio of uh, the strength of solution D to that of A. So, we are required to find out 2B plus 7C divided by 9 whole by A. So, we are given two equations in three unknowns and we are required to find out a ratio. So, what we will do is we will try to find out the value of C in terms of A. We will try, try to find out the value of B in terms of A and then calculate the value of 2B plus 7C by 9 in terms of A and then divide it by A to get the answer. So, using the equations 1 and 2 you can see that the coefficient of B is the same. So, let us subtract the first equation from the second equation. So, this will be if it is 2 minus 1, this would be 2a minus 2c is equal to 0 0.6 or a minus c is equal to 0 0.3 or c is equal to a minus 0 0.3. So, we already have c in terms of a, let us try to find out b in terms of a. So, from equations 1 and 2, we will have to eliminate c. So, what we will do is because uh, the coefficient of c in the first equation is 3 and the coefficient of c in the second equation is 1. We will uh, multiply the second equation by 3 and then subtract the first equation from it. So, that we can eliminate c. So, multiplying the first equation by c uh, by 3 will be 9a plus 6b plus 3c minus a plus 2b plus 3c this is equal to 3 into 1.8 is 5.4 minus 1.2. If you simplify this, you are going to get 8a plus 4b is equal to 4.2 or b is equal to 4.2 by 4 is 1.05 minus 2a. So, let us calculate 2b plus 7c. So, 2b will be 2.1 minus 4a plus 7c will be plus 7a minus 2.1. You can cancel off 2.1 from both sides and this will be 3a. So, 2b plus 7c divided by 9 will be 3a by 9 which is equal to a by 3. So, we are required to find out the ratio of 2b plus 7c by 9 by a. So, that will be a by 3 by a. So, that is 1 is to 3. So, in this case the required ratio is 1 is to 3. In this question, it is given that an article is marked x percent above the cost price. So, let us assume that the cost price is 100, then the market price will be 100 plus x. A discount of 2 by 3 into x percent is given on the market price. So, the selling price will be 100 plus x which is the market price into 100 minus 2x by 3 whole by 100. This is the selling price. If the profit is 4 percent of the cost price, so selling price minus po, uh, cost price is 4, therefore the selling price is 104 and the value of x lies between 25 and 50, then the value of 50 percent of x is. So, let us solve this to find out the value of x and then uh, go ahead from there. <coughs> if you multiply 100 on both the sides and expand the brackets, it will be 10,000 plus 100x minus 200 x by 3 minus 2 x square by 3 is equal to 10400. You can simplify this and uh, take the terms to the other side and you will get the following 2 x square by 3 minus 100 x by 3 plus 400 is equal to 0. You multiply everything by 3. So, this will be 2 x square minus uh, 100 x plus 1200 is equal to 0. Now, divide all of them by 2. So, it will be x square minus 50 x 
प्लस सिक्स हंड्रेड इज इक्वल टू जीरो और x माइनस ट्वेंटी इंटू एक्स माइनस थर्टी इज इक्वल टू जीरो दिस इज अ सिंपल क्वाड्रेटिक इक्वेशन व्हिच कैन बी फैक्टराइज्ड सो द वैल्यू ऑफ x इज एधर ट्वेंटी और थर्टी बट वी आर टोल्ड दैट द वैल्यू ऑफ x लाइज बिटवीन ट्वेंटी फाइव फिफ्टी सो एक्स इज इक्वल टू ट्वेंटी इज रूल्ड आउट देन द वैल्यू ऑफ फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ एक्स इज सो एक्स इज ओनली थर्टी एंड वी आर रिक्वायर टू फाइंड आउट फिफ्टी परसेंट ऑफ थर्टी which is equal to 15 so the answer we are looking for is 15